Hello everyone. Very good evening to all of you. Myself, Dr. Prateek Garg, your ENT faculty. So today we will do the quick revision for the ENT for the FMG purpose. So we'll try to cover all the important topics, all the important questions in shortest manner or the fastest time we can cover the important topics. So let's start with ENT. Okay. <clears throat> so we are doing FMG quick revision myself Dr. Prateek Burke so what is autosclerosis what is autosclerosis firstly we we'll try to cover the autology because ear is the largest thing ears, ear, ear has the maximum topics so we we'll try to cover what are the important topics and out of autology Autosclerosis is one of the most important topic. So, autosclerosis, we all know, it is a newborn formation. It is a newborn formation around the stapes foot plate. So, what is happening? Suppose this is the stapes foot plate, which is around. If the newborn continuously formed around the foot plate, so the mobility of the stapes, the mobility of the stapes will get restricted, leading to conductive hearing loss. So, that is the reason autosclerosis is being generated. Why? What is this doing? So this is restrict, restricting the mobility of the uh, <coughs> stapes foot plate leading to conductive hearing loss. So how the question is being framed? Autosclerosis, the question format will be like this. A young female, mostly in the age group 20 to 30 with bilateral progressive conductive hearing loss. So hearing loss is basically conductive because autosclerosis is a middle ear disease and the hearing loss will be bilateral affecting both the ears and usually the hereditary pattern will be there. That means if mother is having a history of autosclerosis, more chances of daughter is also having autosclerosis. So autosclerosis is basically affecting young females, more common in females as compared to males. Progressive conductive hearing loss. The uh, symptoms, they worsen during pregnancy. So whenever the female is entering into the pregnancy because of the hormonal changes, there is increased activity of estrogen that will lead to <coughs> increased formation of the bone. And there is a typical phenomenon present in the autosclerosis which is known as paracusis villisii. What is paracusis villisii? It is nothing but the patient of autosclerosis hears better in noisy surrounding. So patient of autosclerosis, whenever there is a noisy surrounding, the patient will hear better. So that phenomenon is known as paracusis villisii, which is typical of autosclerosis. Why this phenomenon is happening? Because in noisy surrounding, patient usually speak louder. So if he is speaking louder, he can hear better. So that is a very silly answer for that. But we have to remember the paracusis villisa is a symptom of autosclerosis. Now, whenever the active bone formation is going on, that means the new bone formation is still active or the, it is the early stage of autosclerosis when there is a new bone formation is there. So we can see through the tympanic membrane, as you can see here, the diagram of tympanic membrane, there is a reddish flamingo pink like appearance. So this is suppose, there is a reddish flamingo pink like appearance as you can appreciate here. So flamingo pink like appearance is there. This sign is known as Swartz sign. And this is typical of autosclerosis in active stage. So whenever autosclerosis is in active stage, that means we can say whenever there is positive Swartz sign, the treatment of choice. In this situation, the treatment of choice will be sodium fluoride. Sodium fluoride, why? Because it will limit the new bone formation. So treatment of choice in active stage of autosclerosis is sodium fluoride. Whereas the treatment of autosclerosis, if in exam, active stage, the word is not mentioned, then the treatment of choice for autosclerosis, what is the treatment of choice? It is stapedotomy. With or without prosthesis. Generally, the treatment of choice will be stapedotomy, put or uh, make a hole around the stapes foot plate and this piston, as you can see in the diagram. So this piston is placed over that foot plate. So suppose my foot plate is this. So we will make a hole around 
the foot plate which will uh, <coughs> reflect to the pole window then the piston is placed over this hole and the upper end of the piston which is having a curve so here basically incurses there will remove the supra structure of staples will make a hole around the foot plate insert the piston the upper end of the piston will be supporting through the incurs long process so the treatment of choice for the autosclerosis is stapedotomy with staples piston or we can say prosthesis placement okay so treatment of choice for autosclerosis is stapedotomy with the prosthesis placement if there is active stage then the treatment of choice is sodium fluoride autosclerosis it is more common in females <clears throat> suppose another question is being framed the format of the question or the language of the question will be 40 to 50 year old female that means the female patient in adulthood is presented to the ENT OPD with pulsatile tinnitus pulsatile tinnitus and highly vascular ear mass that means the patient has repeated history of bleeding from the ear without any trauma without any fingering or itching or rubbing or whatever it is so patient usually will be in the age group of 40 to 50 presented with a pulsed tinnitus and a mass which has a history of bleeding uh, repeated bleeding so this uh, this format is suggestive of what glomus jugulate what is glomus jugulate <clears throat> so glomus jugulate another important topic after autosclerosis glomus jugulate is a paraganglioma it is in paraganglioma we all know better paraganglioma so glomus jugulate or glomus tympanicum they are uh, they are a vascular mass, highly vascular mass, which are formed. The location is glomus jugular location. Suppose this is my suppose this is my external ear, this is external auditory canal, this is my tympanic membrane, and this is my middle ear, and this is my mastoid bone. Okay, so. <coughs> Behind the mastoid bone, we all know there is sigmoid sinus, and this sigmoid sinus further continues in the jugular bulb. So this is jugular bulb, which is present in the floor of middle ear. So around this jugular bulb, there is paraganglionic cells. These paraganglionic cells or glomus bodies will form the glomus jugular, a vascular mass, which may protrude into the ear through the hypotympanum, the base the floor of the ear so this mass arising from the glomus bodies around the jugular bulb or maybe we can say around the sympathetic chain which is pre present over the promontory so if mass is arising from here then it is known as glomus jugular if suppose the medial wall of ear middle ear the medial wall we all know promontory is there promontory is nothing but the impression of basal turns of cochlea so around the promontory there is a network of vessels <coughs> and nerves and sympathetic supply so if <coughs> the tumor is arising from the glomus bodies which are present around the promontory area and from there a reddish mass is being produced then this will call as Glomus tympanicum. Why tympanicum? Because of the location. We know tympanic word is used for the middle ear. So there is two highly vascular tumor in ENT. One in nose. That highly vascular mus uh, highly vascular tumor is known as angiofibroma. And another highly vascular tumor is glomus jugulate. <clears throat> so what is the common between angiofibroma and glomus jugulate? So both the lesions which are highly vascular, which have uh, the history of repeated bleeding without provoking, they both lack tunica media, that is a muscle layer present in the blood vessels. So angiofibroma, glomus tumor, they both are having 
one thing in common that is the lack of tunica media or the muscular layer in the uh, in the wall of blood vessels so that is the reason why there is a repeated bleeding so how if you do the otoscopic examination how the picture so look at the diagram look at the diagram here you can see a reddish mass which is arising from the floor of the middle wall we can see tympanic membrane is intact but there is a reddish mass which is arising from the floor and patient having a history of bleeding without any provocation and another typical feature is pulsatile tinnitus pulsatile tinnitus is whenever there is a word pulsatile tinnitus so it is only 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 present in bromus tumor no other pathology will result in pulsatile tinnitus no other scene so whenever there is a word pulsatile tinnitus it is 100% Uh, typical for the glomus tumor, glomus jugular or glomus tympanicum, because it's a vascular tumor. So tinnitus is by the pulsatile why? Because the blood flow, uh, heart pump, then you know blood pressure increase, then uh, go down. So because of that, because of that flow, because it's a highly vascular tumor, the tinnitus is pulsatile. And whenever this word is used, always think of glomus tumor. Now, what is the treatment for the glomus tumor? We all know surgical excision, but it is a highly vascular tumor. Angiofibroma, glomus tumor, whatever the tumor are, we can do the excision. There is no medical treatment which can help in regress of this disease. So whatever the tumor formed around the, from the glomus bodies, you have to do the surgery and remove it. Now, if there are certain uh, <clears throat> advances are there, we can use the coagulator, we can use the bipolar cautery, we can use some other instruments also. So treatment of choices, surgery. Now, in exam, whenever the glomus tumor, glomus tumor is talked about, there is a sign. Being given, which is known as rising sun sign. So rising sun, whenever the sun is rises, you know red half color. We see at the beaches, we see at the mountains. So suppose these are mountains. So whenever the sun is arising in the morning, so how we see how we draw like this. Okay, I draw in the yellow, but basically sun whenever the morning it will uh, look like some uh, reddish, some pinkish, some orange color of. Uh, 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 reason okay so same thing happens in the glomus tumor glomus tumor what is happening is the tumor a pinkish mass is arising like a sun from the floor so suppose the middle ear floor is there there will be pinkish mass arising so this is known as rising sun sign and whenever we do blanching suppose use a seagull speculum put the positive air pressure into the ear canal because of the positive pressure the reddish mass will turn pale why because of the pressure the blood collected into the mass will go down so for that moment whenever we use a single speculum and put a positive pressure in the external auditory canal there will be blanching of the mass and this sign is known as brown sign another important topic for the examination so rising sun sign brown sign both are present in glomus tumor and pulsatile tinnitus only and only present in the glomus tumor now let's talk about cs1 CS1, unsafe CS1. We know CS1 two types: tubal tympanic, that is safe CS1, and aticoentral. Aticoentral means whenever the disease is in attic. Suppose this is my tympanic membrane. So this is the below part is my past tensa. The upper part is my pars flaccida. So this area is known as attic region, the roof, the roof of the middle ear, attic region. Entrum, entrum. We know the largest mastoid air cell. So whenever the pathology is involving the mastoid entrum firstly or the attic region, that disease is known as unsafe CS1 or aticoentral variety, uh, variation of uh, chronic separative otitis media. Okay. So unsafe. Why this is peculiar? Why we are studying? It is also one of the important topic. How nowadays clinical picture is being given? So suppose this is a picture showing the CS1. Now examination in exam they may ask what is the treatment of choice? Options will be given: cortical mastoidectomy, only dentinoplasty, modified radical mastoidectomy, or radical mastoidectomy. Four variations. So look at the picture. If we are looking at the picture, <coughs> so you can see there is a perforation for sure. This is the perforation. So by looking at the perforation, we will think of tubotympanic type of variety. If tubotympanic type of disease is there. 
Two power choices, temporoplast. But now look at the picture. There is a attic retraction. You can see whitish keratin, pearly white colored material. Pearly white colored debris you can see, appreciate here. So that is typical of cholesteatoma. So what is this? This pearly white collection of the debris is nothing but cholesteatoma. What is cholesteatoma? We all know it is the skin at wrong place. We all know outer ear, that is the external auditory canal. The mucosa is squamous epithelium. Middle ear, the mucosa is cuboidal epithelium. So whenever this squamous epithelium enters into the middle ear, so the collection of this keratinized squamous epithelium at a wrong place is known as cholesteatoma. And what is the uh, typical of cholesteatoma? Because this uh, squamous epithelium collection, whenever it enters into the wrong place, it will produce the protease enzyme, proteolytic enzyme, multiple variations of proteolytic enzymes. And these enzymes, what will they will do? They will damage the tunnel membrane, they will damage the uh, ossicles, and gradually the process will go on. So, cholecytoma is not a tumor, but a self limiting, uh, not, a, not a self limiting, uh, it's not a tumor, but it's a skin at wrong place and which acts by gradually lysing or damaging the surrounding structures. So, treatment of choice if there is an unsafe CSOM, there is treatment of choice if examiner asks for frame a question like this with the history of foul smelling discharge. Blood stain discharge, it's not profuse bleeding. There will be small quantity of blood traces and the smell will be foul smelling. And gradually the patient will have conductive hearing loss. Conductive, why? Because there is a damage to the tertiary membrane, there is a damage to the <coughs> ossicles. So whenever you can see the polyvite like structures, there is a history of foul smelling discharge, blood stain discharge. If the patient is having uh, repeatedly, after, even after taking the antibiotic, the uh, pathology is continuing. Because if in tubertin variety, we give the antibiotic, once the infection is cured, there will be a relief period for the patient until unless the infection goes again inside the ear from that perforation. But in CS1, whatever medicine you take, whatever thing you do, pathology is never corrected. The reason being, because of the antibiotic, you can cure the bacterial infection. But this cholecytoma, this squamous epithelium, it has to be removed. If it present in the middle ear, it will keep on damaging the middle ear structure. So if there is a cholecytoma or unsafe CSOM, treatment of choice, always, always mark modified radical mastoidectomy. Modified radical mastoidectomy. Why modified radical? In modified, what of the structure are safe? Suppose incus and melis are damaged, but stapes is normal and safe. So will what of the structure is safe or not damaged will save that and will remove the disease and the damage structure. Radical mastoidectomy will remove everything. We remove the stapes part also. Whether it's normal or not normal. We are not bothered about what to remove, what not to remove. So in radical mastoidectomy, we remove all the structures in the ear. In modified radical mastoidectomy, we'll remove the disease thing. We'll remove the necros part. We'll remove the granulation everything. But whatever the middle ear structures are normal, not damaged, we'll try to preserve them. So that is modified radical mastoidectomy. It is treatment of choice for unsafe CSO. Okay. How the cholesterol is uh, formed? Multiple theories are there. Through the perforation, squamous cell can migrate. By if the patient is having history of previous surgery. But during the surgery, some of the squamous epithelium may invade because of ET dysfunction also. What is ET dysfunction? Eustachian tube dysfunction. Why? Because of eustachian tube dysfunction, generally the first condition arising is CSM of safe variety. Because eustachian tube is blocked, middle ear will generate the negative pressure that will lead to <coughs> uh, uh, negative pressure, air bubbles, the uh, uh, transurate formation, exurate formation, like that. But with time, with time, sometime ET dysfunction, sometime ET dysfunction, what may progress to cholesterol how because of ET dysfunction there will be negative pressure in the middle ear and because of that negative pressure the tympanic membrane will be retracted it will go down and sometimes this retraction may occur in some pocket formation small part of tympanic membrane suppose parts uh, first is the attic part so this part of tympanic membrane is retracted and in this retra retracted part what is happening is squamous epithelium debris from the external auditory canal will get collected here and from the use of the proteolytic enzyme, it will damage the 
triple number and enter into the middle wheel. Okay. So that's how paracetamol may form in the <coughs> in normal year. And there is another variety of paracetamol also. Congenital paracetamol. Basically, uh, we study paracetamol congenital, primary, and secondary. Congenital means the paracetamol is present since birth. There is no history of surgery. There is no history of ear discharge. Tympanic membrane is absolutely normal. And when we do the autoscopic examination, you can see a whitish keratin, typical appearance of the paracetamol, whitish keratin flake like appearance. <coughs> okay. So look at the picture. Congenital cholesterol, how it will present. In congenital cholesterol, what is there? Tympani membrane is absolutely intact. There is, you can see, whitish collection behind the intact tympani membrane. There is no history of surgery, there is no history of trauma. So, everything is normal, still there is a cholesterol behind that intact tympani membrane. So, that condition is known as congenital cholesterol. <coughs> Secondary cholesterol, when we do the surgery, suppose, there is because of the surgery, stomach epithelium get entered into the <coughs> middle ear, leading to cholesterol formation. So some secondary factors are there. Some impact from our human activities may be there. What is primary cholesterol? In primary cholesterol, suppose ET dysfunction. Because of eustachiasium dysfunction, what is happening? Tympanic membrane got retracted. Retraction pocket gets formed. Squamous epithelium from the outside will collect in that retraction pocket. That will lead to formation of proteolytic enzyme. And thus, cholesterol will form and enter into the middle ear. That is primary cholesterol. Now, treatment of choice, whenever the word uncessation or cholesterol, treatment of choice is modified radical mesodectomy. Treatment of choice for tumor tympanic, cholesterol, uh, tumor tympanic variety of CSO, tympanoplasty. Not meningoplasty, tympanoplasty. What is tympanoplasty? <coughs> Eradication of the disease, correction of the pathology, like if there is a hole in the tympanic membrane, we'll put the graft. If the ossicles are damaged, we'll repair that. So in tympanoplasty, what we're doing is, we are <coughs> we are correcting the tympanic membrane perforation. Along with that, we are also correcting the hearing mechanism. By means of, if the ossicles are defected, we'll put the new ossicle. We'll put the another things like tor pop or whatever it is. So that is tympanoplasty. Eradication of disease from the middle ear and re-establishment of the hearing mechanism. Okay? In the rhinoplasty, what we do? In the rhinoplasty, we only repair that tympanic membrane. We don't look into the middle ear what is happening there. So we just put a graft and we just correct that tympanic membrane perforation. So that is <coughs> that is meningoplasty. Now, what are the complications of the CSM? Multiple, multiple complications of the CSM. We all know if the question is uh, framed like CSM a long standing patient is a, a patient is presented to the ENT OPD with a long standing history of foul smelling blood stain discharge. Whenever the word foul smelling or blood stain discharge, always always think of unsafe CSM. So whenever the patient is having this history, and then later on, patient also develop vertigo. Vertigo. Patient is having giddiness. So what is the diagnosis? So we all know blood stain discharge, false smelling discharge. Do the autoscopic examination. You can see the cholesterol. Now, along with the cholesterol, if there is a word vertigo, <coughs> vertigo, patient is having dizziness, a patient is having giddiness. So we, what is the diagnosis then? We always think of unsafe CSM and this cholesterol help damage the labyrinthine. Most commonly, lateral semicircular canal, which is present over the lateral semicircular canal, the bulge of LSE is present in the medial wall of middle ear. So, because of the cholesterol, that labyrinthine outer bony wall they get damaged, leading to a fistula formation. And this fistula, what it will do? There will be an established link between the inner ear and middle ear. So, any pressure changes, any loud sound, that will, because of this fistula, patient will have. Uh, what are you? Okay. So, long standing history of foul smelling, black stain discharge. With what I go, think of unsafe CSM with labyrinthine fistula. What is the treatment of choice? Again, treatment of choice here will be modified radical mastodectomy plus fistula repair. Another question how they are forming? Long standing history of foul smelling, black stain discharge with headache vomiting and convulsion. So patient along with the ear symptoms started having headache. 
vomiting is there and convulsions okay so what is the differentiating word here convulsion headache and vomiting and convulsion these are happening that means something is has to be done with a brain because headache vomiting vomiting being operated the center of the vomiting is in medulla okay and convulsions which is uh, again suggestive of some neurotic pathology so if a long standing case of unsafe csm is there and the patient develop headache vomiting and convulsions then think of what the ear it is in close proximity to the temporal bone temporal bone because ear is complete complete ear is in, present in the temporal bone okay so temporal lobe of the brain it is in close proximity to the ear so whenever this unsafe csm may lead to abscess in the brain particularly temporal lobe is more commonly affected so that abscess in the brain will present as headache headache because intracranial tension intracranial pressure is increased patient will have vomiting and convulsions convulsions will be only only present in the brain abscess in meningitis suppose the patient of autogenic uh, autogenic abscess that is a csm unsafe csm presented with a headache and vomiting but there are no convulsions so if there are no convulsions headache and vomiting so we may also think of meningitis why meningitis because unsafe csm one of the important common uh, one of the common uh, complication is meningitis and abscess but when the word convulsions is there on long standing csm is due to more chances of brain abscess meningitis may occur with acute stage of csm uh, not csm acute a1 uh, we can't say csm so acute otitis media sometimes acute otitis media may also uh, give a complication which is known as meningitis okay so differentiating word here is if the convulsions are there so then we have to think of autogenic brain abscess if suppose only headache or vomiting is there projectile vomiting neck rigidity if these words are mentioned which are indicative of meningitis then we may think, we may think of meningitis now congenital cholesterolema we have already heard <clears throat> now one another complication is gradinigo syndrome very very important multiple times this has been asked there are two similar words one is grisinger sign and gradinigo syndrome generally we get confused in that so gradinigo syndrome is nothing but petrus apex abscess what is petrus apex abscess whenever suppose this is my ear this is my middle ear okay and this is my cochlea and all that which are present in the petrus bone okay and this petrus bone suppose this is the midline in the brain so these petrus bone is in close proximity to fifth cranial lobe and the sixth cranial lobe these fifth and sixth cranial lobe these are present just touching the petrus apex okay so at the apex the now cranial lobe present is fifth and sixth cranial lobe so whenever there is a pus formation whenever there is a pus formation in the middle ear that is cs1 this pus formation enters into the petrus apex continuous persistent ear discharge even after the surgery we have performed the modified reticular mastectomy in a patient of unsafe cs1 still patient is giving persistent ear discharge history and there are certain other signs also positive what are these signs <clears throat> patient may have retro orbital pain pain behind the eyes there can be diplopia okay so we in that condition we have to think of petrus apex abscess what is petrus apex abscess there is a syndrome present in the petrus apex abscess which is known as gradinigo syndrome what are the three typical features of the gradinigo syndrome first one is persistent ear discharge examiner will frame the question like this already surgery been done one year back still the patient is having again the same complaint so two two reason can be there either the surgery the which was performed earlier was not accurately done there can be some residual cholesterolema at particular site what is the most common site of residual cholesterolema sinus symphysis we all know okay and there is another site also like facial recess from these area generally it is difficult to clear the cholesterolema so one reason for the persistent ear discharge is residual cholesterolema but if question is framed that even after surgery patient is having persistent ear discharge 
and the patient is having certain headache in form of retroorbital pain and the patient is having diplopia so these words are typically forming the gradinigo syndrome so gradinigo syndrome basically there will be persistent ear discharge and there will be diplopia and there will be retroorbital pain why diplopia and retroorbital pain retroorbital pain is because of the fifth nerve involvement fifth nerve is in close proximity to the pitreous apex and that may get inflamed there can be some edema in the nerve because of that ongoing inflammation in the pitreous bone leading to retroorbital pain so retroorbital may be because of the fifth nerve diplopia is because of the sixth nerve lr6 six cranial nerve supplies the lateral rectus if the lateral rectus function is uh, got abnormal that will lead to diplopia so basically <coughs> try to remember it but if you understand the concept that presence fifth and sixth nerve is in close proximity that's why this is happening so you can easily remember that so remember try to remember the gradinigo syndrome it is a syndrome of pitreous apex pitreous apex abscess okay and how to remember the mnemonic is g e r d i mark this in the blue color okay so gradinigo syndrome grad the word itself gradinigo so if you look at the word you can remember like g e r d so in gradinigo syndrome there is e r d e for ear discharge r for retroorbital pain d for diplopia so that's how you can remember gradinigo syndrome uh, mnemonic is g e r d g e r d okay and this is a complication of cso unsafeity or safeity whatever it is it can happen so generally even after a surgery patient is having persistent ear discharge now another question a child mostly in the 6 year 8 year 7 year 4 year whatever the age group but early age group child presented to the ent opd sometime the child present with a history of mouth breathing patient will have uh, patient will be breathing the child will be breathing from his mouth history of mouth breathing snoring during the night when on the night in the night when the child uh, try to sleep there is snoring and sometime mother and father of the child they don't they don't uh, you know appreciate they don't uh, think about why patient, why their child is uh, breathing from the mouth they take it like casually it may happen but sometime the ent opd the patient of adenoid faces or adenoid hypertrophy present with typical complaint the first symptom will be pain in the ear majority of the babies which are having the history of adenoid hypertrophy they don't present with the history of uh, they don't present with the complaint of uh, mouth breathing or snoring or whatever they will come to you in opd with a complaint of like ear discharge acute pain severe pain in the one of the ear they will come like doc sir but mera bachcha kal se bahut ro raha hai kaan pakad pakad ke ro raha hai is not allowing us to touch the ear the baby is having severe pain so what is happening then if the small child comes to you in the opd or uh, comes to visit, uh, comes to the opd with a history of ear pain then along with examination of ear or tympanic membrane you should always always think of adenoids because the most common reason for the aom in child children is adenoid hypertrophy so how the question will be framed 6 year old child with a history of mouth breathing and hearing loss hearing loss is typically conductive so hearing loss with tympanic membrane as we do the otoscopic examination sometime there is acute otitis media because of adenoid hypertrophy when the bacterial infection also occur sometime there is no pain but the baby is having hearing loss baby is not able to hear properly then we do the otoscopic examination if suppose this picture is given <clears throat> if suppose this picture is given you can see the multiple air bubbles you can see typical classic bubbles so basically this picture is immediately think of serious otitis media or non separative otitis media serious otitis media or otitis media without effusion okay so adenoid hypertrophy baby where the adenoids are enlarged because of the enlargement of the adenoids the eustachian tube blockage is there that eustachian tube blockage lead to negative pressure in the middle ear that will result in formation of transudate and if this transudate is sterile there is no bacterial infection 
So the condition arising is serious otitis media, and since it's a middle ear pathology, the hearing loss will be conductive hearing loss. Conductive hearing loss. What are the other name of serious otitis media? Examiner may write. Option will be given. Serious otitis media, otitis media without effusion, or uh, <coughs> non-separative otitis media. Okay. So like these multiple words can be used. Now serious otitis media. One of the condition arises. What is the treatment of choice? Initially, we will give the decongestant. We can go the local decongestant in the nose, like oxygen drop, dilomatazole, oxyzolomatazole drop. We can give the phenylephrine, cetrazine, anticol, or whatever it is, and nasal drops. So local decongestant. Then wait for some days. If condition improves, well and good. Even if multiple after multiple treatment, or maybe after three months, six months, condition is not improving. Then, in that case of serious otitis media, the treatment of choice. What we have to do? Firstly, look for adenoids. The basic reason: check for adenoids whether they are enlarged. We can check the adenoid by means of two means. One, we can do the endoscopic nasal examination. Other, we can do the X-ray nasopharynx for the adenoids. So, both the ways you can find out whether the adenoids are enlarged or not enlarged. So, treatment of choice in a patient of serious otitis media, when the medical treatment fails. and patient is also in history of not breathing and snoring these things are mentioned so treatment of choice will be adenoidectomy removal of adenoid a second adenoidectomy with meringotomy put a incision in the tympanic membrane so that what of the glue what of the glue what of the uh, sterile thing is being collected in the middle lip that can come out from that tympanic membrane and will uh, the pressure built in the middle ear may get relieved because the main reason was eustachian tube dysfunction why this som happened som also known as glue ear okay serious otitis media so the basic reason was eustachian tube dysfunction because of that the eustachian tube is not opening so whatever being produced in the middle ear remains there and with the time it will increase so there will be pressure built up in the middle ear that will leads to decreased hearing which is conductive hearing loss and sometimes occasionally pain pain may occur in serious otitis media though it is not a routine complaint so the typical uh, tympanic membrane uh, finding will be like this the bubble formation like this okay so think of serious otitis media in that case if there is a history of mouth breathing and Conductive hearing loss. The treatment of choice in the picture of the morning memory is showing some air fluid level, some bubbles. So treatment of choice is uh, remove the adenoids, uh, do the meringotomy. Well, how to do the meringotomy? We'll put an incision in serious otitis media. The meringotomy incision will be like this: curvilinear incision in the anterior inferior quadrant. Because why? Because it's a safe quadrant. It is a safe quadrant. So, in serious otitis media, we'll put a curvilinear incision in the anterior inferior quadrant, and we'll put a grommet over there, so that the what are the incision we made? So, a ventilation tube will put there, fix there, so that the ventilation mechanism of the middle ear can be re-established. Because it was through the eustachian tube that is not working, so we'll give another uh, <coughs> uh, ventilation mechanism by means of grommet. And generally, grommet, if you put inside after six months to one year duration, it will automatically come out. Sometimes we don't have to remove it. It generally automatically comes out. So whenever the question, like read out the question again, a child, six year old baby, history of mouth breathing, hearing loss, with the tympanic finding like this. So what is the diagnosis? Think of adenoid hypertrophy. Whenever a baby with the uh, hearing loss is coming, so always think of uh, uh, always check for the adenoid. So diagnosis will be adenoid hypertrophy with the serious otitis media, which is also known as otitis media. Otitis media without effusion. It is without. By mistake, it is it is without effusion. There is no uh, pus collection. There is only sterile fluid, fluid, fluid or glue, whatever is there. And the treatment choices: bring it on, carrying incision, and put the grommet. So look at the picture. Nowadays, it is uh, the practice of visual questions. They will uh, they will give some picture. There will some otoscopic finding, nasal endoscopic finding, different different. <coughs> instrument use so now it is the pattern is like this so try to remember the pictures also so grommet so treatment of choices after removal of adenoids do the meringotomy and insert the grommet so grommet is a ventilation tube which is for the re establishment of the middle ear ventilation how this grommet is generally like this okay so one end is inside another end is uh, facing towards the external auditory canal uh, other end is facing towards the uh, medial middle ear 
okay so input grommet generally usually automatically comes out <laughs> now another thing suppose a patient is having some history of fight uh, two candidates were fighting each other and in fighting one guy slapped over the patient face or over the ear and immediate effect with that slapping or with that hit patient is hearing loss in that ear and a continuous sound of tinnitus so they may frame the question like this or they can give a picture of tympanic membrane or they can uh, give the picture of tympanic membrane so look at the picture the margin there is a perforation in the tympanic membrane with a history of trauma if there is a history of trauma sudden hit and after that hit there is a history of hearing loss think of traumatic ear perforation in cs1 there will be history of ear discharge there will be history of rhinitis nasal blockage rhinosinusitis but if there is a history of trauma and with the impact of that trauma trauma may be physical trauma may be loud sound like some bomb blasted and you are standing nearby to that because of that sudden sound pressure the tympanic membrane may get perforation so this is a picture of traumatic ear perforation traumatic ear perforation how we differentiate from the cs1 generally if the traumatic ear perforation is there the margin will be irregular because because of trauma may happen in cs1 generally there will be round margin the central perforation margins are round but if you see the traumatic perforation there is irregular margin okay and the tympanic membrane uh, uh, they get perforated so the remaining part of the tympanic membrane may get involved you know fold back jahan se phata hai wahan se fold ho ke andar ki taraf mud gaya ho so this is a picture of traumatic ear perforation now the question asks is treatment for the traumatic ear perforation in traumatic ear perforation the treatment will be conservative we not go for tympanoplasty immediately wait for at least three months give the time to tympanic membrane to heal itself there is a healing mechanism in the body so whenever that there is a traumatic ear perforation the treatment would be conservative management ask the patient to wait keep the water entry away from here do not allow water to get entered into the ear because if water enters uh the discharge or the pus may form so keep ear dry no ear drop you can get the support of some placebo or some multivitamins but the treatment for the traumatic ear perforation is conservative management that is by the medicines nothing wait for three months if still the perforation is not healing there is a continuous perforation it's not healing then we'll go for surgery then we'll go for meningoplasty or tympanoplasty depending on the condition but initial days the treatment for traumatic ear perforation is conservative management now let's talk little bit about the anatomy part we have extracted uh, to discuss the anatomy part in uh, main main lectures now we are doing the first revision so we will talk in short what is important in uh, what is the length of the uh, external artery canal what is the length of the eustachian tube you all know uh, uh, external artery canal 24 mm eustachian tube 36 mm now important in the anatomy part we will study about the medial wall of middle ear which is important for the examination point of view so medial wall what is the medial wall you can see in the picture this complete is a medial wall this is the medial wall right medial wall outer surface is lateral this is lateral this going inside is medial so this is medial wall so generally examination point of view medial wall of tympanic membrane is important uh, medial wall of middle ear is important middle ear cavity is known as tympanic cavity now look at the middle ear medial wall suppose this is my medial wall so you can see there is a bulge there is a bulge because of the basal tons of the cochlea because of the basal tons of the cochlea the medial wall of the middle ear has a bulge in the center and the bulge is known as promontory and that is because of the basal tons of cochlea okay now in the middle wall you can see another structure is stapes stapes is resting over where oval window so there will be oval window okay now you can see in this picture the now cut this in continuity this you can see here this now which is going around the 
ossicles and entering into the mastoid cavity. What is what is this now? Facial nerve. So in the medial wall itself, the facial nerve will go like this. Cool. We can see the facial nerve, and then above it, there is an impression of lateral semicircular canal bulge. LSC dome. There are three semicircular canal: lateral, superior, posterior. LSC bulge is present in the medial wall of middle ear, and that is the reason whenever there is a vertigo in the cholesterol of patient, which semicircular canal get affected? Why we say labyrinthine fistula? In labyrinthine fistula, which canal is affected most commonly? So the answer is LSC, lateral semicircular canal, and the reason is its location. It is present in the medial wall. So cholesterol or whatever is present in the middle ear that will slowly and slowly make a fistula around the LSE, and that will lead to what I go. So anyway, we are talking about anatomy of middle ear. The thing to remember, examination point of view, what is important? The bulge is promontory. Then there is oval window shadow. Above is lateral semicircular can canal shadow. Here is a, a facial nerve. The facial nerve is coming from the labyrinthine part. We all know. Facial nerve is coming from the brain and then taking a turn. So first genu, after first genu, facial nerve enters into the middle ear. So the at the level of first genu, another structure is present is processus cochleiformis. That is also present in the uh, medial wall of middle ear. So processus cochleiformis is a landmark for first genu of facial nerve. Second genu landmark, you can say oval window. You can say lateral semicircular canal. Okay, because you can see the, another turn of facial nerve is happening here. So it is in close proximity to lateral semicircular canal. So this has been asked in the exam, or they may ask. Okay. So co processus cochleiformis is a landmark of first genu of facial. <clears throat> Second genu, LSE dome. Now above oval window, here comes the round window reflection over the medial wall. As you can see, this is the promontory, this is the stepes footprint, and this is a uh, cut section in this picture. But there will be round window. Okay. Here you can see the round window over the promontory. There will be Plexus, which is known as tympanic plexus, which is having the sympathetic chain, neurotic supply. What is the nerve supply in the uh, mid middle ear? Cluso pharyngeal nerve. That is ninth nerve. Okay. So this is about the medial wall of the middle ear, which is more important. Another diagram showing the medial wall of middle ear. So suppose this is a picture taken from the outside. So this complete thing which you can see is medial wall of middle ear. Now you can see. This is my promontory. As you can see, the sympathetic plexus. Okay, there is a neurotic network. Okay, over the promontory. So this is promontory with tympanic plexus. This is what because of the bulge of the basal turn of cochlea. You know. Uh, suppose this is my middle ear. Okay, and there is. Cochlear turn. So the these two, this is the basal turn, and it is like a snail, like a softy ice cream over the softy. So it is, it goes like this cochlea. So these are apical turns, and this is basal turn. Basal turns are facing towards the middle ear, and this give a bulge which is known as promontory. So middle wall, there is promontory with the bulge. Now. Then what are the other things? You can see the stapes. Yes, we can see this is the stapes. You can see this is the stapes. Okay, and this stapes is resting on what? Oval window. So one structure is <coughs> oval window. This oval window. This another window in the middle or medial wall is round window. Okay, then. You can see the pyramid. One pyramid. It is not present at the medial wall. It is present at the posterior wall. Okay, pyramid is present at the posterior wall. And from this pyramid, the stapedial tendon and the stapedial muscle is arising, which is further inserted over the neck of the stapes. Okay, so this is pyramid with the stapedial tendon, which is inserted into the neck of the stapes. Now, what are the things in the uh, medial wall? Promontory, oval window, round window, facial nerve. So this impression. This impression, which is going like this, so it is what? It is not facial nerve. Okay. 
So you can see <coughs> phase channel is also running from the medial or the medial here. Here, this is shown as a quadrat tympanum, which is a branch of fascia. Then, what are the other things? There are two words we study: subiculum and ponticulus, which are also present in the medial wall of medial ear. So, what is subiculum? What is ponticulus? Now, I'll tell you. These both are bony projections. First, we talk about ponticulus. Ponticulus is a bony projection from pyramid P for P. So, basically, over the medial wall of the medial ear, the bony elevation. Which is arising from the pyramid P for P. Okay, so <clears throat> from the pyramid, the bony projection is arising, and from the pyramid connecting to promontory. Look at the picture again. So this is my pyramid, and this is my promontory. So you can see there is a bony elevation between the pyramid and the promontory. So P for P, pyramid to promontory is ponticulus. The bony elevation, bony projection between P to P, promontory to pyramid is ponticulus. So this red sign, this bone, which I mentioned here, which I've shown, is ponticulus. So ponticulus is nothing but a bony elevation between pyramid to promontory. What is subiculum? Subiculum Okay So subiculum is between stapes all window pony projection between promontory and the old window So old window windows continue here so because of the stapes we can see properly but suppose this is the impression of the old window so between the old window and promontory this bony projection is known as subiculum so what is subiculum subiculum is a bony projection subiculum is a bony projection which is separating the old window and round window or we can say from the old window towards the promontory. So basically, look at the picture again. This is my old window from where the step is resting. This is my round window. So between round window and old window, the bony projection which are marked in the green color. So this is subiculum. So subiculum is nothing but a bony elevation projection which is separating the old window or round window or we can say between the old window and the promontory. Ponticulus is between pyramid, arising from the pyramid towards the promontory. So these two elevations basically. These are ponticulus and subiculum. Now, another thing arises, sinus tympani. What is sinus tympani? We heard like most common site of residual cholesterol is sinus tympani, which is, where is the sinus tympani? It's not between this ponticulus and subiculum. This area, this area, which are marked in the shining color. <coughs> this area is sinus tympani. So sinus tympani is an area which is difficult, uh, which is a particular site for the residual cholesterol which is the most common site of residual cholesterol What is the location if examiner want to ask? It is between the ponticulus and the subiculum. Okay. So this is sinus tympani. Understood? <coughs> ear ossicles and development. Three ear ossicles are there. We all know malleus, incus and stapes. Okay. Malleus somewhat like this so malleus is having head 
there is neck, there is lateral process, and handle of malleus, and the tip of handle of malleus is known as umbo. Okay, so this is head, this is neck, this is lateral process, this is handle of malleus, and the top, uh, mid, uh, the uh, this part end of the handle of the malleus is known as umbo. Okay, now question arises: What is which is the common site of formation of cholecystoma? So cholecystoma is generally formed in a area, particularly in the attic region. Which is this area? Suppose this is my tympanic membrane. Okay, handle of malleus looking like this. Tympanic membrane we draw like this. So this is lower part is past tensa, which I've drawn in the green color, and upper part is past flacida, which is about the lateral process of the malleus. Okay, now look at the picture. Suppose this is my pass flaccid above, and this is the neck of the malleus. If suppose because of the cholesterol, there is retraction of tympanic membrane. So this pass flaccid part between the neck of the malleus and the tympanic membrane, this will form a pocket like this. Further retraction will lead to further pocket formation, and in this pocket formation, what will be there? The squamous epithelium debris will get collected, and gradually it will turn out to to, to be cholesterol. Toma. So <clears throat> this is how cholesterol is formed at this level. Try to remember the name. Read it out. Which is the largest bone? Malleus. Which is the second largest? Incus. Which bone is maximum or earliest to be damaged in a patient of cholesterol toma? The most common bone damaged in the patient of the cholesterol toma is incus. More precisely. More precisely, long process of incus. So whenever the cholesterol is there, the first bone to get eroded is long process of incus. Okay. And the third bone is stapes. Stapes is like this. There is a foot plate. There is anterior cura, posterior cura. There is a neck and there is a head. Okay. So in the neck. The stapedial tendon, stapedial muscle is attached, which is arising from the pyramid. Okay, pyramid is a projection, bony projection over the <coughs> posterior wall of the middle ear. Okay, so this is foot plate. When there is newborn formation, that leads to otosclerosis. Now let's talk a little bit about the inner ear anatomy. Inner ear again, what we say through inner ear, there are three parts in the inner ear. Basically, it's like a shell. We all have seen X. I will not go in detail. We will we'll firstly cover, but it's like a shell. Outer cover that is like an egg. Outer solid cover that is a bony cover around, and inside that the membranous layer is there. So basically, labyrinth is bony labyrinth, which is the outer bony cover. Inside is membranous labyrinth. We all know three semicircular canal. In the labyrinth, three semicircular canal. These are lying posteriorly. So the location will be semicircular canals are posterior. So this is. Posterior part, cochlea. Cochlea is anterior, and this central part is known as vestibule. In the vestibule, the outer bony projection, the outer part is known as vestibule. When we remove the bony, we will talk about the membranous part. So there is two structure in the vestibule. That is a central chamber. So I am talking about this. This is a central chamber. So in central chamber, there are two structures: utricle and secure. The function of utricle sucking. Is for the linear acceleration and deacceleration, for the balance, for the position of head. So most of the balance function, most of the acceleration detection, most of the standing posture maintenance or whatever it is, the ear is used. Uh, ear is helpful for the uh, maintenance of the balance. So majority of the function is by vestibule. That is a central chamber, and in the vestibule there lies the utricle and secure. Utricle will revise. <clears throat> utricle secure. These are two windows, and in this utricle and secure, which is uh, present in the central part, there is lying the macula, which is the sensory neuroepithelium. So, what I macula. So, this is one window. This is. <clears throat> this is uh, suppose 
uh, this surface is facing towards here. So lateral surface, there is opening of oval window, round window. On the medial part of the vestibule, medial side, towards the brain, there is two windows. There are two structures, uh, utricle and secure. Okay. So suppose this is my central vestibule. So there are two things, utricle and secure. Secure is spherical, utricle is oval shaped. Okay. So in this central part, utricle and secure, which is shown here by the green color. You can see the greenish imagination. So, membrane is part, if you can see. Okay, so this spherical part is secure and this, this part, okay. Try to look at this, this is utricle. This utricle and secure, they both are having macula as a sensory neuroepithelium. And this macula is having otogonia. So otogonia is basically present in the vestibule. In a patient of BPPV, there is dislodgement of otogonia. So these otogonia, which are present in this utricle and secure, suppose black black dot. So I'm, I'm uh, putting this by means of otogonia. So in BPPV patient, this otogonia, which are present in the neurosensory epithelium of the utricle or secure, or we can say vestibule. So this they may dislodge and look at the position of the semicircular canal, and then they may enter into the semicircular canals. So these autogonia, whenever they enter into the semicircular canal, these autogonia will irritate the neurosensory epithelium of semicircular canal, and that will lead to giddiness. So autogonia are nothing but uh, what is autogonia? Autogonia is calcium carbonate crystal. Okay, these are calcium carbonate crystal present in the macula. Macula is sensory part of vestibule, utricle and secure. The sensory part of semicircular canal, sensory neuroepithelium, the sensory part is known as ampullae. Ampullae. So semicircular canal, sensory part, which is having the sensory neuroepithelium is ampullae. Uh, macula is the sensory neuroepithelium, sensory part of the utricle and secure. Cool. Three semicircular canal, we all know. There are three semicircular canal. Superior, so this is superior semicircular canal. You can see outer bony shell and inside the purple color is membranous part. Cool. Another semicircular canal, this is posterior semicircular canal. And this is lateral semicircular canal. So now look at the picture. This lateral semicircular canal is having a bulge or projection over the medial wall of middle limb. So in labyrinthine fistula, which semicircular canal is affected? Lateral semicircular canal. But in a patient of BPPV, benign paroxysmal position of vertigo, the otogonia, most commonly they dislodge in posterior semicircular canal. You can see I have drawn the arrow like this. And because of the gravity, you may think of the reason. Because posterior semicircular canal, the position of our brain is like this, that posterior semicircular canal turn out to be at the lower level from all other canals. Okay? So, the posterior semicircular is a lower level, so because of the gravity, autogonia has a more chance of dislodgement in the posterior semicircular canal. So in a patient of BPPV, which semicircular canal is affected? Posterior semicircular canal. What is the sensory organ of semicircular canal? Ampullae. Now this is cochlea, which is anteriorly present. Now look at the cochlea, like ice cream, softy. You know, the basal tones, these are the basal tones which are starting from here. These are the basal tones and this is my apical tone. Apex of the basal uh, cochlea tones, the apex, apex part, that is known as helicotrema. We have seen, we have studied this because this is happening the under, uh, inside the purple color landmark. That is, that is what? That is membranous uh, <coughs> layer, also known as cochlear duct. So cochlear duct is the membranous part of the cochlea. Cochlea, if you talk, then that is complete bony cochlea. So it's a snail form. The rings are two and a half or two, two by three by four. But the point to remember, examination point of the basal tones are responsible for high frequency sounds. In cochlea, the basal tones, so basal tones are recognizing the high frequency sound. And the apical tones of the cochlea, they are responsible for low frequency sound. Understood? Minus disease, we used to study here. Minus disease, 
which is the only pathology where patient is having low frequency sound hearing loss. And the reason is in Meniere's disease, the lesion or pathology starts in apical part. So that is the reason. In Meniere's disease, because there is an increased pressure, there is an increased endolymph, so everything will be dilated. If suppose this membranous part is dilated, so first thing to affect in cochlea is not the basal tone, but the apical tones. So apical tone, the pathology starts. That's the reason lower frequency sound will be uh, uh, affected more. And the reason is because of the apical tone, because the apical tone is responsible for low frequency sounds. Okay. Now look at the another picture about the anatomy part. We heard in the cochlea that we generally draw, I'll just simplify. If I took a cross section of this cochlea, suppose I took a cross section of this cochlea. So there will be three chambers will be formed. Above one is scala vestibuli, middle one is scala media, and the lower one is scala tympani. Understood? This is the cross section. Now look at this picture. Suppose this is my complete cochlea. So, if I talk about this cross section, this much part, if I see, okay. So, above the membranous part, this is my scalar vestibuli. And you can see the scalar vestibuli, there is an opening of oval window. Look at the picture, oval window. Okay, so this is oval window. Oval window is opening into scalar vestibuli, which is above the middle part, scalar media which is shown in the purple color. This is the cochlear duct. Membranous part of the cochlea. So middle part is membranous part. Scala media. So this is scala media. Then below that comes scala tympani. And you can see the round windows opening in scala tympani. Clear? So <clears throat> look at the diagram. Oval window enters open into the oval window opens into the Scala vestibule. Round window opens into the scala tympani. Okay. Now, this is a cross section part. <clears throat> in cochlea, we all know outer hair cell and inner hair cells are present. Inner hair cell is responsible for hearing. Outer hair cells are not contributing in the hearing, they are just modifying the function of the inner hair cell or regulating them. So, excitatory neuron is inner hair cell, inhibitory neuron is outer hair cell which is present in the cochlea in the cochlea where in scala media in scala media this membrane which is separating the tympani and media this is known as basilar membrane over the basilar membrane there is organ of corti which consists of outer hair cell and inner hair cells semicircular canal are responsible for angular acceleration and deacceleration angular motion angular motion is being uh, supported or being seen by the semicircular canal, but <clears throat> the position of head, sense of gravity, okay, linear acceleration and deacceleration. This every work is done by the utricle and circuit, which is a part of, which is a part of vestibule. Okay. Now let's talk about BPPV. Another important question. BPPV. You all know the full term. Benign positional. Uh, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. That means the patient is having vertigo with change in posture of head. So, vertigo with head posture change. So, patient will typically say that whenever patient wakes up in the morning, he was in lying down position, suddenly he want to stand up, he want to sit. So he changes his posture, patient have a sense of giddiness. And this giddiness duration will be from few seconds to few minutes. After that, it will resolve. That will not continue for the hours or days. So patient will have a history of vertigo with head posture change, sudden head posture change, okay? And the vertigo is for the limited duration, few seconds to few minutes. And there can be associated nauseating sensation. There can be associated vertigo. Now, I've already told why BPPV is happening. It is because of entry of otoconia, which is nothing but calcium carbon crystal. These otoconia are usually present in the macula of utricle and secule when they enter into the semicircular canal. Semicircular canal. Most commonly, posterior semicircular canal. 
So they enter, they irritate the neurosensory epithelium of this semicircular canal, which is a sensory organ of sen uh, uh, semicircular canal, that is ampulla. Ampulla is nothing but the dilated end of semicircular canals. So look at the picture again. This is the dilated part. Dilated end. Dilated end. This is the cuscinum. The posterior and superior semicircular canal, they are combining over a posterior end and form a crust canoes. So basically, the semicircular canal, there are three, the opening should be six, entire posterior, but they are having five opening. The reason because posterior and superior semicircular canal join together to form a common entry, which is known as crust canoe. And rest all are having the dilated end. This is dilated end. This is dilated end of uh, virtual semicircular canal, dilated end of posterior semicircular canal, and this is dilated end of superior semicircular canal. Now, I'll give you a uh, certain uh, other idea. The semicircular canal, the lateral semicircular canal is having a bulge at middle ear, medial wall. Superior semicircular canal sometimes is having, it is having a bulge over the petrous apex. Because look at the position. Look at the position, it is superiorly lined. So the ear, suppose this is my ear is embedded into the petrous part. So petrous bone is going like that. From the down, from the upper. So this semicircular canal bulge is present over the petrous apex, petrous bone, uh, or over the middle cranial fossa. And that part is known as arcuate eminence. And sometimes the superior semicircular canal, this bony part, may get defected. Maybe congenital or some other reason. And because of that, the membranous semicircular duct is in direct contact with the brain, with the interior pressures, okay? So that may lead to what I So superior semicircular canal dissent syndrome. That is what? Nothing but absence of this bone from here. So this topmost part is, you know, brain. Suppose this is my skull brain. So anterior cranial fossa, middle cranial fossa, and posterior cranial fossa. This middle cranial fossa boundary is formed by what? So these are two petrous bones, okay? That's how the anatomy is. So this is middle cranial fossa. So in middle cranial fossa, the uh, this temporal moon is like this, where the ear system is there. This is the petrous apex. Over the petrous apex, somewhere the superior semicircular having superior semicircular canal is having a bulge. Whenever we look this, uh, from above the skull, so bulge will be here, and this will be known as arcuate eminence. And sometimes this bony part is defect. So the membranous part is in direct contact with the brain, with the meninges, and in brain always pressure changes will occur. There will be raise in pressure, low pressure. So because of these changes, loud sound or whatever it is, patient may have a So this is known as superior semicircular canal, Dyson syndrome, another important topic. BPPV. <clears throat> in BPPV, uh, I told you symptoms, what I go, females are commonly affected. BPPV, females are more affected than males. The vertigo is on change of the posture. Now, diagnosis. For the diagnosis of BPPV, one maneuver we do is known as Dix Holpike maneuver. I've chosen the diagram because nowadays pictorial discussions are there. So, there is for the diagnosis of BPPV, diagnosis, we do Dix Holpike maneuver. D for D. Okay? So, that's how you can remember. Dix Holpike is for the diagnosis. D for D of BPPV. And for the treatment, for the treatment of BPPV, we do Aplias maneuver. Okay? So, treatment part is by Aplias maneuver. Okay? So, try to remember the diagram. You don't have to read out everything. You can't remember everything. So, Dix Holpike for the diagnosis, generally, in Dix Holpike maneuver, if the examiner want to ask which is this procedure, so generally Dix Holpike, two images are there. Okay, turning to 45 degree, then taking the patient into a supine position with the head turned to 45 degree. So that will induce a misdiagnosis. That will induce a what I go. So this is Dick's topic. Two images. Apple's maneuver is for the treatment of the BPPV. So five images. One, two, three, four, five. So five images. That's how you can simplify the things and easy to remember. So Apple's for the treatment of the BPPV. What is the difference between the vertigo of the Meniere's disease and BPPV? In Meniere's disease, vertigo is not associated with the postural change. Sudden origin, suddenly arises. 
and the duration of the vertical the duration of the giddiness is from few minutes to few hours few hours to few days so it will having a longer duration and along with that minus this is the tried there is a tried tried of tinnitus what i got hearing loss in bpv there is no hearing loss bpv no hearing loss minus this is there is a tried tried of tinnitus hearing loss in what i go bpv only what i go nothing else another important topic vemp visual uh, vestibular evolved myogenic potential look at the diagram in this what we do vestibular evolved so we are putting the electrodes over the muscle what we are doing we are stimulating the vestibule and noting the changes in the muscle the potential action potential generated in the muscle so look at the picture one probe i have inserted into the ear into the canal to stimulate the vestibule okay and whenever the vestibule stimulate there will be some action potential action potential difference in the muscles so we put another electrodes over the sternocleidomastoid muscle so look at the picture sternocleidomastoid muscle sternocleidomastoid muscle is the muscle which is separating the anterior neck triangle and the posterior neck triangle you know we have studied out of the topic but suppose this is my posterior neck triangle triangles of the neck interior posterior so scm sternocleidomastoid is the differentiating feature and the anterior part is the anterior triangles of the neck which include digastric triangle anterior triangle middle triangle, whatever it is so <coughs> if this diagram is being given suppose where the electrodes are over the muscle and one probe into the ear and one probe over the forehead to check for the this time so the ocular activity also so basically in when vestibular evolve we stimulate the vestibule ear vestibule by the probe and then we uh, check for the potential in the uh, changes in the uh, action potential in the muscle so basically when what to remember it stimulate the secure it checks the function of secure utricular and secure both but more precisely more correct vestibule uh, secure so vamp is a test which tests the secure if secure is not an option you can correct the utricle but if both an option choose the secure and which nerve is tested inferior vestibular nerve okay. inferior vestibular nerve we all know eighth nerve eighth cranial nerve eighth cranial nerve is having cochlear part and vestibular part cochlear part look at this picture again so <laughs> cochlear nerve is arising from the cochlear tongue you can see cochlear nerve fine so cochlear nerve is arising from the cochlear tongue from the vestibule the superior semicircular canal and utricle which is above utricle so these both will form the superior semicircular canal uh, superior vestibular nerve okay above you can see this is utricle utricle is above superior semicircular canal utricle the nerve endings from these two structures will form the superior vestibular nerve and from the lse posterior semicircular canal and secure here this is secure right oh, sorry greenish color secure these three nerve endings will form the inferior vestibular nerve so look at the picture this is a vestibular nerve vestibular nerve is a combination of superior vestibular nerve and inferior vestibular nerve okay now when you ent sometimes the question asks inferior vestibular nerve is the answer of choice now we are talking about vem vestibular revolved myogenic potential so which nerve is tested in the vem again the answer is inferior vestibular nerve sometimes examiner ask uh, acoustic neuroma a neuroma a tumor of vestibular nerve tumor of eighth nerve uh, which segmented arises most commonly again the answer is inferior vestibular nerve the reason reason me look at the look at the superior vestibular utricle close proximity the length of superior vestibular nerve is short as compared to posterior vestibular nerve reason because you look at the picture posterior semicircular lateral semicircular are secure so they are distinct so from all the uh, from all the three structures the nerve fibers are coming so inferior vestibular nerve in thickness also it is more thicker as compared to superior vestibular nerve little broader little longer okay so that's the reason pathologies are more in inferior vestibular nerve 
it's easy to check for the inferior vestibular nerve because thickness is more. Okay, so when again that's how you can remember just make a short twitch. When which nerve is tested? Inferior vestibular nerve and uh, which structure is tested? Secure. And I've told you from the secure inferior vestibular nerve forms. Inferior vestibular nerve generally nerve fibers coming from LSE lateral semicircular canal. Posterior semicircular canal and secure. These three are forming the inferior vestibular nerve. So then inferior vestibular nerve is tested and test the secure. Try to remember this diagram. The structure which is showing the uh, electrodes over the muscle. So it is when superior semicircular canal basis syndrome. I already discussed it. Look at the picture. That same thing I want to show you. So this is my mastoid one. This is my uh, external auditory canal, middle ear, and this is my cochlea. Cool. Now, this is my internal acoustic meatus, internal auditory canal. From where all the nerves are coming or going in the brain. So, this is IAC. Now, look at the picture. The anatomy of semicircular canal, like this, that this is superior semicircular canal, which is having a bulge over the floor of middle cranial fossa. Middle cranial fossa, floor. So that bulge is present here. Okay. So this is present in the petrous bone. Up to this level is the mistral bone. Then this part is petrous bone. This is petrous bone. So this bulge is superior semicircular canal. So whenever this bony projection is absent, this bone is absent directly the inside membranous part. Membranous part is present inside, which is known as secular ducts or uh, sorry, uh, semicircular ducts. Okay, so this membranous part will come in contact with the brain or middle cranial fossa where there are always pressure changes, patient cough, intracranial pressure increases. During time of defecation, sometimes pressure, intracranial pressure increases. Some pathologies, ICT is increases, intracranial pressure increases. So that pressure may hit the labyrinth. Because bone is deficient, membranous part is in close proximity, that pressure will hit it, leading to vertigo. So that's another reason so superior semicircular canal descent syndrome. And it is rule of ICT, increase intracranial pressure, maybe because of the coughing, maybe because of the vomiting, maybe because of the valsalva maneuver. Valsalva maneuver again, ICT pressure increases, and if this is descent, patient may have vertigo. It is also known as third window phenomenon. Two windows are one window, wrong window, third window. So this is superior semicircular dyson syndrome. There is one phenomenon, Tilio phenomenon. We have heard in Meniere's disease. What is this? Sometimes patient of Meniere's disease, even patient of uh, sorry Meniere's disease, whenever there is loud sound, because of the loud sound, patient will have vertigo. So this uh, Tilio phenomenon is typical of Meniere's disease. phenomenon this is typical of Meniere's disease so what is Tulio phenomenon Meniere's disease okay Tulio phenomenon is a phenomenon where on hearing the loud sound vertigo is happening why this is happening because in Meniere's disease everything is enlarged the membranous part secure and utricle got enlarged so whenever the loud sound hit to the whenever the loud sound hit to the stapes or through the oval window again look at the position again look at the position if suppose this greenish color utricle and secure this green color they enlarge so look at the position of the oval window if this will enlarge, it will come in close proximity to the oval window. This is oval window, right? So loud sound hitting the oval window will also hit the uterine and secure. We will also stimulate them. And because of stimulation of uterine and secure, patient will feel the vertigo or giddiness. So that's the reason. Now let's go a little bit fast. <clears throat> okay. If suppose patient is having a giddiness on Valsalva on blowing of the nose, on coughing, okay, on coughing, coughing, valsalva, blowing of the nose, two, three reasons, 
one reason if there is a history of ear discharge unsuccessful cholestatoma then we may think of labyrinthine fistula if there is no history of cso like no history of ear discharge no history of ear surgery nothing even if that patient on loud uh, not on loud sound patient on coughing will solve a patient feels the symptom what i go feel the symptom of giddiness then you may have to think of superior semicircular canal dyson syndrome so we have to go for city scan of brain or mri of the brain to rule out whether that bulge of superior semicircular is absent or not so what is the different in meniere's disease and superior semicircular canal dyson syndrome in meniere's disease loud sound will cause uh, uh, uh this what i go in superior semicircular canal dyson syndrome or labyrinthine fistula vomiting blowing the nose while salva many were coughing pulse fading all the all these things which are increasing the intracranial pressure and that pressure can be transmitted to the superior semicircular canal uh, uh if there is a dyson so that is typical of uh, superior semicircular canal dyson syndrome now another frame of the question is 60 year old diabetic patient 60 year old diabetic patient presented with earic ear discharge which is bloody also with granulation at external auditory canal or the brain stem whatever the line is mentioned so a patient is diabetic he is in elderly age group with continuous ear discharge granulation and patient may or may not have facial palsy so what is the diagnosis diagnosis is malignant otitis externa so whenever framing like this malignant otitis external all these are within a malignant otitis external a malignant otitis external is typically happening in immuno compromised patient patient of steroid or diabetic patients are generally elderly age group they are presented with the, all the symptoms of the csm along with that two three words will be mentioned like granulations there may be granulations in the ec or in the skull base and there can be history of the facial palsy so diagnosis think of malignant otitis externa what is malignant otitis externa it's not a cancer it is an highly virulent organism which is pseudomonas aeruginosa whenever the pseudomonas causes repeated infection in the ear that will produce the the pseudomonas also produce a prophylactic enzyme so it damages the bone produce the granulations so it spread along the skull base and you know from the skull base multiple granulomas are coming out so in malignant otitis externa which nerve is affected first trisaminoma fifth nerve so there will be loss of corneal sensation first sign first symptom but which nerve will got paralysis got paralysis because facial nerve is the maximum course in the skull base you know uh, length of the facial nerve is uh, crossing in the middle ear right A horizontal segment, a vertical segment. We all have studied. So, facial and maximum part is running around the skull base. So, facial paralysis is common in a patient of malignant otitis externa if not treated. Okay. So, what are the typical features of the malignant otitis externa? Caused by pseudomonas. You know, a patient, patient, elderly patient. What is the first scan to do? First scan will do is technetium bone scan. Because suppose this is my skull. This is my skull, nose and mouth and all that. So basically, the skull base is like this. Suppose this is your ear. So what is happening in pseudomonas or malignant otitis externa? There will be granulation in the ear, and the skull base will have multiple granulations, lesions, necrosis, thrombi malignants going on. So it's spreading on skull base, and we all know skull base from the skull base, all the nerves are coming out. All the nerves, seventh nerve, eighth nerve, whatever the nerve, they are coming, exiting from the skull base. So there are chances of multiple cranial palsy. Since the facial nerve has the longest course here, running in the ear, okay, then coming out through the parotid and forming multiple branches. So facial paralysis is common. But the first nerve affected, con loss of corneal sensation because of the trisaminal. Okay, what is the first scan to do? Because skull base is a bone. In the malignant otitis externa, there is thromboembolic even going on. so we will do the technetium bone scan and that will tell about that this part is necrosed so the infection is spread to skull base so technetium bone scan is the first scan for malignant otitis externa if we need to take the follow up of the patient so for the follow up best scan is gallium scan so first scan is technetium entering follow up 
prognosis checkup, gallium stem. Okay, what is the treatment of malignant otitis eczema? Anti pseudomonal antibodies. What are these? Third generation cephalosporin and amino glucosides. Okay, and also with along with that, we also do the surgical debridement because in malignant otitis eczema, I told you it's a thromboembolic event with the formation of the multiple granulations. So the foramens of the brain from where the granules are crossing or coming out, that foramen will get blocked. There will be edema. So to relieve that, remove the granulations. So what we'll do, we'll give the third generation cephalosporin amino glucosides. And along with that, if required, we can go for surgical debridement of granulations of the pathology. Now, internal auditory canal. What is important? Skull is the marked structure here. This, this foramen is internal auditory canal. This is my petrol packs. See, this is my, my middle cranial fossa. This is anterior cranial fossa. Okay. This is anterior cranial fossa, this is middle cranial fossa, and this is posterior cranial fossa. Understood? This is my line which is separating the middle and posterior uh, cranial fossa. This is my petrous apex. Okay? This is the apex part. Now look at this. Fifth cranial now, sixth cranial now are somewhat close proximity because you can see the impression given here. This is petrous apex and here lies the cavernous sinus. Both the sides. And in between, cellata sica, this is pit, uh, pituitary gland. Okay? So look at the picture. I'll rather zoom in. Okay. So... Okay. So, this is the line from where you can see this circle, this is my internal auditory canal, this foramen, and from the internal auditory canal, the 8th and 7th uh, and 8th canal are coming out. This is petrous apex. This is the foramen for the carotid. Here lies both the sides, the cavernous sinus. Here lies the pituitary gland, that is the cellular sica. Understood? I'm just out of question. <coughs> Sigmoid sinus, where it lies. You know, behind the ear. So, Sigmoid sinus, this is the mastoid part. This is the mastoid, this is the petrous. So, sigmoid sinus somewhere like this. Okay? This is sigmoid sinus. From where the so, uh, petrosal sinus, transverse sinus, this is all are draining in a particular mechanism. Okay? So, what is important? What is imp important in internal auditory canal? Suppose this is my internal auditory canal. So, from above, there is a bony projection. Above, there is a bony projection which is known as Bill's bar. In IAC, Bill's bar. Okay, now there is another crust in IAC which is known as falciform crust. Crust, C R E S T. Okay, so what is important? Bell's bar is a vertical. It has been asked multiple times asking. So Bell's bar is a multiple projection. Falciform crust is a horizontal projection of bone. In the IAC internal auditory meters. Now, how the nerves are arranged in IAC? Suppose this is anterior. This is posterior part. Okay. So anteriorly there lies facial nerve. Below it, what is nerve? Cochlear nerve. Cool. Behind posteriorly, above is superior vestibular nerve. Lower is inferior vestibular nerve. Acoustic nerve is most commonly arising from. Inferior vestibular now. Understood. Suppose this is anterior portion, this is posterior portion. So anteriorly facial now, posteriorly superior vestibular now. Uh, inferior part, cochlear now anteriorly, uh, inferior vestibular now, posteriorly. How to remember? Mnemonic FAN. F A N. That's how you can remember. F A N. Fans are always ahead. Fan. So F facial now is lying anteriorly. Okay, that's how you can simply remember. So, facial nerve is anterior and this bar is a vertical bony projection. Now, what is pinna hematoma? Look at the picture. Generally, pinna hematoma, there is a condition, multiple sign trauma in the pinna. In pinna, there is no subcutaneous tissue, skin and mucopericontrin or the cartilage. Okay, so hit over the pinna that will lead to collection of blood in between the upper layer, skin, 
mucoperitoneum and the cartilage. So in between the cartilage and mucoperitoneum, then blood will be collected. So look at the picture. This is the collection of the blood between the mucoperitoneum and the cartilage. Now, why this is important? Because there is no sacral tissue, this blood collection will slowly do the cartilage necrosis, perichondritis. Because it's a closed chamber, there will be high tension if the blood is collected because skin is tightly adherent. So anything is collected that will lead to high pressure, high tension. <coughs> and this is the uh, diagram will be shown like this. So this is a case of sept, uh, pinna hematoma. If this persists, that may produce abscess. Pinna abscess may happen. It is generally occurring in boxes. Restless who are fighting, who are doing the hit. So hit over this may produce hematoma. Okay. And the ear of boxers ear restless is also known as cauliflower ear. So cauliflower ear is because of the blood trauma to the pinna. There is a collection of blood later leading to cartilage necrosis and the pinna shape is deformed. So that is cauliflower ear. What is the treatment? Treatment is asked suppose. So what I'll do? I'll put a nick, cut it down, allow the blood to drain. Then I'll put the tight pressure bandage so that the skin will get adherent back to the underlying cartilage. So what we'll do? I'll put a nick. We can do the IND, whatever it is. So incision, drain the fluid collected and then put the tight pressure bandage. What is bat ear? Have you seen the bat? Bat ear is like this. So look at the ear. In ear, we know this is helix of pinna. And here you can see there is no anti-helix. So bat ear is nothing but absence of anti-helix. Okay, so this is the diagram of the bat ear. Try to remember the diagram. Okay, so this is bat ear. There is no anti-helix. Look at the normal pinna. This is helix. And this is anti-helix. So in bat ear, the, this inner part, this anti-helix was absent. What are the other structure? This is conca. This is ear canal. Okay. There is a bulge which is known as tragus. Opposite tragus, there is anti tragus. Sometime there is a tubercle also present in the pinna. Survey like this, which is known as Darwin's tubercle. So look at the picture. This is what? Darwin's tubercle. Any importance? No importance. It is generally present in the monkey because being a human being, we are evolving from the monkey. So this remnant of this tubercle, this is Darwin's tubercle. Okay. So we can see in the monkey, this is Darwin's tubercle. That here, absence of empty helix. Now, this is a picture showing mastectomy. So my patient is like this. Oh, is a cursor. Okay. So my patient, suppose, is like this, the position is like this. Okay, this is supposed pinna, this is external auditory canal. So, the uh, this is EAC, external auditory canal, and behind this, suppose this is the mastoid bone. Okay, this is mastoid bone. Now, neck even strangle. What is neck even strangle? We all know he, if we uh, patient is in supine position, this is this is external auditory canal. So there is a bony projection which is known as spinal family. So this is spinal family is the landmark for antrum. What is antrum? Antrum, <coughs> not spinal family, is the boundary basically, uh, which is separating with the external auditory canal and the mastoid cavity. So it, again, spinal family justify the area of the antrum. Deep to that, if we drill, we we'll enter into the Mastoid antrum. Mastoid antrum is nothing but largest mastoid ASN. These are mastoid tip cells. Now, this is external auditory canal. So look at the picture. When I'm doing the mastoidectomy, so what we have done, suppose this is my part of tympanic membrane, which is shown here, tympanic membrane, normal tympanic membrane. So basically this area is what we see external auditory canal. This part, which we can see. If I remove this mucopericondrium, so this is the mastoid bone. So what I'm doing is I'm removing the mastoid cortex and drill like this. So in this picture, what we have done is we have opened up the mastoid cavity. We have drilled out. So when we 
drilled out the mustard cavity what are the landmarks you see this picture they can use in the exam so try to focus on the landmarks so as you can see there is a bulge over the medial wall of middle ear so this bulge is lateral semicircular canal now there is a bony projection like this this is a impression of incus incus bone this is the posterior boundary of external auditory canal anteriorly this is tympanic membrane which is intact you can see in the diagram now we drilled between facial nerve and quadrant tympanic nerve so this is my facial nerve uh, i'll mark this in green color so as you can see here this is my facial nerve going on it is coming from the ear in between above there is lateral semicircular canal below there is oval window from the middle ear it is going like this so this is facial nerve another branch of facial nerve that is the cordae tympani which is a third branch of facial nerve is running tympanic membrane it is running okay canal of hugo so this is my cordae tympani now above there is fossa incutis which is having the incus bone fossa incutis process of incus okay so fossa incutis so this chamber this area what is this basically this approach is posterior tympanotomy posterior tympanotomy okay this suppose that is drilling between the facial nerve uh cordae tympani nerve above the fossa incutis and this area again is the facial recess area what is facial recess area facial recess area is nothing but one end is uh, uh, guarded by the facial nerve one end is guarded by the cordae tympani above there is fossa incutis with the incus bone impression so basically this area is fossa incutis and this approach to enter into the middle ear from behind to enter into the middle ear from the behind this approach is known as posterior tympanotomy approach and this is particularly used in cochlear implant surgery cochlear implant surgery what we do in cochlear implant surgery because the child is not hearing tympanic membrane is intact so what we will do we will put we will put the uh, that uh, uh, cochlear implant part over the skull base and then electrodes we have to enter the electrodes into the middle ear so what we will do we will drill out this space we will do the posterior stapedotomy between the facial and cordae tympani from there the electrodes are inserted into the middle ear and then embedded into the round window so this approach is posterior tympanotomy now understood now impression of other nerve superior semicircular canal will look like this if we drill more it is more deep posterior semicircular canal impression is this like this okay uh, so it is more vertical so it will be like if we deep or uh, uh, if we drill more but in this picture lse is shown facial nerve is shown uh, round window is shown which is here round window directly enter the electrodes into the round window now next thing facial nerve facial nerve seventh cranial nerve mixed cranial nerve has a motor sensory function everything what is important in the facial nerve we know four parts of the facial nerve cranial segment which is in the brain facial nerve is arising from the brain stem we all know uh, the facial nerve uh, the sensory part of the facial nerve is known as nerve of risbo in the middle ear which is the narrower segment of the facial nerve labyrinthine segment labyrinthine segment labyrinthine segment is which segment in which is passing between the labyrinth so this is my labyrinth so this part this particular around 4 mm area this is my labyrinthine segment facial nerve facial nerve what is happening it is coming from the brain stem suppose this is my brain stem from the brain stem facial nerve is coming out entering into the internal auditory canal coming out entering into the labyrinth so this part is a uh, labyrinthine segment from the labyrinth right, taking a sharp turn taking a sharp turn to form the first joint this is first genu of facial nerve from the first genu which uh, branch of the facial nerve is arising greater superficial petrosal nerve gspn it is the first branch of the facial nerve important easy to remember first genu location is 
anterior limb and middle ear from the left the segment it is taking a turn so this is gspl second then enter into the middle ear crossing in between the you know stapes bone in between the stapes and this projection what is this lateral semicircular canal do we have studied in the middle ear i have told you facial nerve is between the lateral semicircular canal and oval window so look at the picture stapes so here must be the oval window here must be the lateral semicircular canal bulge in the middle ear so crossing that then taking a sharp turn so it is second genu then taking a vertical course behind the ossicle in the posterior part of the uh, posterior wall so it is entering in the posterior wall crossing a uh, vertical structure bypassing it and then coming out from the parotid gland now what is important this much part is important first branch is gspn second branch second branch is now to stay please so all the branches <coughs> are marked by uh, different color <coughs> green so second branch is nerve to stapedius which is supplying the stapedial muscle which is attached to the pyramid we have studied we have seen stapedial tendon and pyramid this is second branch third branch is cord tympani so look at this cord tympani cord tympani it is going like this and this area between cord tympani and facial nerve is the facial recess area where we drill in the posterior stapedomic technique so third branch is cord tympani cord tympani function is for the taste sensation from the anterior to third of the tongue nerve to stapedius is responsible for the protection of middle ear loud sound will produce more vibration of stapes stapedial muscle contract stapes movement will be decreased and there will be protection of the inner ear from the loud sound okay so it will thus uh, protect the cochlea protect the organ of cochlea okay so this is facial a basic idea about the anatomy now look at this picture again same thing facial nerve 11th and segment Entering into the middle ear, making first genu, geniculate genu. First branch is coming. Okay, <clears throat> petrosal now GSPN or PSGN. Greater superficial petrosal now. What is the function for the lacrimation? Okay, so if GSPN is defective, if the lesion is here, that means all the nerve function will be lost. All the three branches function will be lost if the lesion is about the geniculate ganglion. So GSM function is for the watering in the eyes, tear. Okay, so there will be dryness of the eye. If fissure of palsy above the level of geniculate ganglion, then there will be uh, dryness in the eyes also because GSPN is for the lacrimation. Second branches, I told you, now to stapes. Now this is stapes. This is stapes one. This is my pyramid. As you can see, the pyramid, the stapedial muscle tendon is inserting into the neck of the stapes. so this muscle you can see here the second branch this from the facial arising and inserting into the muscle nerve to stapedius so this is second so if lesion is here if lesion is here so which level lesion is there we just think of the branch and think of the anatomy and you can easily solve the answers third branch is cord tympani it is running in one canal which canal canal of hugo okay so this is my Coda, okay, understood. And this is another part, uh, <coughs> round window. Okay, whatever it is. Now, uh, okay, uh, stapedius muscle is supplied by the facial nerve. It's a part of anatomy, important. There is another muscle in the middle ear. There are only two muscles. One is stapedial muscle supplied by the seventh nerve. Another muscle is tensor tympani. This muscle, tensor tympani muscle as you can see this muscle this muscle is running in the canal in the anterior wall of the middle ear so this muscle is tensor tympani which is attached over the malleus okay over the malleus and this muscle is supplied by the fifth cranial nerve that is trigeminal nerve okay so tensor tympani muscle is supplied by the trigeminal nerve which branch mandibular branch but basically fifth not mandibular branch facial nerve stapedius muscle is supplied by the seventh cranial nerve that is the facial nerve so middle ear two muscles are supplied by the different nerves sensory supply of middle ear look at the network yellow color this sensory supply you can you can see the sensory supply of the middle ear is by the glossopharyngeal nerve glossopharyngeal ninth nerve so uh, <coughs> Uh, the sensory supply of the middle ear 
is everything by the ninth cranial nerve. And this ninth cranial nerve is also present in the posterior pillars of the tonsil in the nasopharynx. That's why the nasopharyngeal pathology may result in ear pain. Okay. We are discussing anatomy part also. Now, this is another diagram showing the ossicles from the middle ear side. Now, look at this picture. This is facial nerve. Bigger trunk. This small trunk. This is what? This is corda. So, corda is third branch of facial nerve. Okay. And <coughs> the associate you, you can see, which is going in the nasopharynx. Above you station tube, there is a tensor tympani muscle which is supplied by the fifth cranial. Now it is attached where over the milius. Okay, over the <coughs> milius. Cordial tympani, as you can see, the canal of cordial tympani is known as canal of Kuhl. Now this is another diagram just to show sinus tympani facial recess. Facial recess, I have already told you. In the above diagram between the facial nerve and the cordial tympani nerve. So if I do the cross section, as you can see, this area is facial recess. It is in between which structure? Now look at the first structure, facial nerve. This bigger facial nerve. Another is cordial tympani. And roof of the facial recess, I told you, is by four sine two discs. Four sine two discs. Imagine this is stapes. So above this, there will be attachment of the incus. Incus, if suppose I imagine that incus is here, so incus is the depression where the incus bone is resting. That is, four centimeter is known as. So look at this area. This is my facial recess area. Facial recess area between facial nerve and cordial tympani nerve. Now look at the sinus tympani. I told you sinus tympani. Uh, I try to explain over the medial wall between the ponticulus and subiculus. Ponticulum, ponticulus and subiculum. Okay. Now look at this picture. This area is my. Sinus tympani, sinus tympani. Between where sinus tympani, and we will look at this structure. Between ponticulus, ponticulus was connecting between oval window and round window, differentiating uh, oval window, round window, and uh, not ponticulus. Sorry, subiculum. Ponticulus was between uh, pyramid to promontory. Now look at this. This is pyramid, and promontory will be going side. So from Pyramid to promontory, the bony projection ponticulus. So you can imagine the ponticulus will be somewhere like this, and subiculum is between lower window and round window. So you can see upper is ponticulus, lower is subiculum. In between ponticulus and subiculum is the sinus tympani. So it is the most common site of residual cholesterolma. All better we can say. Look at this picture. This is stapes uh, oval window, stapes uh, bone. So stapes bone, facial nerve, uh, bony projection. So there is a depression below the facial nerve. Facial nerve uh, bulges the facial canal. So facial nerve uh, canal, the depression beneath the bony surrounding of the facial canal. So this depression, the cholesterolma may get collected, and it is difficult to remove because it is below the facial nerve. Okay. So this is sinus tympani. <coughs> This was part for the uh, this. Now Bell's palsy, facial palsy, very very important. Multiple question asks, what is Bell's palsy? Idiopathic facial palsy, idiopathic, without any reason. The pathology found is there is edema of the facial nerve in the facial canal. We all know facial nerve basically is running in the body canal. So facial nerve, suppose this is my canal. So facial nerve is basically. Running in the canal, so it in Bell's palsy. The reason is unidentified, idiopathic. Suggested reasons are viral reason, pressure changes, edema happening in the facial nerve. So because of this edema in a tight chamber, that will lead to paralysis of the facial nerve. So Bell's palsy is a idiopathic disease, self-limiting disease. There may be grade one, two, three, four, five, six, six grade of the facial nerve palsy. So what are the symptoms in Bell's palsy? Bell's palsy is again LMN palsy, lower motor neuron palsy. It is not a upper motor neuron, upper motor neuron lesion. It is lower motor neuron lesion. Now in Bell's palsy, whichever side is affected, complete half of the face is affected. So look at the picture. One half of the face, this side, all the motor function are lost because facial nerve is not working. So all the expression muscles, the muscles which are supplied by the facial nerve, all the muscles of expression are lost, including forehead. So Bell's palsy, same side forehead wrinkles will be lost. Forehead is involved in Bell's palsy. Okay, so in Bell's palsy, the one half of the uh, face will be uh, 
in the facial paralysis so there will be no movement of the one half so what are the symptoms absence of wrinkles usually they fold will be absent if patient smile so the working side in this patient this side is normal this side is normal here and this side is face having facial palsy so this side muscle is not working so when patient try to smile it will angle of mouth will be shifted to the normal side i blink patient can't blink the eyes plus gsv now is defective so there is uh, uh, there is a less uh, lacrimation so dryness of eye epiphora sometimes starting with epiphora then dryness of the eye so these are the multiple symptom of the bell's palsy the point to remember is idiopathic uh, so uh, certain viral lesion like hsv virus herpes uh, herpes simplex virus or uh, some sort of uh, edema some sort of hematological uh, issues or whatever the reason is so bell's palsy happen bell's palsy is self limiting disease treatment of choices treatment of choices in bell's palsy is steroids we know steroids it is the main state of main stay of treatment of bell's palsy minimum we have to give steroids in a tapering dose for 3 weeks so we give steroids in patient of bell's palsy uh, for 3 weeks okay so steroid is the main stay of treatment then what are the other treatments you can do the facial physiotherapy generally facial physiotherapy started after 3 days of facial palsy so facial physiotherapy started with after 3 days of facial palsy origin of facial palsy antiviral like acyclovir bisyclovir it should be started within first 3 days so steroids main stay at least steroids is prescribed for 3 weeks antiviral treatment is like you have to start within first 3 days if first 3 days has passed there is no role of antiviral physiotherapy you need to start after 3 days of original facial palsy okay <clears throat> now one phenomenon is happening in facial palsy hyperacusis what is hyperacusis you know stapedius muscle is supplied by the facial nerve if facial nerve palsy there will be no function of stapedius muscle stapedial muscle work what were that doing that will contracting the stapedius muscle so restricting the movement of stapedius bone that's how uh, uh, this is protecting the inner ear protecting the organ of cauda because it limit the transmission of sound energy into the inner ear if this muscle is not working loud sound come stapedial muscle not work loud sound means go inside so patient will hear louder sound so hyperacusis so hyperacusis is the feature of facial palsy hearing more because of loss of stapedius muscle function okay <clears throat> most common site of most common part of the facial nerve affected that is labyrinthine segment labyrinthine segment is the narrowest and the shortest part of the facial nerve okay and maximum edema if it may happen so labyrinthine part is most commonly affected okay that is the shortest part length of labyrinth labyrinthine segment is 4 mm recovery in bell's palsy cases is around 85% of cases 85% of cases will be will heal better they will recover 10 to 15% of cases even after 3 weeks even after 3 months of the medical management okay if patient is not healing still the facial paralysis is there then go for surgical decompression that is facial now decompression surgery if therapy fails even after 3 weeks if we wait for 6 months then will the surgery will help no surgery has to be done the decision has to be taken after maximum wait for 21 days that is 3 weeks so if 21 days has passed on medical treatment then you will near think of facial nerve decompression surgery what is decompression surgery we just remove the bony layer that closed chamber facial nerve edema is affected so we'll remove the bony layer so if we remove the facial then our facial nerve will get more space to expand so edema will not cause necrosis of nerve fiber so that is a decompression surgery funda but the point to remember is decompression surgery has to be done a uh, decision has to be taken after 21 days 3 weeks trial of the medical management but preferably uh, 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 in the first month or second or the third month if you do surgery after 6 months of facial paralysis it will not help because the fibers are already damaged if you decompress still there will be no revival so do it initially so wait for uh, give the treatment for 3 weeks if not improving then immediately go for facial nerve decompression surgery
Now another variation, Ramsayan syndrome, you all know, Ramsayan syndrome, herpes zoster. It is because of herpes zoster. So herpes zoster basically genicolitic anemia of the fish now. Okay, suppose this is fish now, taking a turn. So this is first genome. Generally, herpes zoster virus is in the <laughs> dormant stage. In between, it gets active. Active lesion will uh, result in Ramsey Hunt syndrome. What is the differentiation in Ramsey and Fischel palsy, Bell's palsy? Ramsey Hunt syndrome is caused by herpes zoster, which is a highly virulent. There will be vesicles present around the ear, interior part of the ear. Look at the picture. This is a case of Ramsey syndrome. So, Ramsey syndrome, firstly, severe pain. There will be vesicular, you can see the vesicular eruptions. There will be vesicular eruptions. Severe pain in the ear, vesicular eruption, and facial palsy. Now, recovering Bell's palsy is around 85% of the cases in Ramsen syndrome. Now it is because patients are taking antibiotics on time. Now it is the recovery rate is 50%. Less than Bell's palsy, but earlier it was not 50% also. Now it is because some improvement is there. So recovery in Ramsen syndrome is 50% of the cases. So immediately treatment, we have to start the antiviral treatment. Over the vesicle, you can apply the fusidic acid. Do not touch. It will be highly painful. And since this virus which got active here, it will also form the granulations. Melkerson rosenthal syndrome. What is this? It is a triad of, try to remember this picture because uh, uh, this picture is typically showing the Melkerson Rosenthal syndrome. It is a triad of recurrent facial palsy plus fissured tongue. I have already written here Melkerson Rosenthal syndrome. Fissured tongue. Okay. Fissure tongue. Tongue will have multiple fissures like this. And there will be edema over the lips. So swelling of lips, fissure tongue with recurrent facial palsy. Multiple episodes of facial palsy in the past. So that is suggestive of Melkerson Rosenthal syndrome. Patient will come rose like red. Swelling of the lip, fissure tongue will come red and recurrent facial palsy. What are the different causes of recurrent facial palsy? Recurrent facial palsy, important question. Recurrent facial palsy, one disease is Melkerson Rosenthal syndrome. Other disease where it can happen? Diabetes. Immunocompromised state. Facial now tumor. That is also a cause of recurrent facial palsy. Sometimes sarcoidosis. Ramsen syndrome, don't get confused. <laughs> because it's not a recurrent. One episode Ramsey Hunt syndrome maybe 10 to 15 years back, then after 10 to 15 years back, another episode comes. Recurrent air means six months back, there were facial palsy. Even here, three to four episodes of facial palsy. So Ramsey syndrome is not a cause of direct cause of recurrent facial palsy. Main causes are Melkerson Rosenthal syndrome, diabetes, <laughs> uh, facial of tumor, carcinoma of the facial nerve, sarcoidosis, like this. Now, three, four times which we get confused, press by QCs. Paracusis, will say hyperacusis, diplacusis. Now, press by QCs, we all know age related, since in your hearing loss. Similar name, paracusis will say it is a feature of autosclerosis. Patient here better in noisy surrounding. Hyperacusis, we have studied. Patient perceiving loud sound, more louder. Hyperacusis, because of facial palsy. What I have mean? Facial palsy is stapedial muscle function loss, so hyperacusis. Louder sound perceived, more louder. Okay. What is diplacusis? Diplacusis is a feature of Meniere's disease. What is happening? Meniere's disease is a unilateral disease, also known as endolymphatic hydrops. So basically, in Meniere's disease, endolymph, which is present in the membranous labyrinth. Suppose this is my cochlear cross section. You all know this is how we used to draw the diagram: above is scalar vestibular, is scalar media, is scalar tympani. This is middle part is my membranous part. Here lies the endolymph. Endolymph is present in the scala media, right? So what is happening? Here the pressure is increases, endolymph is getting more and more. So there will be bulge of both the membranes in the Meniere's disease, okay? And that will lead to <coughs> production of Meniere's disease triad. What is the triad in Meniere's disease? 
Amenia's disease. Vertigo. Episode in Versailles. Vertigo. Followed by hearing loss. Which type of hearing loss in Menia's disease? Pathologies in the labyrinth. So here having sensory neural hearing loss. And one more thing, Menia's disease, try to remember, low frequency. Sounds are affected first. Why? Because Menia's disease start at the apex of cochlea, helicotrima. So apex, apical tones are responsible for low frequency sound. So Menier's disease involves the apical tone first. That's the reason in Menier's disease, the patient will have low frequency sensory neural hearing loss, vertigo, and thoroughly tinnitus. Tinnitus. So what is diplocusis? Diplocusis because Meniere's disease is a unilateral disease. So suppose one ear is having Meniere's disease, other is normal. In Meniere's disease, there is a phenomenon, recruitment phenomenon in the cochlea, where loud sound are perceived more loud. Not, don't get confused with the hyperacusis. Okay, it's different. So in Meniere's disease, the affected ear, the suppose I provided a particular frequency sound, suppose thousand hertz frequency sound, patient given. Uh, so. One year, normal year, patient will perceive a thousand hertz. But the ear which is having middle ear, because the pathology is in the apical to low frequency, high frequency, that is affected. So the defected ear will perceive that thousand frequency hertz sound as different frequency. So both the ear having different perception of frequencies of the sound. This is known as diplocusis. Because of pathology in the cochlea, the frequency in both the ears are perceived differently. Okay, that is diplocusis. Point to remember is it is for the Meniere's disease. Orthosclerosis, hearing loss is conductive. Meniere's disease, hearing loss is sensory neural. Now, cochlear implant indications. What are the indications? In cochlear implant, we all know the implant has to be inserted into the cochlea, into the round window. So, look at the picture. If you see the picture, the electrodes. This electrode is going like this. Then we do the posterior stepitotomy, uh, posterior tympanotomy approach through the facial viscous area. I inserted my electrodes into the round window. That is scala tympani. Because round window is a membranous layer. You can easily enter through that. Okay. So this is round window. Now, what are the prerequisites for the cochlear implant? Since the cochlear implant is bypassing the Cochlea only, hair cells, not complete cochlea, hair cells. When there is a deformity of the inner hair cells, when there is a deformity of the outer hair cells, basically the membrane organ of cochlea is not working properly. So we use the organ of uh, cochlear implant. These electrodes are being entered into the round window. Look at this picture. These electrodes are entered and entered till end. So what will happen? They will bypass this organ of cochlea and directly these electrodes will stimulate the cochlear nerve. So indication is of cochlear implant, patient should be in profound hearing loss. Firstly, if the hearing loss is moderate to severe, we can go for hearing aid. No need to go for cochlear implant. So it should be profound. It should be sensory neural, not conductive, because conductive pathology are in the middle ear or external ear, and these can be corrected by the surgery. So inner ear, cochlea, okay. So indication is patient must have profound, that is more than 90 decibel hearing loss, 85 to 90 decibel hearing loss, hearing loss, profound, bilaterally. If one ear is functioning normally, don't go for cochlear implant because patients still have one ear to hear, okay, because this surgery is demanding. This surgery is demanding of money, cost, skills, set up, lot of demanding. And after that, rehabilitation also needed. Frequently and very costly. So if one ear is hearing normally, one ear is dead, don't go for cochlear implant. Up to the patient, but do not advise. Okay? So what is a typical condition where cochlear implant is suggested? If patient is a profound bilaterally sense in your hearing loss with normal atrium, cochlear basilar membrane organ of cortex can be defective, but eighth now should be normal. Eighth nerve should be normal. So bilateral profound hearing loss is eighth nerve normal. Now let's talk a little bit about the parts of the uh, cochlear implant. So look at the picture. Cochlear implant, this is the outer part, this is the inner part. 
Okay, outer part is having different wave structure. One is the sounds are picked up. This is microphone. From there, sound are picked up. This is battery. Here comes the speech processor. It processes the speech, and then one part is there with this outer fragment is put here, and one another inner attachment is placed over the skull. Okay, so this part is transmitter. So microphone picking the sound, battery, then speech processor is processing that sound energy into the impulses. Then through the transmitter, sound energy is transmitted in the inner attachment. So this is internal processor. This part, which is attached over the skull, is from the internal uh, uh, processor, the electrodes are then entered and directly supplying the directly submitting the eighth nerve. So eighth nerve has to be intact in a patient of cochlear implant. Okay. And electrodes are placed at scalar tympanum through the round window. Round window, we all know, scalar tympanum. So it is entering into the perilymph. Perilymph is separated from CSR space. So if we are putting the electrodes in the perilymph, perilymph is present in the scalar tympanum. So uh, if an infection happens, so that infection cannot go into the CSF. Why I'm saying this? Because no, that, that can go. So I, I, I told you uh, what I was saying is this is the cochlea, and from the skeleton tympanum there is a connection between the CSF. Okay, so perilymph is more or less similar like CSF. It is connected, CSF is connected to scalar tympani. Through which part? Aqueduct of cochlea. Another important question. So, aqueduct of the cochlea is, is connection between the CSF and scalar tympani. So, perilymph is more or less similar to the uh, CSF. Scalar media, it consists of endolymph, which is having high potassium. So, it is different from the perilymph. Anyway, cochlear implant indication prerequisite. Another thing, auditory brainstem implant, name itself suggests brainstem. Again, then it is also outer unit, outer processor with the microphone uh, uh, transfusion, everything. Internal part of the auditory brainstem implant is the electrodes. As you look at the picture, this part, this is the machine part which we have inserted, we have attached to the skull. Now the electrodes, as you can see, earlier in cochlear implant, electrodes are entering into the cochlea. Here we are bypassing the cochlea, bypassing the eighth nerve. We are inserting the electrodes at the level of brainstem. Okay, brainstem. So auditory brainstem implant is an implant which is directly stimulating the brainstem. It is generally used in which patient? Either there is a deformity of the cochlea, like congenital agenesis of the cochlea, Michel's apiasia. There are different congenital lesions of the cochlea where tons are less. Uh, now is not there. Eighth nerve tumor. Eighth nerve is not functioning. Okay, like acoustic neuroma, acoustic schwannoma. Okay, so in that cases, we put uh, this implant directly into the brain stem. So this is the process, general idea. Where the electrodes are placed in brainstem, in the lateral recess of fourth ventricle. Fourth ventricle, lateral recess. What does it bypasses? It bypasses the cochlea and the eighth nerve. In patient of neurofibromatosis 2, type 2, NF, generally these patients may have bilateral acoustic schwannoma, bilateral auditory nerve tumor. If one ear is normal and other ear patient is having acoustic neuroma, that means, what did it now? Will you go for brain cell implant? No. If one ear is functional, never ever go for cochlear implant or brain cell implant. These cochlear and brain cell implants are used only when both the ears are having severe tragedy. Okay? So, nerve tumor should be bilateral. If unilateral, do not go for brain cell implant because this surgery is risky also. Right? So, electrodes are paid, placed at uh, lateral distance of the fourth ventricle. Indication, if patient of neurofibromatosis metastasis 2 with a bilateral schwannoma, you go for this. In patient with cochlear deformity, 
dysplasia, congenital agenesis of cochlea, Michel's aplasia, different different agenesis of the cochlea. So if there is no cochlea, how you put the implant in the uh, electrodes in the cochlea, which is being required in the co uh, cochlear implant patients? Okay. Another thing, bone anchored hearing aid. Bone anchored hearing aid is used in those patients where either this external auditory canal is defective, external auditory canal atresia, or suppose discharging cavity. Like patient was having cholesterol, he operated, we did the modified radical mastoidectomy. So in mastoid big cavity form, and that cavity in brief frequent time keep on discharging. There is a production of pus, collection of debris or whatever it is. So what are the hearing aid you use here? Again and again because of the discharge, it will get damaged. So and uh, another indication is <coughs> another indication is uh, external auditory canal atresia, absent pinna, absent pinna, absent external auditory canal orifice. Okay, so in those cases, uh, bone anchored hearing aid be used. You can use this bone anchored hearing aid in autosclerosis patient also sometimes. Because the funda of this bone anchor, I'm not saying the autosclerosis is required, you can use, but if uh, it is particularly used, no. So, bone anchored hearing aid, what we are doing is we are putting, uh, suppose this is my skull bone, this is a part of skull bone. So, we are putting a screw, this is a screw in the skull bone. This second part is abutment. So, a screw is inserted in the skull bone, then this abutment is fixed over the screw. And over that, this processor, this piece is attached. So this is perceiving the sound. And what this is doing? This is actually bypassing the air conduction. AC is bypassed. Bone anchored hearing aids will directly produce the vibration. These vibrations will directly stimulate the cochlea. Okay, come on. So in bone anchored hearing aid, it is generally the uh, hearing of the sound energy is by bone conduction. All I meant to say is bone anchored hearing aid bypass the air conductive pathway, air conduction pathway. So vibration in the skull, these vibrations will stimulate the cochlea organ of cotton. That's patient may hear. Bone anchored hearing aids is used in if suppose one side dead ear, one side dead ear, and another side also there is limitations. So if there is a dead ear, what we'll do, this side if you put the bone anchored hearing aid. So one side bone anchored hearing aid will stimulate both the side ears. That is the beauty of this. How? Because the mechanism is by the skull vibration. So if I put the hearing aid, only one side. If this is not functioning, still this will, patient may hear the sound from this side also. Because the vibration of this side sound can be picked and sent to other ear. That is the beauty. Okay, so using AC atresia, postmastoidectomy, absent pinna, or unilateral severe sensory neural hearing loss. See, any unilateral dead ear, unilateral severe sensory neural hearing loss, we never go for brain stem implant or cochlear implant. We always think of hearing aid. But if patient is having severe SNHL, one side, that means completely dead ear, one side. So what you will do, it is preferable to use the bone anchored hearing aid this side, so that from this side, both the ears, little bit work can be done. Because this side, if you do, through the bone conduction, little energy left in the cochlea of the disease side. So whatever the left function is there, that can be used, and opposite side uh, will also get stimulated. So that is the beauty, okay? So whenever unilateral severe or profound sense in your hearing loss, then answer should be bone anchored hearing aid. Whenever there is bilateral profound sense in hearing loss, answer should be cochlear implant. Now another thing, microbic. Look at the diagram. Microbic is nothing but it's a tube with a structure like this which is fixed in the timbering membrane. So it is a port to deliver the drugs into the inner ear. How come this is round window? Round window is membranous. So microbic is nothing but a wick like structure which is connecting uh, the external auditory canal bypassing the, uh, sorry, piercing the timbering membrane and touching the round window. So what are the drug you are putting here in the ESE? through this window can be supplied inside. So like intradentaric uh, dexoma treatment for the Meniere's disease, we use the steroids, we use the intractable tinnitus, we can use the steroids. Intradentaric gentamicin we use for intractable kidneys, vertigo. 
So different different drug delivery that can be assessed by means of micro. So to try to remember the diagram, let me ask: What is impedance audiometry? We all know the basic funda. Impedance audiometry is basically funda is it checks the mobility of tympanic membrane. How come mobility? See, funda is the outer pressure of the the pressure of middle ear and external ear should be equal. If the both side pressure is equal, tympanic membrane will have maximum vibration. maximum conduction of sound if middle ear pressure is negative outer ear pressure is positive so there is different pressure so there will be limitations in the tympanic membrane vibration now tympanic membrane vibration suppose this is tympanic membrane which part is more mobile central part or peripheral part central part is embedded thickly with the umbo peripheral part is little free so peripheral part of tympanic membrane is more mobile as compared to central part Talking about impedance audiometry. Impedance audiometry. What we are doing? Suppose external audio can now. We are using the probe of impedance <coughs> audiometry. It is having three channel. One channel is for the pressure changes. One channel is for giving the sound energy. Another channel is for the receiving the sound energy. What are we reflecting? What is the prerequisite to do impedance audiometry? Tympanic membrane should be normal. If there is a perforation. automatically the middle ear and the external ear pressure will be equalized because of that perforation so to do impedance audiometry correctly tympanic membrane should be intact there should be segregation separation between the middle ear and external ear okay so the prerequisite is tympanic membrane intact if there is a perforation impedance audiometry can't be done if you do you are stupid because there is a perforation so there is no difference of pressure and since it we check for the mobility of tympanic membrane it's already perforated what will check okay so basically impedance audiometry is checking the middle ear pathology if somebody ask impedance audiometry is used to check the function of external ear middle ear inner ear it is for middle ear pure tone audiometry is a different thing there are certain investigation which are particularly for cochlea like auto acoustic emission that is for the cochlea impedance audiometry particularly for the middle ear particularly for the middle ear you station to this function resulting in changes in middle ear which investigation you can check for that impedance audiometry the funda is pressure should be equal on both the sides okay now different different curves look at the curve type a normal the peak if you want to see the peak suppose this is limit 1 this is limit 2 so type a is normal there is one curve type as as autosclerosis So autosclerosis step is is fixed. Fixed. There is no mobility. Tympanic membrane not mobile. Pressure no changes. Pressure is same. But in autosclerosis mobility will be decreased because ossicles are fixed. So this is AS lower peak. AD D for discontinuity of ossicles. AD is ossicular discontinuity. Why? Because if ossicles are discontinued, so tympanic membrane freely vibrate. So high peak. Type C car. Type C car is a uh, ET dysfunction. As you can see, it's on the negative side. This is zero pressure. These are negative pressures. So in ET dysfunction, what will happen? There will be negative pressure in the middle ear. So my graph will be shifted to negative side. So pressure is negative. Peak is same. Another type. Type B flat car. When after ET dysfunction. There is a glue formed in the ear. Glue ear. So if glue is formed, do lot of pressure change there. Whatever you do, there will be no change. Okay, no mobility. Pressure is on other side. So glue ear, the graph obtained is flat. We are increasing the pressure, decreasing pressure. There is no change in activity because of glue. Okay, so negative uh, insertion of dysfunction. Graph is type C. Glue ear. Graph is type B. ठीक है ऑटो कॉस्टिक मिशन बेस्ट स्क्रीनिंग टेस्ट फॉर द बेबीज न्यूबॉर्न बेबीज बेस्ट स्क्रीनिंग टेस्ट वी ऑल नो ऑटो कॉस्टिक मिशन आर प्रोड्यूस फ्रॉम आउटर हेयर सेल्स ओ एच सी ओ फॉर ऑटो सो ऑटो कॉस्टिक मिशन इज फ्रॉम आउटर हेयर सेल these emissions are spontaneous also or evolved also we do some stimulus to outer ear cell then they will produce some uh, emissions that can be picked by this instrument 
OAE testing. So what examiner want to ask? He can give you that diagram with the baby and probe into the ear. So this is OAE, auto acoustic emission by the outer hair cells. This is very easy, very handy, can be done in OBD setup, but child should be sleeping. If child cry, the, form, uh, the finding would be incorrect. So if OAE is present in a baby, that means we will say pass. If OAE is absent in a baby, so we will not say fail, we will say refer. Go for, for their investigation because it's a screening test, not 100% correct. But it gives you an idea of cochlear. So for the cochlear function, which test you prefer? OAE. Any cochlear pathology like Meniere's disease, which is a cochlear pathology. In Meniere's disease, OAE will be absent because there is a pathology in the middle ear, uh, sorry, in the inner ear cochlea. Okay. So this is autocaustic emissions. Short, shortly, I'm telling you. <clears throat> if baby is not sleeping, what can we do? You can give general anesthesia to do away. What we'll do? Chlorphenylamine, chlorphenylamine I mean, drops. Just put two drops in the mouth of the baby. So patient, because of that anti allergy treatment, which is also having the sedative properties also, so baby will sleep. Okay, so that's how we can go for away. We'll just put two drops of chlorophenylamine I mean, if child is awake for doing constant movements. That's it. Now, another diagram of the baby. You can see multiple electrodes, one forehead, on the ear, on the skull. So this is what? This is better. Brain stem evolved response odometry. Brain stem evolved response odometry. Here what we are doing? Again, brain stem evolved response odometry. In what we are doing? Through the probe in the ear, we are giving some stimuli. And these stimuli, by means of auditory pathway, from the cochlea, cochlear nerve, cochlear nucleus, then superior, uh, superior olivary complex, lateral amniscus, medial genicular body, etc., etc. So the auditory pathway, these signals will be uh, carried away to the brain. So Dara is assessing that complete pathway. Dara is assessing the base and different different auditory pathway. So which is the test to check for the auditory pathway function? Dara is the best. Which is the best audiological investigation or for checking for the hearing loss or the new or whatever it is? Best is Dara. B for B. In the answer, best is Dara because Dara check for complete pathway starting from the middle ear, cochlea. Cochlear now, cochlear nucleus, then <coughs> superior olivary complex or whatever the auditory pathway comes. So picture will be like this, multiple electrodes over the skull. So this is BARA. BARA is a subjective or objective test? Objective test. We are not dependent on the subject, not dependent on the patient response. Directly, whatever the signals are being carried to the uh, impulses are generating in the brain stem that can be picked by means of these electrodes. So in there, what is important? There are seven types of waves. Seven waves, first, second, third, fourth, five, six, seven. Different, different waves are different level, which is the most important? Fifth. Fifth wave is arising from the lateral lamniscus. Okay, so there fifth wave is important, that is arising from the Lateral lamniscus, other wave, wave from, wave one from the cochlea, cochlear now, proximal part, cochlear now, distal part, then comes cochlear nucleus. After the cochlear nucleus comes, what is the auditory pathway? After the cochlear nucleus, superior olivary complex, SLIM. What was the mnemonic? So basically, BARA, the first uh, thing this, BARA, best audiological investigation for the neonates also. It's not a screening test. It is not a screening test. Screening test is OA. It is a particular uh, test which requires proper setup, silence, and all that. So it's not a screening test. Seven waves are there. Fifth wave is by the lateral lamniscus. Let's talk about auditory pathway. Oh, BARA can be done in neutral also. Examiners also ask. BARA, Neonates, newborn, if patient is in ICU, if baby is serious, high fever, if ear wax is there, whatever it is there. In that case, always you can do OAE. Okay, in that case, where is preferred. So whenever the neonate is having febrile seizures admitted in ICU or in U2, the only investigation we can do is bad. Okay, now this is the auditory pathway. Short look, shortly we'll uh, just revise it. This is my ear, 
sound is coming like this male isn't cast step is then hitting the cochlea from the cochlea cochlea now so first cochlea then comes cochlear now after the cochlear comes comes cochlear nucleus after cochlea cochlear now cochlear nerve is one then comes the cochlear nucleus from the nucleus there cochlear nucleus after that cochlea cochlear now cochlear nucleus after that you can remember it by slim s stand for superior olivary nucleus l stand for lateral lamniscus which is for the wave five i stand for inferior colliculus and m stand for medial geniculate body s l i m that's how i remember there are equal i and different different mornings also whatever you feel comfortable but slim okay remember by this now what is important other thing what they can ask decussation of fibers decussation of fibers is occurring at the level of superior olivary nucleus you can see the fiber from one side going to other side so decussation of fiber is occurring at superior olivary complex now there is a reflex stapedial reflex the relay center for is stapedial reflex the commands for the stapedial reflex suppose step is going so what will happen firstly the loud sound hit the ear the loud sound is picked up by the atrium so stapedial reflex how do you remember loud sound is picked by the atrium from the atrium sound travels through the uh, cochlear nucleus from the cochlear nucleus it go to superior olivary complex now this is again the relay center or main center command command center for superior reflex from there from here this area then the impulses are sent to seventh nerve so a front for the superior reflex is eighth nerve then goes to superior olivary complex from there the command is sent to seventh nerve not above seventh nerve and from the seventh nerve it will come on to stapedial and stapedial muscle will contract and there will be restricted mobility of the stapes so loud sound will be damped okay so reflex is eighth nerve superior complex and then comes to seventh nerve so this is efferent and this is afferent for the stapedial reflex understood one to the number superior olivary complex that is a command center okay now what is audiometry we all know or discuss a lot of time different different symbols we know r r r r red color round and for the right so right here is generally by the red color round circle left is by the blue color cross arrow like this just look at this This is the arrow. Now this is the picture showing the normal hearing, mild hearing loss, moderate hearing loss. Pure tone audiometry, which we are discussing now. It's an subjective or objective. It's an subjective test. Subjective means we are depending on the patient response. We give different different sound, or different frequency increasing in a particular order, and then patient will give the response whether he can hear or not. So it is dependent on the patient. So it's a subjective test. how to do we have discussed uh, we have told you uh, earlier also the <clears throat> there is a machine there is a closed chamber and the different uh, the electrodes are placed uh, in the patient ear by means of the headphones or the earphones or whatever and the different different sounds are given if patient hear he will raise his hand if patient don't hear he will say no he will just uh, move his uh, neck in uh, showing the no okay so the graph is placed over like this the graph is placed in a uh, graphical manner the findings are placed where this is showing the decibel hearing loss sound energy level and this is showing the the horizontal marks is showing the frequency hertz okay so this is showing the different different hertz 1 250 500 750 the human audible frequency human audible frequency the students 250 to 8000 hertz normally we can perceive this range below that we can perceive above 8000 Or below two fifty. This is normal. Actual perception range is this, but actually we perceive five hundred hertz. Two fifty hertz is also difficult to. Uh, <coughs> just a minute. 
this is the normal here is 250 hertz to 8000 hertz that's why we plot the graph in between this range these values are important right this forget about this line now this is showing the blue color the symbol used in the audiology uh, i told you if it's for the right then it has to be round red color and the arrow is like this towards the right side of the patient okay generally blue color is used for the left if no color then look at the arrow air conduction is uh, uh, shown by the crossing air conduction mass is by the box pore conduction is by the arrow so generally commonly the frame framing is there so generally examiner will frame by these arrow only normally right so this is for the right if this arrow is pointing towards left side of the patient this is for the left or we can use the symbol showing about the masking okay so right is the red color round and all this now let's study let's have a uh, decent idea about the audiology so this is a picture now look at the audiogram the normal hearing range till the level we say the patient can hear better so below that the normal hearing uh, up to 25 decibel so 0 to 25 decibel is considered the normal range if the graph is going below 25 then it is considered abnormal otherwise till the level of 25 decibel it is considered normal so 0 to 25 decibel range is normal cool now this look at the picture blue color showing the cross cross means air conduction of the left ear arrow towards left ear this now you see the air conduction line which is by the cross is within the normal range and the bone conduction line by the arrow again in the normal range so both air conduction and bone conduction are in normal range so it's a normal hearing aid a uh, normal hearing basically if a patient of conductive hearing loss comes suppose conductive hearing loss now in conductive hearing loss we know no, in a normal patient ac is greater than bc what is ac what is bc ac is air conduction bc is bone conduction okay so if sound is going like this there is a mechanism in the middle ear which is known as transformer mechanism what the transformer mechanism is doing he is amplifying the energy of sound whatever received suppose patient received 10 decibel sound because of the amplifier mechanism of this middle ear the sound energy get amplified to 22 is to 1 or 17 is to 1 total is 22 is to 1 there will be amplification of 22 times so 10 decibel will get 22 times uh, amplified the reason being transformer mechanism firstly the area of tympanic membrane and area of stapes foot plate tympanic membrane is bigger stapes foot plate surface area is 3.2 mm tympanic membrane actual surface area is 90 mm but effective vibratory surface area is 55 mm okay so 55 mm larger area sound is converging to a smaller area 3.2 mm so gain we uh, we have the additional advantage of 17 times because of this the sound is traveling from a larger surface area and concentrating on a smaller surface area so it will get amplified by a ratio of 17 is to 1 so <clears throat> this is aerial ratio surface area ratio another ratio is uh, liver ratio what is liver ratio handle of malleus is 1.3 times longer as compared to prolonged process of incus handle of malleus 1.3 times longer to incus long process so that will give another advantage another advantage another gain so in result the net gain net amplification is 18 is to 1 to 22 is to 1 it's a range 
because some book says effective surface area of tempani mano is 45 some say 55 so range is between gain is between 18 is to 1 to 22 is to 1 so this transformer mechanism of the middle ear helps in making the air conduction larger better than the bone conduction so air conduction in normal individual is better than the bone conduction why because uh, because in air conduction since sound is traveling since sound is traveling like this so crossing the middle ear it will gain an amplification of 22 times whereas in the bone conduction sound is directly hitting the cochlea <coughs> so there is no gain no amplification so normal individual ac is greater than bc ac is less than bc which condition very easy if there is a pathology here external ear or pathology middle ear anything which is restricting the transformer mechanism that will lead to <coughs> bone conduction more than air conduction because sound is dampen here okay now look at this audiogram as you can see there is no color differentiation only thing i can see is this is round and this is cross which is showing the air conduction graph we know air conduction symbol uses cross or round round is for the right ear cross is for the left ear now look at this 25 decibel is the normal range so this air conduction graph this is air conduction graph of right to left is going down going down that line if you look at the bone conduction this is for the right this arrow is for the left towards left so you see the bone conduction graph is within the normal range so bone conduction is normal bc normal here ac abnormal here and there is a difference between ac and bc if ac and bc difference is more than 20 decibel then pathology is known as conductive hearing loss so here bone conduction is normal that means bone conduction means cochlea and cochlear now after that so cochlea is normal bone conduction is normal but air conduction graph is lower that means there is a pathology in the middle ear or external ear so this patient where the bone conduction becomes down air bone uh, bone conduction is normal air conduction becomes down so this is conductive hearing loss conductive hearing loss on both the sides sensory neural hearing loss for conductive hearing loss the gap between ac curve and bc curve should be more than 20 decibel 15 to 20 decibel it should be more but if in a graph look at this this is red color so this is red color I use a black pen here. This is red color round and arrow showing the right ear. Cool. Round is showing the air conduction graph. Now you see till thousand hertz frequency it was within the normal range, and after that higher frequencies. If you see higher frequencies, air conduction graph is going down, so air conduction decreases. bone conduction graph is also sinking with it so same thing happening on higher frequency air conduction bone conduction both are decreasing is there any gap between ac and bc no gap if there is no gap that means it is not conductive hearing loss it is sensory neural hearing loss so for conductive hearing loss there should be gap since you can see air conduction bone conduction both are going down at higher frequencies and there is no gap so this patient is showing sensory neural hearing loss more precisely at higher frequency that means there is some pathology which is affecting the basal tone of cochlea basal tone of cochlea high frequency loss sensory neural is mainly in the presbycusis age related okay so this this is a snhl showing the presbycusis because it is affecting the high frequencies now one more thing noise induced hearing loss one is autostereosis one is noise induced hearing loss noise induced hearing loss the typical dip is at 4000 hertz typical dip is at 4000 so this is as you can see both air conduction and bone conduction graph it is in the normal range only there is a dip at 4000 hertz so this is typical of noise induced hearing loss dip at 4000 it is also known as acoustic noise or boilermaker noise 
So does patient have SNHL? Generalized? No. Only at 4000 and there is a dip. Otherwise patient can hear normally. Autosclerosis. In autosclerosis, one typical feature is Carhartt's nose. Very, very important, Carhartt's nose. What is happening in autosclerosis? Because the piece foot plate movement is restricted and the resonant frequency for foot plate is 2000 Hz. So whenever the 2000 Hz sound come, the stapes is fixed so that 2000 Hz sound conduction is delayed or hampered. So that's the reason in autosclerosis, there is a dip in bone conduction graph. I repeat, bone conduction only, not the air conduction. So in autosclerosis, there is a dip at 2000 Hz only in BC curve. Autosclerosis is having conductive hearing loss because it's a middle ear pathology. Look at the diagram. See blue color cross, that means left ear. If we see this is left ear, this is bone conduction curve, this is air conduction. Bone conduction curve, is it in normal range? 25 decibel? Yes. Air conduction curve, not in normal range, going down. There is a difference between air conduction and bone conduction. So definitely, this is showing what? Conductive hearing loss. And we can see in bone conduction curve, there is a dip in 2000 hertz, which is typical of autosclerosis, Carhartt's notch. So this is an audiogram of autosclerosis patient with a conductive hearing loss with Carhartt's notch. Now, another thing, congenital SNHL or cookie by trusted U-shape, congenital SNHL, yeah, cochlear autosclerosis. In this case, like suppose this is my cookie. So when we eat, we took a bite, bite like this. So cookie bite appearance. Okay, U-shaped appearance. So you can see the lower frequency and higher frequency. Both are in normal range. Middle frequencies are affected. Look at the this. The lower and higher frequencies are affected. Uh, normal middle frequencies are affected. This is a typical feature of congenital sensory neural or cochlear autosclerosis, U-shaped cup. Okay, that means the basal tenor, pical tenor, normal, rest of the part of the cochlea is affected. So it is generally affected in congenital sensory. Now, little idea about Meniere's disease. We know in Meniere's disease, overproduction of endolymph or decreased absorption of endolymph. So basically, endolymph accumulates bulge of membranous part. So look at this, utricle, secule. Normal signs in Meniere's disease, utricle enlarge, secule enlarge. This cochlear duct, look at the thickness, look at the thickness, it is also enlarged. So membranous labyrinth enlarged. Because of this, three symptoms, I told you, vertigo. Vertigo lasts for a few minutes or few hours. Episodic vertigo. There will be certain episode of vertigo, followed by hearing loss. Hearing loss in Meniere's disease is SNHL followed by tinnitus. What is happening? Because of increased pressure in endolymph. Suppose this is the diagram. This is scalar media. Increased pressure in endolymph, regional membrane in between get ruptured. So there will be mixing of perilymph and endolymph, leading to production of the symptoms. Now what is uh, particular about Meniere's disease? In Meniere's disease, there will be hearing loss, which is not present in BPPV. Fine. There will be over distended secule and utricle in Meniere's disease. And that's the reason in Meniere's disease, a phenomenon is positive, Tulio phenomenon. Tulio phenomenon is nothing but on loud sound, patient feel, uh, feels vertigo. So loud sound is hitting the oral window, which is somewhere here. Since secule is distended, so these loud sound will also smell the secule, resulting in vertigo. So that is Meniere's disease. What is the treatment of Meniere's disease? Restriction of salt, excess water intake. You can give the intertemporary gentamicin therapy. Uh, we can do use the minute device. We can go for the <coughs> decompression surgery of the labyrinth. Or if intractable vertigo, severe vertigo, hampering the quality of life, and there is no hearing left, then you can go for labyrinthectomy. Remove that complete labyrinth. Otherwise, what we can do? Uh, we can do the uh, decompression surgery. Remove the outer bony wall over the labyrinth. So that is Meniere's disease. Meniere's disease is generally unilateral. Male is equal to female. 
no such demarcation in these diseases. It's a cochlear pathology. Another thing, examiner frame uh, may fail to mark in crisis. That is also a minor disease. There is episode of fall down without loss of consciousness. Okay. Now, little diagram showing the ossicles. Malleus, I've already told you. Malleus in cousin stapes. One space, I told you about this landmark. Neck of malleus, here comes the pass flacida above his lateral malleolar ligament. So this space, this is space is for the origin of cholecystoma. This space is known as. I told you, we discussed. So this is Prusak space. So Prusak space is a space where uh, cholecystoma earliest appear. Okay? And uh, why? Because this is the area, which is a landmark. This is incus, this is short process, long process, then stapes, this is that. Stapes foot plate area is 3.2 mm square. Okay? Uh -huh. Macumin strangle. What is Macumin strangle? <coughs> Suppose this is external auditory canal. This is my spine of Henle. So we do a imaginary line like this. Above there is supranatal temporal line. And then a tangential line is drawn to meet both these. So this area, this area is Macumin strangle. Macumin strangle is a landmark for mastoid antrum. Mystery antrum can be located by drilling in the macular area. Spine of Henle is a segregation between the external auditory canal and uh, mystery cavity, right? So, this is about here. Last thing, at birth, what are the structures which are at full size? Don't get confused. All the ossicles are at full size. But, let's talk about a little bit of embryology. Where are the ossicles? All the ossicles are mesodermal in origin, that we all know. There is pharyngeal arch, pharyngeal cleft, and pharyngeal pouch. Okay? This is, suppose, pharyngeal arch. There are total five pharyngeal arches. Externally, there is cleft. Internally, there is pouch. Okay? Basic fund is, arch is forming the mesodermal structure that is muscles, bone, etc. Cleft is ectodermal in origin and pouch is endodermal in origin. Okay, now middle layer ossicles. Since ossicles are mesodermal, so they have to arise from the arch. So incus and malleus, these both are arising from the first arch. Stapy suprastructure, only suprastructure, is arising from the second arch. Foot plate is arising from the otic capsule. Okay? Malleus and gus from the first arch. Stapes, suprastructure from the second arch. Foot plate is from the otic capsule. If we talk about external auditory canal. External auditory canal is arising from the cleft. Cleft, because it acts to the room. But the cartilage of pinna Pinna is having cartilage. Cartilage is again arising from the arch. So, pinna cartilage. Pinna. Pinna cartilage is arising from the first and second arch. First and second arch, what they will do? They will form the sixth hillock of his. Sixth hillock of his. And from this sixth hillock of his, complete pinna is developed. So, out of which, if you segregate the pinna, the tragus and rest of the pinna. So, tragus 1, so it is arising from the first arch. Rest of the pinna is formed from the second arch. First and second arch, they form the six hillock of his from this pinna cartilage are formed. EAC is ectodermal by the first left. Middle ear, middle ear is endodermal. Totally, you say she tube, really up everything. So, middle ear cavity is by the first and second pouch. So, examine us, you say she tube is formed by endodermal in origin by the first and second pouch. First and second pouch fuse together to form a tubo tympanic recess and that recess will form the middle ear cavity including the mastoid, including the middle ear cavity, including the eustachian tube. But that doesn't mean ossicles are also formed from the pouch. Ossicles are formed from the middle ear arch that is mesodermal but the rest of the cavity is formed from the endodermal mucosa and everything is formed from the pouch. 
Now, uh, at birth, which are the structures which are full size? Ossicle of middle ear. All the ossicles are full size. Temporary membrane. Temporary membranes all the layer. Endoderm, ectoderm, middle ear. Uh, mesoderm. Dull from all the things. Middle ear cavity. Mastoid antrum. And bony and membranous labyrinth. Everything is at, at birth of full size. Now, don't get confused. Only the antrum of mastoid is of full size. Rest of the mastoid cavity is not of full size at birth. Mastoid tip cell will expand. Mastoid will grow. So only the antrum is of full size. Ossicles, middle ear cavity, uh, tympanic membrane, uh, labyrinth, everything is at full size. Okay? Mastoid tip, it keep on uh, you know, expanding till 2 years of age. Now let's talk about nose. Nose again. <clears throat> Firstly, important thing is external nose. If you talk about, we know uh, above is frontal bone, frontal sinus. We know both the sides these are frontal sinus. So frontal bone. Then comes the nasal bone, two nasal bone. Then comes the upper lateral cartilage, and below that comes the lower lateral cartilage. External anatomy. Above is the frontal bone. Okay, nasal bone, upper lateral cartilage, lower lateral cartilage. And there are remnant cartilage also, which are known as lesser lower cartilage. Okay, so this is upper lateral cartilage, this is lower lateral cartilage, which is also known as major lower cartilage, and there are minor lower cartilage also present. And in between there is a septum, which is also cartilaginous and bony part. So, external nose, bone involved are now external nose, midline nasal bone. Here comes frontal process of maxilla because you know this, this is maxillary bone. So, its frontal process, frontal process of maxilla is also present. So, on both the sides. So, now look at this. What are the paired bone in external nose? Two paired bone, two paired. One unpaired bones. Paired bone comes from where? Which are the paired bone? Nasal bone, frontal bone, or maxilla. Unpaired is frontal bone. Now cartilage. Let's talk about cartilage. Three paired cartilage. One unpaired cartilage. Three paired. Which one? Three paired. First one is upper lateral cartilage. Second is major lateral cartilage. And third one is this lesser lateral cartilage. So these three are paired, both the sides. Unpaired, which one is this? Septal cartilage, which is in midline like this. So cartilage are three paired, one unpaired. Bones are two paired, one unpaired. Now, another thing, what is... Nasal wall. So nasal wall is basically... Lateral side, there is anterior end of inferior turbinate. Inferior turbinate is a separate bone. So, anterior most part. It generally doesn't start here. Suppose this is my inferior turbinate, which is running inside the nose. So, anterior end. Midline, there is septum. And above, above there is, the starting point is, lower border of upper lateral cartilage. So, nasal wall is guarded by literally inferior tabulate, medially septum, above is lower border of upper lateral cartilage. That is a nasal wall. And why this is important? It is a narrow stadia of the nose in adults. Okay? So, narrow stadia in the nose is nasal wall. How to check the patency of nasal wall? The test known is total test. What to do? Just put your fingers here, keep this and push your cheek to opposite side. So, do like this. So what we are doing, we are generally pushing this so inferior turbinate, which is forming one of the boundary, is moving apart. So patient is feeling comfortable. So to test the patency of nasal wall, we use the Cottle's test. Clear? Now, another important thing is lateral wall of the nose. What are the things they ask examiner? Lateral wall of the nose is important. Nowadays, they are not into like septum, anatomy, what are the cartilage, name of the bones and all that. So, they are asking for different questions. Let's talk about anatomy of lateral wall. Lateral wall, as you know, 
This is the little bone on the left side. So inferiorly there is a full bone, full bone separate bone. So it is inferior turbinate. Inferior turbinate is a separate bone. Okay. Rest middle turbinate, superior turbinate. This is superior turbinate, and sometimes supreme turbinate. These all are part of ethmoid bone. Middle turbinate, superior turbinate, supreme turbinate. Ye, these are part of ethmoid bone. Inferior turbinate is a separate entry. Okay. Now, suppose this is the nasal cavity. If I talk about what is the nasal uh, airway pathway, what is the curve, how the air enters. So air follows a parabolic curve. This is how air enters. So if you think that inferior turbinate is the area from where air is passing, no. Air is generally crossing around the area of middle turbinate. Cool. In a parabolic curve. Now, middle turbinate. What are the opening in the inferior turbinate, middle turbinate, superior turbinate? Inferior turbinate. See, nasal wall is the anterior end of inferior turbinate. So nasal wall should be somewhere here, right? Now, inferior turbinate. This is the turbinate bony projection. Below that, the gap between the bone and the inferior turbinate is known as inferior meatus. Inferior meatus. It is having opening of NLD, nasal lacrimal duct. You all know NLD. It is guarded by wall, which is wall of Hessner. Important. Remember, wall of Hessner is guarding the nasal lacrimal duct. Nasal lacrimal duct is opening where 1.25 centimeter behind the anterior end of inferior turbinate. So suppose inferior turbinate is starting from here. So 1.25 centimeter, if we go posteriorly, there should be opening of nasal lacrimal duct. Okay, middle turbinate. Middle turbinate is having three surfaces, three type of attachments. Okay, middle turbinate is guarding the middle meatus. Which is the sinus which are opening in the middle turbinate? In the middle meatus? Which is the sinus which is opening in the middle turbinate? So look at the picture. Middle turbinate or we can say middle meatus. Anterior group of sinuses. Which are the sinuses uh, which are opening here? So, one sinus in middle turbinate opening here is maxillary sinus, which is present in the cheek. Cheek. So, maxillary sinus. Other sinus, frontal sinus is doing here. And anterior group of ethmoidal cells. So, middle turbinate basically draining the maxillary sinus, frontal sinus, and anterior group of ethmoidal cells. Okay, then comes superior turbinate and superior meatus. This area. So superior meatus is having opening of posterior ethmoidal. Posterior ethmoidal cells. Now you will ask me, the sphenoid sinus. This is meaning where it should be drained. Sphenoid sinus is draining into sphenoethmoidal recess. Which is this area? Sphenoethmoidal recess. Spinoethmoidal recesses, this area. So, spinoid sinus is draining, is draining into a spinoethmoidal recess. Understood? So, middle turbinate is having three sinus opening maxillary, frontal, anterior ethmoidal. Superior turbinate is having posterior ethmoidal cell opening. Uh, spinoid sinus <coughs> is draining into sphenoethmoidal recess. <laughs> now, talk about nasal mucosa. Nose has three different types of epithelium. Three different types of epithelium. What are these? Firstly, vestibule. Different mucosa are there in the nose. The first one is the nasal vestibule, which is the outer part. This vestibule is having squamous epithelium. 
other epithelium is from the olfactory nerves that is olfactory epithelium clear and third variety which is the main respiratory epithelium so rest of the nose except vestibule and olfactory epithelium is having is having pseudo stratified cuboidal or columnar epithelium so basically the rest of the respiratory mucosa is columnar or cuboidal pseudo stratified so respiratory epithelium is this stomatal epithelium is present in the vestibule and olfactory epithelium is different now frontal sinus does it uh, drain into uh, a particular opening no it drains by means of a recess which recess frontal recess now let's have a little idea about the bones bone in the nose if i talk about the later on above is nasal bone lateral side we know the frontal process of maxilla come from both the sides then there comes lacrimal bone lacrimal bone after that there come unsealed process which is guarding the middle meatus which is guarding the maxillary opening sinus opening so nasal bone frontal process of maxilla then come lacrimal bone so we remove this lacrimal bone to locate the lacrimal sac because lacrimal sac is just behind the lacrimal bone so lacrimal bone is between the maxilla frontal process and ancillary process ancillary process is basically l shaped bone okay it is l shaped superior uh, horizontal part upper part okay uh, the, which is uh, guarding the middle tablet to enter into the middle tablet first step is ancillectomy to clear any pathology of the middle tablet first step is ancillectomy remove this ancillary process and if you remove this ancillary process the first sinus open first sinus open is maxillary sinus maxillary sinus is having opening at the upper end how much how upper end see or uh, which suppose this is eyes this is nose this is lips maxillary sinus is somewhat like this inverted pyramid on both the sides fine so it has is ostium on the upper part of the maxilla and this ostium opens into the middle meatus and that's the reason most common sinusitis is maxillary sinusitis because all the collection whatever maxilla mucus and whatever is collecting it has to be pushed against the gravity because of the cilia beating action so imagine can you any patient of cystic fibrosis where the ciliary function is impaired in that patient what is happening cilia is not beating so all the collection was getting collected into the maxillary sinus and most common sinusitis in adult is maxillary sinusitis <coughs> <coughs> and the reason is anti gravity drainage anti gravity drainage ethmoidal cells are in between the eyes and the nasal bar frontal sinus also two in number and sphincter sinus is behind now so in middle meters first sinus open is maxillary sinus from above sphincter and anti ethmoidal from this side Sphincter sinus directly drain into the sphenoethmoidal recess. Okay, now different bone in the floor of the nose. Firstly, maxilla. Then comes palatine bone, and then comes soft palate, which is a muscular structure. So, firstly, the maxilla anterior part, two third embedded, right? then comes a palatine hard palate then comes a soft palate okay this is sphenoid sinus sphenoid having sinus on both the sides then comes a the pterygoid body and from the pterygoid body two plates are there medial pterygoid plate lateral pterygoid plate so medial pterygoid plate is where little wall of the nasopharynx or we can say cornea another thing 
this laser for instance entering here <clears throat> so what is the coena coena is a separation between nose and nasal pharynx okay so between the palatal bone and the trachoid bone or coena you can say simply the nose and inferior end of the uh, posterior end of the inferior turbinate you can see here posterior end of inferior turbinate so where the inferior turbinate and nasal pharynx starts that is coena <laughs> okay now let's see the ct scan view for the sinus the choice of investigation ct scan is which nc ct pns nc ct non contrast pns for the sinus we don't prefer with contrast we prefer nc ct pns now this is the cut section like this coronal section axial is this So I tell you this coronal is this, right? So this is coronal section, which is the better view for the sinuses. Now you see, this is septum. This is septum. Independent bone is inferior turbinate over both the sides. Inferior turbinate. Here opening is nasal lacrimal duct. Then comes middle turbinate. Over both the sides. Now you can see this middle turbinate is having blackish shadow in between this. That means air cell is present in the middle turbinate. If a middle turbinate having air cavity, air cell, then this is known as concavulosa. So what is concavulosa? Concavulosa is nothing but middle turbinate with an air cell. This is my maxillary sinus. Maxillary sinus opening is in the Middle meatus, which is guarded by a bone, which is guarded by a bone. So look at this. This is my unsealed process, something like this. Not in very clear. So maxillary sinus is opening into the <coughs> uh, middle meatus, right? And here picture is showing the uh, uh, this uh, concavulosa. Now ethmoidal cells. There are a lot of variation in the ethmoidal cells. Different, different ethmoidal cells. The largest ethmoidal cells. Yes. Okay. So, ethmoidal cells are different, different varieties. The largest ethmoidal cell is known as what? Con? Oh, sorry, bulla ethmoidalis. Bulla ethmoidalis. Bulla ethmoidalis is nothing but largest air cell, a largest ethmoidal cell. Another cell is agar nasi, which is a type of ethmoidal cell. Agar nasi, agar age. So anterior most ethmoidal cell is known as agar nasi, and this cell is guarding the facial recess. How come? I'll show you. Suppose this is my nose. This is frontal sinus. This is my sternal sinus, and this is the floor of the nasal cavity. Okay, and this is the nasal opening from where the uh, air is entering. This is my frontal sinus. Now, anterior most ethmoidal cell, anterior most ethmoidal ethmoidal cell is agar nasi. This is sagittal section. So agar nasi cell is best appreciated on. Sagittal section, largest ethmoidal cell, bulla ethmoidalis, which is a part of anterior group of ethmoidal cells, bulla ethmoidalis. Fine. <coughs> Now, another variation of ethmoidal cell is one cell if present, either we can say inferior, medial. Two orbit. So this cell, this cell, inferior medial to orbit, or we can say superior medial to maxillary sinus. So this cell is known as heller cell. Heller cell, which is inferior medial to orbit, 
और सुपीरियर मीडियल टू मैक्सिल साइनस लास्टली वन मोर सेल ओनोडी सेल ओनोडी सेल इज प्रेजेंट इन रिलेशन टू ऑप्टिक नर्व सो वी ऑल नो फ्रॉम द आईज द ऑप्टिक नर्व इज गोइंग बिहाइंड कन्वर्सिंग ऑन बोथ द साइड सो पोस्टीरियर ग्रुप ऑफ विथ मॉडल सेल्स हियर इन रिलेशन टू द ऑप्टिक नर्व द पुस्ट विथ मॉडल सेल प्रेजेंट इज नोन एज ऑनोडी सेल सो क्लियर this much there are four variation we will discuss again now look at this picture this central part cribriform plate roof where the septum is attached the cribriform plate is having two lamina medial lamina and lateral lamina thinnest weakest bone of the nose lateral lamina of nose look at this picture if i draw it like this it is like this so this is complete cribriform plate this is having the perforated ends cribriform plate is having perforated from where the affected nerves come out fine so this lateral lamina is the thinnest and the weakest part maximum chances of csf in india csf leakage most common site is lateral lamina of the nose and that is we can say cribriform plate part this is <coughs> lateral lamina okay uh, <coughs> from the ethmoidal roof now this is lateral lamina then comes a the frontal bone frontal bone and frontal sinus drainage in between the orbit and the lateral wall of the nose this layer on both the sides is known as lamina papracia is known as lamina papracia why papracia because it is paper like thin lamina one thin lamina which is paper like thin name itself suggests so lamina papracia is very thin paper like bone so take care while doing sinus surgery do not perforate this lamina papracia do not break this otherwise orbital content may come out now another diagram what is this picture carison's bone punch carison bone punch There is a hole. We press it. So you can take the bite of the bone. Now I told you from where the lacrimal bone is there. So this is nose. Okay. Now anteriorly we know nasal bone. Tooth. Then comes the lateral process of nasal uh, maxillary bone. Then comes the lacrimal bone, and after that comes the ancillary process. That's how the lateral wall of the nose bony arrangement is there. Okay. So what we do? We remove this lacrimal bone. So to remove this lacrimal bone, we use this instrument, Carison's bone punch. This punch is straight or maybe curved with different different angulations to be used at different spaces. So basically, this is a bone punch, Carison bone punch. And now one more question. now it is we do pituitary surgery pituitary micro or macro adenoma surgery by means of nasal root how you go to the pituitary how you go to the pituitary so best approach to do any pituitary surgery is transnasal transphenoidal endoscopic approach now what is that again same kind of okay so this is nose this is frontal sinus and uh, this is my spinal sinus okay now this spinal this spinal sinus is having a cell spinal sinus after that the posterior wall is having clivus spinal sinus is having behind the sphenoid sinus there is cella turcica cella turcica this is the cella turcica suppose this is sphenoid sinus this is the air cell open cavity and here is the cella turcica cella turcica rest the pituitary gland okay so what we can do is open the brain retract the cerebrum cerebellum whatever comes in the way Deal with the multiple sinuses of the brain. 
transverse sinus, sagittal sinus, whatever it is. Then reach to pituitary. Or rather better way, use your endoscope, enter into nasal cavity, remove this sphenoid anterior wall, remove the sphenoid anterior wall, then suppose this is sphenoid sinus, enter into sphenoid sinus, remove this posterior wall and the roof. This posterior wall and the roof, if you remove, the dura mater will come of the brain, of the pituitary gland. So, basically, suppose this is my sphenoid sinus. This is again the nose, same diagram. So, I entered into the sphenoid sinus, remove the anterior wall, this posterior wall, this posterior wall I will remove and some part of roof I remove. So that's way what I'm doing, I'm making an entry to the cellar tercy. I'm removing the pool where pituitary lies. Then dura will come, I'll cut down the dura and whatever the adenoma of pituitary that can be directly accessible. So you see in this surgery, the complication rate is very less. Endoscopic, no incision, nothing else. So best approach for pituitary surgery nowadays is transnasal, transphenoidal endoscopic approach. Now let's talk about sinus, development of sinuses. We know four groups of sinuses are there. Maxillary, both the sides, is model, both the sides, frontal, both the sides, and sphenoid, two in the middle. Development of sinuses. First sinus to get developed. First sinus to get developed is maxilla, maxillary sinus. NESF, the development of sinuses is in order of NESF. That's a mnemonic. M for maxilla, firstly maxillary, then comes ethmoidal, then comes sphenoidal, and lastly frontal. So NESF, maxilla, first sinus to develop, then comes ethmoidal, then comes sphenoidal, and lastly frontal. At birth, frontal one is present, but frontal sinus is not there. At birth, which are two sinuses which are present? Maxillary and ethmoidal. First sinus to develop is maxillary. At birth, which two sinuses are present? Maxillary and ethmoidal. At birth, frontal sinus is not there. Frontal bone is there, but sinus cavity has not developed. Last sinus to develop, frontal. Remember the mnemonic MESF. Okay. <laughs> Two sinus present at birth, maxillary is one. Most developed sinus at birth. It is not maxillary, it is ethmoid. Because ethmoidal sinus, small, small sinuses are there. Maxillary sinus in baby, small, then keep on growing, keep on gaining size uh, till adulthood, till six, seven, two, whatever the age. So, uh, uh, most developed sinus at birth is ethmoidal sinus. Sphenoid develops radiologically at four years of age. First time an X-ray can detect sphenoid sinus is at the age of four years. Frontal sinus firstly develop radiologically. I start to appear at six years of age. I'm talking radiologically. Frontal sinus, it start developing at the age of two years. Frontal sinus start developing at the age of two years. Radiologically, it appears at the age of six years and its growth goes till the adolescent. 16 reading is different, different. So, uh, start at two years, radiologically appear at six years and complete till adolescent age. So, new one baby has a frontal sinus? No. So, can babies have headache? Why there is no headache in the baby? Because frontal sinus is absent. Frontal part. Okay. Now let's talk about coena and coenal atresia. We know coena start at posterior end of inferior top in it. The junction between nose and nasopharynx. So in embryonic life, 
when the fusion between the nose and uh, nose and nasal pharynx separate so there should be a passage to be developed if that passage doesn't form that thing is known as coronal atresia that means corona is blocked so the communication between nose and nasal pharynx is lost that condition is known as coronal atresia that means this is the corona as you can see so this is posterior end of inferior dominant as we can make it out as you can see this opening the junction between nose and nasopharynx here the side is open but look at this side is this open no this is closed so coronal atresia is nothing but persistence of a membrane cartilage mucosa bone in between nose and nasopharynx so that is coronal atresia now what is the complication if it is unilateral one side is open one side is closed not to worry we'll do the surgery when child become of the age of 5 to 6 year safe age for any child for any surgery which can be delayed is 5 to 6 years 5 to 6 years of age if some surgery required early then still we prefer between 1 to 3 years we do not want any surgery to happen before one year of age because the child is very much fragile surgical trauma is much more than the results so better time for a child deformity like pinna deformity any other deformity which doesn't need the uh, immediate uh, treatment the best surgical time is 5 to 6 years of age if some some surgery is some sort of emergency that has to be done early so then age is 1 to 3 years of age 1 to 3 years of age what are the surgeries firstly coronal atresia cochlear implant okay 5 to 6 years of age like pinna deformity not the not absin microsha whatever it is you need to correct just let the pinna grow at certain age till the sixth year then do the surgery now coronal atresia as you can see if there is a blockage lack of communication between nose and nasopharynx so airway is blocked now unilateral generally remain asymptomatic because patient can breathe from opposite nostril <laughs> but if it's a bilateral bilateral blockage both the sides corona is blocked then this is respiratory emergency because we know child is an obligate means a breather he can't breathe from the mouth so if nose is blocked from the nasopharynx and since your baby is a obligate nasal breather there has to be an emergency situation and we need to treat it immediately so bilateral coronal atresia is an respiratory emergency unilateral asymptomatic coronal atresia can be membranous or bony or, or mixed type now what to do in that there is a technique one technique is known as mcgovern mcgovern technique what is mcgovern's technique since cornea is blocked but mouth is open what you can do just use a nipple baby feeding nipple cut it from the upper end and insert in the mouth mouth so that baby will not close his mouth tight down so that patient or baby can breathe through the oral cavity that is a immediate treatment then what can do after that what is the next treatment is tracheostomy we don't go for surgery for correction of coronal atresia and bilateral atresia immediately because certain changes will happen till the age of a one year so it is risky so do tracheostomy once child complete one year of age then go for coronal atresia corrective surgery so coronal atresia surgery is generally preferred at 1 to 3 years of age okay now macgovern's technique remember this name this is important nothing fancy in this nasal bone fracture most common fracture facial fracture is nasal bone fracture patient fall down because it's the outer projection it get fractured most of the time it is undisplaced to locate the nasal bone fracture <coughs> this is my nasal bone 
as you can see, this is a laser beam. So this is later view of uh, nose uh, showing the laser beam fracture. As you can see, this is the fracture. Fine. So this is one of the most common fracture of the face. Now, laser beam fracture. The question asks us about the treatment. When to treat, when not to treat. Within 24 hours, if patient comes to you within 24 hours with a laser beam fracture, do surgery immediately. Correct that. Surgery done. If patient after 24 hours, second day, third day, so what happens in any of the fracture after 24 hours, their edema develops. So there will be facial edema, nasal edema. So if you try to correct that laser beam fracture, there is a higher chances that you may end up in improper correction because of the edema. So the best thing for laser beam fracture, which is displaced, if this is undisplaced, nothing to do, conservative management. If this is displaced, so within 24 hour patient comes to you, immediately do the surgery. If patient come on second, third day, fourth day, then wait for seven days. Surgery on the seventh day, eighth day, whatever it is. After the edema, subside. So edema basically in body develops after 24 hours, persists or stay there for five to six days. So if second, third day patient come, then <coughs> uh, surgery after the edema, subside. Best x-ray for the nasal, uh, nasal bone fracture. This x-ray later view. Now, one more thing here. Look at this. This is the later view of later view X-ray. As we can see, now look at the sinuses. You can appreciate in this later X-ray. I can see the frontal sinus very easily, very beautifully. I'll just mark my arrow. So this is frontal sinus. I can see the maxillary sinus too. If I show you guys the boundary. So you can see easily, this is maxillary sinus, inverted pyramid. I can see the ethmoidal cells. Can you see? Multiple smaller cells. What are these? Smaller, uh, ethmoidal cells. Ethmoidal, this part is anterior and this is posterior ethmoidal cell. And then I can see the sphenoid cell. Sphenoid. And sphenoid, you can see what I was trying to explain you is the cella classica. Over there lies the pituitary gland. Okay. So tell me which x-ray which show all the sciences. Lateral view of face or nose. So which x-ray is showing all the sciences? is lateral view. But which x-ray is best for maxillary sinus? Water's view. I'll come to that. But just to explain you, this is the lateral view showing the all the sinuses. All the sinuses. Fine. Okay? You got it? Now, what are the forceps which are used to treat the uh, nasal bone fracture? Ash forcep and Walsham forcep. Here this is the plus. So they look like this, plus like, like this. Okay, so ash forcep and Walsham forcep is used to treat the nasal bone fracture. CSF rhinodia, most common side I told you. Most common side is clipiform plate, lateral lamina. It is formed by the ethmoidal bone. Clipiform plate is formed by the ethmoidal bone, you know? So, <laughs> medial lamina of clipiform plate, suppose this is a roof. So, lateral lamina is the most common site of CSF leakage, spontaneous CSF leakage. Majority of the CSF rhinorrhea cases, which are idiopathic, without any reason, the treatment of choice to treat the CSF rhinorrhea is conservative. <laughs> conservative management. What is CSF rhinorrhea? The clear watery like fluid will come out of the nose. What is the difference between CSF rhinorrhea and the mucus in the nose? CSF leakage can be still bad. You can you can do that because it is leakage from the bone, from the brain. Then CSF and nasal mucus, other difference. CSF and generally unilateral. 
discharge from single loops. Uh, whereas the result discharge will be from the bilaterally. Most common site. So this is frontal sinus. Here comes the ethmoidal bone. This is my mother bone having the cribrium plate, which is a perforation for the olfactory nerve, and this makes this area the weakest area. And that is the region CSF right over here. Uh, most common side is this. But it can happen from other side also. Why? I'll tell you. Because when the nose was developing, skull base was growing, so there are multiple suture lines. This is frontal bone, then comes ethmoidal bone. So there is a suture line here. Between anterior ethmoidal cell and posterior ethmoidal cell, there is a suture line. Between posterior ethmoidal line and uh, spinoidal, there is a suture line. Sometimes these suture lines have a gap from where CSF may leak. From there, meninges may protrude, protrude to form the meningocele, meningal, encephalus, or whatever it is. Okay? CSF rhinoria, whether it is traumatic, whether it is idiopathic, best or earliest treatment is bed rest, conservative management, do nothing, take rest properly. Because most of the cases of CSF leakage heal automatically. Okay, now one another sign to differentiate is target sign or hello sign. <coughs> this target sign or hello sign showing what? <coughs> this is presenting typical of traumatic CSF leakage. So whenever there is a trauma, any injury to the face, when there is a fracture or whatever it is, so in through that fracture or trauma, the blood will also come out with the CSF. So if we uh, put the drop over a handkerchief and wait for some time, you can see a halo. Halo in which central part is blood, outer part is CSF. So this is halo sign or target sign is typical of traumatic CSF leak. Okay? Traumatic CSF leak. Look at this picture. showing the CSF leakage sign. Now, other things in CSF, uh, Ranuria. Okay, whatever test. Okay. CSF Ranuria collect that uh, clear liquid into a vessel, sterile vessel, and send it for the beta-2 transferring. Beta-2 transferring is the best test for CSF leakage because it is only and only present in CSF. It is never present in the blood, never present in the mucus discharge or anything. So beta-2 transferring, collect the leakage in a cavity in a box and check it for the presence of beta-2 transferring. So best confirmatory test, best confirmatory test for uh, CSF leakage is beta-2 transferring. If you want to ask best site for the... Uh, Best radiological test for uh, CSF leak. Now, the question from the best radiological test for CSF leak. Best radiological uh, investigation for CSF leak. Or to find out uh, the leakage sites. Uh, best radiological investigation, that means CT scan or MRI. Best test is high resolution CT scan of paranasal sinuses. But to localize the site of active leak, that means if actively CSF is leaking at a particular time, so to localize from where it is still actively uh, leaking, so localize uh, site of active leak, we do CT cystinography. What is CT cystinography? Intrathecal dye is given, and uh, since the dye we injected into a CSF from where in the nose, from uh, anywhere, the CSF is leaking, the color demarcation will happen there. So we can we get to know that CSF is leaking from this part. Okay. So best radiological test to localize site of active leak. Whenever active leak is there and we need to localize, we do CT cystinography. If we need to know about the uh, CSF leakage sites, if we know about the fracture sites, what are the potential sites from where the CSF leak may happen, for that HRCT paranasal sinuses. 
best test, best treatment of the CSF uh, uh, leakage, whether it is by the trauma or spontaneous, is best is spontaneous, best is bed rest. Okay. We basically we have to do the conservative management. Nothing to do as the patient to have conservative management since it's a CSF will give the antibiotic support so that chances of meningitis can diminish. Okay, so you give the antibiotic supports. We can also give the lumbar puncture. By means of lumbar puncture, what we will do? CSF pressure, whatever is raised, we will withdraw the lumbar, do the lumbar puncture so that CSF will come out. So there will be pressure will be decreased because high pressure CSF leakage will be low. Okay. Then what else you can do? We can use the acetazolamide, diuretics. Okay. Whatever it is. So CSF, this is leak. Now what are fractures which are uh, uh, having the CSF leak commonly? Firstly, the nasal bone fracture we have seen. No. Leaf fold fracture type 2, type 3. I'll tell you again <laughs> which fractures where the CSF renewed is common. Uh, talk about the CSF ranura leakage. Uh, if suppose we waited given the conservative management, uh, even uh, the conservative management fails, still there is a leakage, then what to do then? Then we will go for surgery. What we will do in the surgery, whatever the leakage site, suppose there is a leakage in the bone or whatever it is, so find out that leakage site, then we'll block this leakage site by means of fat craft by means of fascia, by means of glue, making it adherent, by means of strong mucosa or whatever. So we, all the purpose we have to do is we need to block this gap. So we insert the fat suppose like this, that will take a dumbbell shape. So it will like dumbbell shape closer of the leakage site. So generally CSF rhinolia leakage is done endoscopically. Okay. Now foreign bodies news. Unilateral foul smelling discharge in a child. Unilateral foul smelling discharge in a child. Occasionally black stained. Occasionally black stained. What can be the pathology? Unilateral discharge. If this is allergic, if this is ethmoidal polyp or something else, it should be bilateral. And discharges blood stain also. So, if examiner frame the question like this, unilateral discharge, which is foul smelling, blood stain, first thing, and, and the uh, patient is child, then first think of foreign body in the nose. Because child has a habit to insert anything into the nose. Now, how do we know this? There is prop, eustachian catheter, or there is laser prop from there, from which we can remove this. Okay? Now, in this picture, very beautiful diagram, I was showing you, this is my coena. Who see end of inferior abdomen. This is my torus tuberus. Okay. So, as you can see, just out of the context, but I will talk later, this is my nasopharynx starts. Coena. This particular site is coena. From there the nose and nasopharynx start. So eustachian tube is a part of nasopharynx. Okay. Now you can see this is the opening of nasopharynx. Uh, sorry, eustachian tube, which is on the lateral wall of the nasopharynx. The posterior hood like structure over eustachian tube is torus tuberis. So this is torus tuberis. Fine. Now, foreign body generally removed by the prop. Uh, if suppose some stone or some foreign body remain here for the longer time, so what will happen? The inflammation and other things will accumulate around this that will result in the formation of rhinolith. And this rhinolith will present with the blood stain discharge continuously. So this is rhinolith. Okay. So foreign body in the nose, a stone, paper, that can be removed. We have to remove, but it's not a sudden emergency. A patient can wait for two hours, three hours. That is okay. One day. But if suppose this foreign body is a battery cell, if 
anywhere in the body battery goes inside in the nose and the larynx then it's an emergency you need to remove it immediately and the reason is batteries are alkali alkali causes more damage than the acidic base and there is a chances of bursting out in the nose because reaction will happen around this battery so cotton stone everything can be managed waited for one day to the nose but battery should be removed immediately most common site of lodgement of the any of the foreign body is inferior meatus this area inferior meatus right <clears throat> how to remove once the rhinolith is formed if rhinolith is formed then we take the patient in the ot because there will be chances of bleeding uh, we'll get the anesthetize the patient and then through the endoscope we remove the foreign body <laughs> What is the rhinitis? Some rhinitis medicamentosa. It is generally overuse of xylometazole in oxy xylometazole in drops. So what happens? Patient, whenever we prescribe the octavid or xylometazole in drop to a patient, so patient feel better because the mechanism of these drops is vasoconstriction. So if suppose in the nose. <clears throat> if suppose in the nose i put the drop so what are the mucosa what are the edema is there because we are giving the adrenergic uh, uh, favorable drugs so, so that will result in the vasoconstriction if vasoconstriction happens blood flow will decrease mucus production will decrease mucosa hypertrophy will be start getting revert back so for instant relief we use these drugs but sometime patient what do they overuse these drops so if the patient overuse these drops for 2 3 months 6 months or whatever it is what is happening is because of the continuous vasoconstriction <laughs> continuous vasoconstriction body will come in a mode to make it survival so what will do the constant vaso <laughs> vasoconstriction will lead to parasympathetic stimulation Will lead to parasympathetic stimulation. Vasoconstriction will lead to ischemia. Ischemia will lead to hypoxia in the mucosa. So that will result in a response in the uh, in the uh, mucosa with release of prostaglandins and inflammatory markers. That will ultimately causes the vasodilatation, increase vascular permeability, and increase blood flow. And increase mucus production. So what we are doing, rhinitis medicamentosa is a term where we use overuse the otrovin drug. So these drugs, uh, xylometazolin and oxymetazolin, usually they were doing the vasoconstriction. But continuous use will lead to ischemic changes in the mucosa that will trigger down the response mechanism, leading to release of certain uh, mediators, which will ultimately end up in causing more vasodilatation, more mucus production. So what is the treatment of the rhinitis medicamentosa? Steroidal spray. Immediate effect. Ask the patient to stop these oxygen, or xylometazolin, oxygen, xylometazolin drops. Immediate effect. Then prescribe the patient initially steroidal spray, local spray. If no relief, then we can go for the oral steroids also. Okay. So this is rhinitis medicamentosa. <laughs> basal cell carcinoma basal cell carcinoma generally the lesion look like this there will be burrowed margin it is also known as rodent ulcer rodent ulcer generally most common site is dorsal of the nose let picture me look like this picture me look like this there will be the elevation or some ulcer since basal cell carcinoma is an uh, locally invasive carcinoma there is no lymphatic metastasis it doesn't spread by lymphatic metastasis okay but since it's a rodent ulcer so generally suppose lesion is like this so it is having the burrowed margin so whenever we do the surgery we remove around 1 to 1.5 cm of the normal skin around the lesion for the reason because it's a rodent ulcer the uh, carcinoma limit what we can see from outside is cells are going actually inside so 
uh, remove wherever the tissue vessel the carcinoma happens remove that with the extra margin of 1 to 1.5 cm also known as a rotund ulcer generally happens because of the over exposure of the sun light common sight is uh, nose nasal dorsum uh, uh, face etc then rhinophima what is rhinophima look at the picture it is the hypertrophy of sebaceous gland over the nasal dorsum whenever there is the sebaceous gland get hypertrophic sebaceous gland hypertrophy so this condition will lead in this condition will lead in rhinophima you can see here potato tight potato nose potato nose because of hypertrophy of the sebaceous gland nose become a large looking like a potato so this is rhinophima hypertrophy of the sebaceous gland treatment what can be done uh, laser can be used to remove the extra uh, hypertrophic uh, sebaceous gland then atopic rhinitis what is atopic rhinitis atopic rhinitis generally condition it is an autoimmune disease more common in the females generally females are young age starting with 30 years of the age organisms are found uh, in the atopic rhinitis is klebsiella ogeni there can be other bacteria but the main bacteria is klebsiella ogeni which is a gram negative bacteria gram negative bacteria females are more common than males it is more common in females what is happening in atopic rhinitis it is an autoimmune disease some antibodies are formed against nasal mucosa leading to degenerative changes of the nasal mucosa the nerve supply in the mucosa get damaged the blood vessels in the nasal mucosa there will be thromboembolic events of uh, there will be the blood vessel will be clogged leading to less vascularity so the nasal cavity become roomy and because it's an causes klebsiella ogeni so what is happening is patient cavity in initial stage is full of discharge patient nose is full of discharge so patient is having foul smelling discharge but since atopic rhinitis the nerves of the patient are damaged so he can sense it he can smell it so this anosmia is known as merciful anosmia merciful anosmia where the patient is having foul smelling discharge in the nose but patient is unaware of it because the nerve endings are already damaged so uh, atopic rhinitis so ultimately what will happen everything will be shrink so the port turbinate was this so they will reduce to this side okay middle turbinate was this and reduce to a smaller size okay so roomy cavity big cavity will form what is the difference between atopic rhinitis and nowadays atopic rhinitis is also a part of rhinoscleroma so we know rhinoscleroma has three stages we will discuss we, you already know how to differentiate atopic rhinitis or rhinoscleroma one thing atopic rhinitis is inside the nose only rhinoscleroma the changes are also occurring over the uh, surface of the nose so there will be scleroma there will be granuloma present over the nose so that's how you can different whether this is atopic rhinitis or rhinoscleromatous external appearance of nose remain uh, normal now what is the treatment of atopic rhinitis firstly we do the irrigation irrigation with 25% glucose with glycerin 25% glucose with glycerin glycerin and since there is a multiple collection of the debris because cilia is not working the mucosa is damaged so whatever comes in the nose will get uh, collected there so there is foul smelling debris dirty discharge so uh, along with that what we will do will the alkaline nasal dish alkaline nasal dish so we use the percentages 2 is to 1 is to 1 what is 2 sodium bicarbonate one is sodium uh, bicarbonate and another one is uh, nsm namak nsm so sodium bicarbonate two ratio sodium bicarbonate one ratio and uh, salt uh, one ratio okay so do the alkaline nasal dose with this that is treatment of uh, atopic rhinitis other other treatment is chemisetin solution which is now it is popular which is it has been found that atopic rhinitis also occur because of deficiency of vitamin d because of deficiency of estrogen the sudden change uh, because of uh, estrogen over production sorry over activity of estrogen vitamin d deficiency so one of the thing is chemisetin solution it is a solution containing chloramphenicol uh, vitamin d estrogen production estradiol and all that with glycine one of the surgery 
uh, which, which which can be done in the atopic rhinitis patient is young's operation very very important what is young's operation it is nothing but close the opening of external nostril that's it young's operation how it helps in healing see why the discharge and crusting is happening in the nose because the dry air current the patient is breathing but but generally what do uh, whatever we breathe the nasal mucosa humidified it but since in anthropic nitrates because they can't work properly so dry air currents will lead to more and more crusting so what we have to do what we will do in anthropic nitrates look at this picture anthropic nitrates external nasal opening what we do will raise a flap from here mucoperichondrium from the floor or from anywhere and these flap will bring from both the sides and then suture so we we'll close the nail uh, suppose this is my uh, nostril opening both the sides this is my opening like this so what i'll do i'll raise a flap i'll raise a flap from here i'll raise from opposite end and then i'll close this so nasal nostril entry is completely closed that is young's operation what is modified young's operation modified young's in this modified young's we close the do the same surgery the only difference is will make a will uh, keep around 3 mm opening a small opening uh, we just keep rest of the uh, nostril is closed so that is known as modified young operation and this can be also used in patient of rhino scleroma okay so only difference young are modified small opening is being left my rhino scleroma i have already told it is caused by which bacteria klebsiella rhinoscleromatosis klebsiella rhinoscleromatosis naam itself suggests it is a gram negative bacteria it is generally rhinoscleroma patient are common in northern india northern part of india there are two diseases in the nose rhinoscleroma and rhinosporidiosis rhinoscleroma is common in northern part of india himalayan range okay and what are the uh, features when this klebsiella rhinoscleromatosis infection occurs the first stage comes is atopic stage atopic stage is similar to the atopic rhinitis what is happening is there will be damage to the uh, damage to the uh, nasal nerves nasal mucosa blood supply everything so nasal cavity will become roomy but with time what happens since rhinoscleromatosis klebsiella is a granulomatous pathogen so what will do once the atopic stage subsides uh, after that there will be formation of granuloma the bacteria klebsiella bacteria will be engulfed by the macrophages suppose this is bacteria they will be engulfed by the macrophages or dendritic cell and that will lead to a production of series because this bacteria can't be damaged by macrophages or whatever it is so there will be collection of these cells leading to granulomatous inflammation that will result in more and more uh, uh, activity of uh, uh, this uh, helper t helper cell will come into picture dendritic cell will come into picture eosinophil cells will release and inflammatory uh, cascade will form resulting in granulomatous uh, stage why granulomatous because bacteria can't be killed by macrophages so what they do they engulf they keep on engulfing keep on engulfing so big mass will form so the granulomatous stage is the second stage third stage is cicatrizing stage when the large granuloma are forming all around so there will be stenosis of the nerves the opening of the nose will be closed because of the extensive granuloma the shape will be deformed nose will form turn up into tapir nose hebra nose what is that you seen the uh, tapir or hebra sewer jo hum jaise bolte hain unse similar hota hai to nasal opening jo hota hai uh, nasal opening in humans is directed downwards in on that pics and everywhere you can see the nasal opening is upward you can see the opening of the nostril so what is happening here hebra nose or woody nose woody why woody because because of lots of the granulomatous changes are uh, occurring there so it gives a feel of wood now hebra nose what is happening because of the granuloma this tip is like going like this so the opening which was facing downwards now slowly coming in front so this is hebra nose another if you do the histopathology another important thing for the rhinoscleroma is two pathologies are seen two cells are seen russell body and the mikulic cell what is russell body just remember the name russell body mikulic cell mikulic cell is nothing but macrophages engulfed with the bacteria they try to eat the bacteria so they engulf them but they can't digest that so this is mikulic cell so look at the mikulic cell 
This is mucoid cell. You have seen, you have engulfed the bacteria inside but can't digest them. This is mucoid cell. Result body is eosinophilic granular. You can see the blue stain color and all that eosinophilic cells. So this is result body in mucoid cell, a tetronomic of rhino scleroma. If these are cells are there, if patient is uh, having all the stages of atrophic rhinitis, but these cells are present, result body in mucoid cell, always think of rhino scleroma. And look at the picture of the nose, how this deformity is hampering the nose. Stenosis, cicatrizing stage, like stenosis of the nose all around granulomatous pathologies are there. So basically it needs a corrective surgery also. This may turn up into subtle perforation. What is the treatment of choice of rhinoscleroma? Try to remember it is tetracycline and streptomycin. Don't write cephalosporin amoxicillin blindly. For rhinoscleroma, treatment of choice is tetracycline or streptomycin. That is first line drug, second line drug is rifampicin. Refem piscine. Why refem piscine? Because it's a granulomatous lesion. Like in tuberculosis, that is a granulomatous lesion. So for the granulomatous lesion, refem piscine is a good choice. Rhinosporidiosis. What is the difference? Rhinosporidiosis is present in the southern part of India. Examiner will specifically mention that a patient of Tamil Nadu. And taking bath in some aquatic pools. So rhinosporidiosis is a uh, disease which is born by the aquatic protozoa. Aquatic protozoa, the name is rhinosporidium separi. It is present in the ponds. In the southern part of India, they had a habit to uh, take a bath in the ponds and because of that, this rhinosporidiosis happens. How it presents? It arises from the septal mucosa. Suppose this is septal mucosa. So there is mass-like structure will arise. Strawberry-like mass. Why strawberry-like mass? A reddish mass will arise in rhinosporidiosis. A reddish mass will arise with whitish dot over it, which is showing the fungal spore or whatever. So strawberry-like mass. In rhinosporidiosis, there will be production of the strawberry-like mass with certain bleeding episode because it is little vascular. Rhinosporidiosis bleeding episode, rhinoscleroma, no bleeding episode, only uh, atropic stage and then granulomatous stage. Okay, so how to make a diagnosis? The important point to remember in the southern part, uh, history of uh, taking bath in some dirty ponds or whatever, there can be a mass-like exophytic growth coming out of the nose, which is having certain white dots, which is shown as strawberry-like mass, which is showing the strawberry-like mass, which is known as rhinosporidiosis. Now, what is the treatment of rhinosporidiosis? Medical treatment is capsule. Then surgical treatment is remove it surgically. Use the cautery, remove the mass, surgical removal of the mass from its base. Surgical removal of the mask completely from its base and the base will, will be cauterized. So, rhinoscleroma, remove the mask and cauterize the base. And medical therapy, you can give the dapsone. Appearance is strawberry like mask. Now, on grain line. What is on grain line? On grain line is used for the prognosis. Important, it is used for the prognosis. Prognosis of carcinoma, prognosis of any nasal lesion. What is the prognosis? On grain line is uh, how we decide on grain line from the medial canthus towards the angle of mandible on both the sides. Medial canthus towards the angle of mandible. Any pathology on grain line uh, importance is any pathology below this line has a better prognosis. Okay, and any pathology here has a worse prognosis. Above this line has having a worse prognosis. So you can see nasal fracture, better prognosis. Maxillary fracture, better prognosis. Zygoma, dangerous. Orbital wall, dangerous. Forehead, dangerous. Now inverted papilloma. One more important topic. Typical presentation of inverted papilloma, the patient will be in adulthood. Firstly, there are two bimodal presentation. It is having bimodal presentation of age. For one is 20 to 30 years of age, other one is 50 to 60 years of the age. Inverted papilloma is an is an benign tumor. It is not. It is in benign tumor. Inverted papilloma is a benign tumor which has having a tendency of locally invasive. It also has 10 percent chance to turn into malignancy. So, inverted papilloma, it is a benign tumor, locally invasive tumor, 10% chance of converting into the malignancy, particularly squamous cell carcinoma. 
squamous cell carcinoma it is highly recurrent tumor highly recurrent tumor highly recurrent tumor patient will definitely inverted papilloma patient will have history of multiple time of surgeries most common site of in, uh, origin of inverted papilloma is lateral wall of the nose lateral wall of the nose suppose this is the picture the inverted papilloma should be arising from the lateral wall of the nose and it is highly recurrent okay inverted papilloma why this is called inverted because suppose this we took the histopathology this is upper epithelium and below there is subcutaneous tissue here the epithelium grow inwards epithelium will in, enter into the uh, dermis epidermis will enter into the dermis so inverted grow so that's why it is known as inverted papilloma clinical presentation if you do the endoscopy the patient will have some grapes like projections Great finger like multiple projection. What is the difference between the nasal polyp that is the allergic ethmoidal polyp and the inverted papilloma? Inverted papilloma is little bit more solid than uh, ethmoidal polyp. First thing. Second thing, inverted papilloma will have history of bleeding. If you remove the papilloma, there will be bleeding. Nasal polyp is only the mucosa, ethmoidal polyp. Thirdly, they are enhanced. If you do the with contrast CT scan, the inverted papilloma will enhance more. Okay, so look at the picture. This is a picture of inverted papilloma, which is involving the, uh, uh, the one side of the face, including the frontal sinus, ethmoidal sinus, and entering into the maxillary sinus also. Now, since inverted papilloma has a tendency to turn into the malignancy, so treatment of choice for inverted papilloma is not FES. It is not FES. FES is basically functional endoscopic sinus surgery. So we need to maintain the function of the sinus. But in inverted papilloma, there is a chance of uh, there is a chance of uh, uh, squamous cell carcinoma. So you can uh, limit the surgery just to maintain the uh, sinus uh, function. So what we'll do? We'll completely remove the disease surgically, surgical deployment. You can go endoscopically definitely. But along with that, the base of the lesion from where the lesion is uh, arising, suppose middle terminal, suppose later uh, lamina papacea or whatever it is. So remove or drill out the origin site of the inverted papillum. So, we will do the surgical excision that can be endoscopic. It can be endoscopic surgery, but it can't be functional endoscopic. There is a difference. So, <clears throat> inverted papilloma, remove complete disease and normal part is also removed. The site of origin, remove that part also. So, that is inverted papilloma. If this is bigger enter into multiple sinus, you can go for Weberson ferguson approach, lateral rhinotomy approach or whatever approach suits you. Okay, inverted papilloma. Look at the picture. Histopathology. Histopathology. If you see, so it is inward growth. So that is typical of inverted papilloma. Medial maxillectomy. You can do. Medial maxillectomy is what endoscopically we enter into the nose. Endoscopically, suppose this is nose. So we all know a maxilla is this here. So we remove the medial wall of the maxilla. This wall. This wall through endoscope. So medial maxillectomy, remove the medial wall and then enter into the maxillary sinus, remove the disease, make more approach. So that's how inverted papilloma can be treated. Post nasal surgery, most common complication, any other surgery, septoplasty, FES, or whatever the surgery, most common complication is sinuke. After hematoma or bleeding, bleeding is an instant complication. Post nasal surgery after five, seven days, three, four days, the most common surgery is sinuke formation. So how to do that? <laughs> if sinuke is formed, remove the sinuke. Sinuke is basically mucosal tag joining both the side mucosa. So remove that. After that, we will apply the mitomycin C. Why mitomycin C? Mitomycin C is a basically tissue toxin. It is a toxic to the tissue. New tissue water is forming. It is toxic to that. So remove the sinuke and apply the mitomycin C uh, clinically. Now, ports puppy tumor. What is ports puppy tumor? It is osteomyelitis of frontal sinus, frontal bone. So what happened, uh, pots puppy tumor, why, why this is called pots puppy tumor, whenever there is an inflammation in the frontal sinus, suppose there is a frontal sinusitis, the frontal sinus is inflamed, there is a sinusitis, because of this frontal sinusitis, the bony layer of frontal sinus, osteomyelitis happen, and because of this osteomyelitis, the infection goes in between the bone and the periosteum, so collection of pus, there is a collection of pus or cellulitic changes in between, in between what? In between uh, uh, bone and periosteum. So look at the picture. This is the periosteum, outer periosteum is there and bone is there. Because of the sinusitis, osteomyelitis happen. Because of the osteomyelitis, infection comes forwards 
towards periosteum. So there is a collection of pus between periosteum and the bone. That is frontal sinus uh, abscess. Uh, you can see the periosteal frontal sinus abscess, and this is also known as quartz puffy tumor. Treatment again surgical drainage. Whenever there is abscess, give an incision and drain. So look at the accident. How beautifully this is shown. This is uh, the uh, pot of tumor and clinical presentation is like that. So there will be a reddish discoloration over this. Best view of the sinus X-ray. Best view of the sinus X-ray is water's view. Water's view is occipital mental view. Occipital mental view. Occipital mental view. It is best for maxillary sinus. Maxillary and ethmoidal sinus. Now for the maxillary and ethmoidal sinus, best view is water's view. For the frontal sinus. For the front, you can see in this picture, this is the maxillary sinus completely seen. X ray, later view of nasopharynx, uh, nose, I have shown you that is that was showing the maxillary sinus, but not clearly. Okay, so maxillary sinus clearly seen in uh, occipital uh, mental view, that is the water's view. Along with that, you can see the spinoid sinus, uh, sorry, ethmoidal sinus also. And one more view, P view. P view is nothing but water's view with open mouth. Do water's view with open mouth. So that is no Peary's view. So Peary's view, what is the advantage? You can also see the spinoid sinus. So Peary's view is nothing but extended version of the uh, uh, this uh, water's view with the open mouth to see the spinoid sinus. Caldwell view. Caldwell view is particularly for the frontal sinus. Look at this. This is Caldwell view. It is also known as the occipital frontal view. Occipital frontal view. That is Caldwell view. It is best for the frontal sinus. Best for the frontal sinus, look at the frontal sinus, how beautifully they are seen with a septum in between, you can easily appreciate frontal sinus, frontal recess. Now in this, can you see the maxillary sinus, but not clear demarcation. So best view for the frontal sinus is frontal view. Best view for the maxillary ethmoidal sinus is caldwell view. Uh, sorry, uh, what is view? Now ethmoidal cells, I've already told you shortly, this is the section of the ethmoidal cells. There are multiple variations. Now look at this, this is about frontal sinus, frontal recess. As you can see, I told you the largest bulla cell, largest cells of ethmoidal sinus. This is the largest ethmoidal cell, which is known as bulla ethmoidalis. Now look at anterior most cell of ethmoidal sinus, agar nasi cell, anterior cell. This is the anterior most cell of ethmoidal cell, which is known as agar nasi cell. This cell, don't get confused, this is frontal cell. Frontal sinus sometimes may uh, get another cell, which is near frontal cell. So, anterior most ethmoidal cell is agar nasi. <laughs> Largest ethmoidal cell is uh, ethmoidal bulla. As you can see, inferior tapenade is a separate one. This is middle tapenade. Now, uh, uh, this is frontal sinus. Now, this is my spinoid sinus. As you can see, this is my spinoid sinus. This is also part of a spinoid sinus. There is a septum in between. And this is cella tarsica where the uh, pituitary gland lies. These are the posterior ethmoidal cells. The cell which is in close proximity to optic nerve, onod cell. So this is onod cell. Posterior most ethmoidal cell which is in close proximity to spinoid sinus and the optic nerve is onod cell. <laughs> we need to write it down everything. We are just uh, we have to be a little fast. Uh, another X-ray which is showing certain cell. This is maxillary sinus. We all know. This is inferior turbinate. Again, there is conca bullosa. The middle turbine is, high, is aerated with the air cell. So they have both the sides conca bullosa. This is conca bullosa. Now one more cell. Inferior medial to orbit or superior medial to uh, this uh, uh, orbit. So this is Heller cell. Heller cell. Okay. And this is maxilla anterior most of me. Now this, these are the posterior model cell. This is lamina papracia. This is frontal recess. Okay, this is cribriform plate. This is lateral lamina of the cribriform plate. It is around 2 mm thick. This is orbit. Best view uh, for the paralysis sinuses is uh, NCCT and uh, NCCT PNS. Now, Coleman syndrome. What is Coleman syndrome? Multiple times it has been asked Coleman syndrome. Anosmia plus hypogonadism. That is a cause of infertility. So, patient will have uh, less of smell and for infertility will be there. And uh, Coleman syndrome. It is present in the patient of cystic fibrosis where the ciliary uh, chloride transport function or ciliary function is defective. Because of that, the anosmia and hypogonadism happens. Ciliary dysfunction. Now, uh, certain question has been asked about the smell agents. 
अलग अलग डिफरेंट डिफरेंट थिंग्स दे हैव पुट अ लाइक व्हिच इज नॉट अ नेजल व्हिच कैन बी स्मेल्ड सो अमोनिया ट्राई टू रिमेंबर अमोनिया इज अ सब्सटेंस व्हिच इज व्हिच कैन बी स्मेल्ड अमोनिया कांट बी स्मेल्ड इट्स अ इरिटेंट ओके सो अमोनिया इज द आंसर फॉर दैट बिकॉज़ इट्स एन इरिस इरिटेंट सो इफ देयर इज अ रेमिश ऑफ इफेक्ट नाउ स्टिल पेशेंट कैन सेंस अबाउट अमोनिया बिकॉज़ इट इज एन इरिटेंट because it's an irritant so it is irritant is perceived by the fifth cranial nerve that is a trigeminal nerve so ammonia is sensation are carried by the trigeminal nerve that is a fifth cranial nerve now there are there are different different smell tests which has been asked like upset university the pen cell we have smell identification secrin test what is secrin secrin test is particularly used to check for the nasociliary clearance secrin is not for the taste Secrine is for the nasal ciliary clearance. What we can do? We we'll put the secrine into the nose because of the uh, ciliary beating. The mucus blanket shift at a particular speed. So whenever the secrine from the nose enters into the nasal pharynx and the oral pharynx, patient can have test. Test patient will feel the taste of secrine. So time we enter the secrine and the time patient start feeling the secrine. That will tell about the nasal ciliary clearance. So secrine test is useful in the cystic fibrosis. cystic fibrosis this has been asked a uh, patient a baby has a history of fall down from the bed and then the uh, patient was unable to breathe patient uh, was back getting restless or uh, the endoscopic or torch like picture showing this what is this so this typically you can see there is a bulge on both the sides both the sides symmetrical bulge which is showing of septal hematoma if it has to be a mass it should be unilateral if it has to be polyp it should not be red color okay and there is a particular issue of trauma okay so in trauma the septum we all know septum there is a thin layer of the septum all around the muco pericondrium is there so blood may get collected here blocking the nose on both the sides what is the treatment of choice treatment is just put the incision allow the blood to drain out what happens if you don't do that it's a respiratory patient can be second thing there will be pressure necrosis of the cartilage leading to septal abscess there will be fever present If hematoma turns up into the fever, there may be septal abscess. In that IND, you have to do, but along with that, you have to give higher antibiotics. So septal abscess may happen. Now this area is dangerous area, septal area. We all know, like eyes, nose, lips. So what is the dangerous area of the face? We all know. This particular area is the dangerous area of the face. Any infection can directly. Lead to cavernous sinus thrombosis. Why? Because the veins which are supplying here are valveless. Veins are not having any valve, so infection may ascend through facial vein, angular vein, enter into the ophthalmic vein, superior inferior, and through that enter into the cavernous sinus. So both the side cavernous sinus thrombosis may uh, happen. So septal abscess or any area in this area is an emergency. Treat it immediately. Cause of septal abscess. Pressure necrosis the cartilage. It has to be drained, and after that put the bandage so that again doesn't collect. Now septal perforation. Look at this diagram. The nasal septum, which is the main part, sometimes maybe because of some pathologies, maybe because of sur some surgery history, improper surgery, flap incorrection, whatever happen, this perforation may happen from where the both the nostril have an opening in between. Now what? Why this is bothering? The first bothering is air. Passes through this, so there will be dry air current will produce lot of crusting. If crusting is produced, there will be bleeding episodes because at that area uh, surrounding area the mucosa will be damaged again again leading to bleeding. There will be crusting, foul smelling discharge will be there, and sometimes small perforation will have whistling sound. Now what to do? Uh, Septal perforation. What are the causes? Firstly, what are the causes of the septal perforation? We all know septum is having cartilage in the center, bony part. Cartilage is part is quadrangular cartilage, bony part is ethmoidal, bulbar, prosomoscular, whatever it is. So anterior part is cartilage. This is nose. So anterior part is quadrangular cartilage, and then comes bulbar, bony, ethmoidal, bony, whatever it is. Perpendicular plate of ethmoidal, then comes bulbar. So <laughs> syphilis. There is only two pathology which are causing uh, damage to the bony part, bony septal perforation. Most of the diseases are causing causing perforation in the cartilaginous part. But there are two pathology which are causing perforation in the bony septum. So first is syphilis. Syphilis, tertiary syphilis. In ENT, 
Tertiary syphilis will produce a pathology in the nose. Secondary and primary syphilis will not produce pathology in the nose. So tertiary syphilis will cause perforation in the baby septum. Then uh, another term is vaginal granulomatosis. It is an autoimmune generated disease. Vaginal granulomatosis with a history of hematuria, blood in the urine because it causes glomerular nephritis. There will be inflammation in the lungs, leading to repeated episode of pneumonia or like that, blood stain, cough or whatever it is. And the nasal pathology, vaginal granulomatosis, there will be blood stain discharge. Perforation in vaginal granulomatosis can involve bony cartilages, both the parts. Syphilis will do only in bony part. Venous granulomatosis, granulomatosis, bony and cartilaginous, both the parts. Along with that, other patient will have blood in sputum, hemoptysis, rhinosinusitis, and blood in urine, hematuria. So that will define that patient is of vaginous granulomatosis. Other diseases like TB, leprosy, whatever the disease, they all will produce perforation in the cartilaginous part. Syphilis, vaginous granulomatosis may produce perforation in the bony part. Now, another term is natural clear cell granuloma. It is a highly aggressive disease. Out of all the diseases, highly aggressive disease, uh, T helper cell, T4 uh, helper cell, over aggressive, overly producing. So, NK granuloma may also produce bony and septal, bony and cartilaginous septum perforation. <coughs> natural clear cell granuloma. It is very aggressive, spread very fast, may produce saddle nose deformity along with perforation. Saddle nose deformity is a feature of natural clear cell granuloma. It is not a feature of uh, other disease. Syphilis later stage may produce saddle nose. Okay. Now this is a picture showing the septal button. If there is a perforation septum, we can use these buttons to uh, block that septal perforation. So these are a picture are showing the septal button. Now another thing, septal stride. Remember this septal stride is a stride of patient which is allergic, non-sensitive. I mean allergic to aspirin, can't tolerate aspirin. Patient will have three things. Patient will have nasal polyps. Patient will have bronchial asthma. Ig mediated and patient will be allergic to the enzymes, aspirin. So these thing, things will contribute to the sample stride. Now, allergic fungal rhino sinusitis. Little idea about this. What is allergic fungal rhino sinusitis? It's allergic, that means type 1 hypersensitivity. Generally, allergic fungal rhino sinusitis they are happening in the immunocompetent patient. Patient is not immunocompromised. It is allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. How it present? There will be allergic mucin in the nasal cavity. Very thick. It's not simple nasal uh, mucus, which is very thin. It will be very thick. Then there will be nasal polyp with a fungal debris. There will be nasal polyp with a fungal debris. If you do the CT scan, you can see hyperchromatic image. Salt and pepper like image. You can see the whitish and the blackish structure intermixed between them. Why this is happening? Because there is fungal growth, then there is polyp, then there is thick mucus. So because of that, there is hyperchromatic, different density uh, picture is shown. So this is showing of fungal uh, uh, allergy fungal rhinosinusitis. How to differentiate from invasive? The bony landmark will be intact in allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. Okay, allergy motion anything, there will be polyps. We remove the polyp, there will be fungal debris. Clinical picture will be somewhere like this. You can see the fungal debris, fungal balls are there. Black color is built because of the aspergillus fumigatus nigeria. Candidiasis if it happen, happen, yeast, the whitish color debris will be there. Okay, then there is a criteria, Bent and Kuhn's diagnostic criteria for the allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. So, what is the mnem uh, mnemonic? Allergic fungal sinusitis, major criteria, minor criteria. Just remember, the question has been asked, minor criteria, fungal culture, if it is positive, it is not a major criteria, it is a minor criteria. Okay? Rest, major criteria, thick mucus should be there. Eosinophilic discharge should be there. KOS mount, if you do, fungal smear, uh, KOS mount will show fungus. So, C, difference. KOS mount is a, a major criteria. Fungal culture is a minor criteria. So, try to remember that. Then, do the CT scan, you will see the changes. Uh, you can see the nasal polyp and it is a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. <laughs> then mucormycosis. What is difference between allergy fungal rhinosinus and mucormycosis? Mucormycosis nowadays uh, after corona very prevalent, happened drastically. What this is doing? Mucormycosis is basically doing the thromboembolic event. This mucormycosis which is a fungus 
invasive fungus will invade into the blood vessels, block them. So restrict the blood supply. If blood supply is restricted, restricted that part of the tissue becomes necrotic. So blackish eschar, as you can see, black color. So this is black, blackish eschar. This black color picture is typical of mucor mycosis. Why black color? Because of the necrotic dead tissue. Why this is happening? Because of the thromboembolic events. It spread very fast, very fast in growth. And within two, three days, patient can be can lose his vision. It spreads from the nose immediately to the orbit, involve the orbital muscle or whatever it is. So it will, because our eye having the end arteries, and suppose mucor mycosis enter and block that, so eye is gone. So treatment of choice mucor mycosis, liposomal amphotericin B preparation, best drug is liposomal amphotericin B for the invasive fungal li fungus like amphotericin B, and surgical deprivement. And surgical deprivement, deprivement, not the face. Face is not done. Surgical deprivement. Why surgical deprivement? Remove all this dead tissue so that there will be penetration of blood in the healthy tissue. So remove that blood, the, that dead tissue, that blackish necrotic tissue to enhance the more uh, vascularity for the growth. And the treatment of choice is liposomal amphotericin B. Investigation of choice mucormycosis since it's spreading through soft tissue. So MRI with contrast because with contrast will tell you this area is necrotic dead or this area is not dead, it's still having the blood supply. So uh, black turbulent sign will be uh, seen on MRI with contrast. Investigation is MRI of contrast is the choice of investigation. Okay. And uh, mucormycosis or uh, rise of pulse or mucormycosis, they are affecting the immunocompromised patient. Mostly patients like diabetic, patients like onco cancer uh, patients, so all these. So it is affecting the elderly and the uh, immunocompromised. And the differentiation is blackish as char. Now, blood supply of the nose, little idea. Blood supply of the nose, uh, nose having blood supply from the uh, internal carotid artery and external carotid artery. Major supplies from the external carotid artery, minor supplies from the internal carotid artery. Internal carotid artery, there are two branches I see internal carotid, anterior ethmoidal, posterior ethmoidal. Major carotid, external carotid artery, ECA, ECA having three branches in the nose. Firstly, superior labial artery. Secondly, is greater palatine artery. Thirdly, is phenopalatine artery. So these three are from the external carotid artery, two from the anterior, uh, uh, internal carotid artery. Now, what is schizal death plexus? Anterior inferior part of the septum. Anterior most inferior part of the septum is schizal death plexus. It is having contribution from superior labial, which is a branch of facial lung, greater palatine, sphenopalatine, and anterior ethmoidal. It doesn't have no posterior ethmoidal artery supply. So, Kiesel back plexus doesn't have posterior ethmoidal artery supply. Rest of the arteries will contribute to the bleeding here. So, this is the most common cause of bleeding in the young or children. Most common cause of bleeding in elderly patient, elderly patient, is Woodruff's area. What, what is the Woodruff's area? Woodruff's area is the posterior end of inferior dominant. This in elderly hypertensive patient, what is happening? This area is the most common uh, site of bleeding. Push up end of the inferior dominant, push up end of the, uh, or you can say near the coina. Why? Because this is the sphenopalatine artery is coming out from this area. There is a foramen, sphenopalatine foramen here. Okay, and sphenopalatine artery is coming out here. So here, the uh, there is a communication between the veins. There is a uh, network. Uh, this network is forming, which is known as Woodruff plexus. In elderly or in hypertensive patient, this is the most common site of Injury, uh, bleeding. Most common cause in elderly is hypertension for the bleeding. Most common cause in uh, children for the bleeding is finger trauma. They keep on inserting the finger and uh, you know uh, doing it uh, involuntarily, in without thinking much. Okay. Uh, epistaxis, epistaxis, bleeding from the nose. You all know. I told the anterior model lateral area. This is lateral area. Okay. <laughs> Posterior model doesn't contribute into this uh, little area. Uh, how to uh, treat for the na uh, nasal bleeding? Epistaxis. Suppose a patient of the epistaxis comes. If the young patient, the site of most common site is uh, little area, elderly patient would have area, and there is another retrocolumnar vein also, which is present in the posterior part. Retrocolumnar vein running like this. 
from the posterior base and uh, turn, turn, turning on the septum. So this is also one of the bleeding site in uh, uh, older age group. So uh, suppose a patient with epistaxis comes to you in the OPD. What you can do? First treatment, ask the patient to pinch the nose. Ask the patient to pinch the nose. Ask for five minutes, ten minutes. Pinch the nose. Still bleeding. Uh, if you can see, do the nasal uh, endoscopy. Nasal endoscopy. Firstly, pinch the nose and check for BP, pulse, hypertension, any history. So, ask the patient to pinch the nose and uh, take the history. If BP is increased, then uh, start giving the BP medicines. Then, even after pinching, bleeding doesn't stop. Even after 10 to 15 minutes, what do you do? Now, I'll do the uh, endoscopy and check if there is a particular site of leakage. Suppose if there is a leakage from a particular single artery. If there is a leakage from single artery, what I can do? I can do is AGNO3. We can apply the silver nitrate cautery. If there is a bleeding from multiple artery, what I can do? I can use the electro cautery. So, one artery, two artery, use the AGNO3 electro cautery and stop the bleeding. If there is a multiple bleeding site, so even after AGNO3 cautery bleeding is not stopping, then we'll go for anterior nasal packing. I'm not writing it down everything because we have to firstly cover it. Anterior nasal packing. If that doesn't have anterior nasal packing, bleeding is on the posterior part, then go for posterior nasal packing. Posterior nasal packing. If this also doesn't work, then you will think of ligation of the arteries. Which artery first? Firstly, we'll start with the ligation of spinopalatine artery. Spinopalatine artery. The procedure is known as TESPAL. Transnasal, uh, transnasal endoscopic spinopalatine artery ligation. Bleeding stop well and good. Doesn't stop, then I will ligate maxillary artery. If still bleeding not in control, then I will ligate external carotid artery. If bleeding in most still permit, then I will ligate anterior ethmoidal artery. Anterior ethmoidal artery. We will never ligate posterior ethmoidal artery. Because posterior ethmoidal artery is directly giving the supply to optic nerve. So you can't ligate that. Okay? So, last step order of ligation will be like this. This is a diagram showing the anterior laser packing and posterior laser packing both the sides. This is the picture showing neurosil. Neurosil is a type of collagen type of material which absorbs the blood or any liquid and swallow. So it can be used or you can use the, you use the ruler bandage. This is the posterior laser packing. Uh, both bands, two threads like this, one thread from the outside, um, one thread from the mouth. And posterior laser packing, if the bleeding, bleeding is from the Woodrop structures or retrocolumnar vein. Now, little idea about nasal polyp, ethmoidal polyp. We all know ethmoidal polyp are allergic in nature, generally bilateral. Patient having the hereditary predisposition, mainly occurring in the 20, 30, 40 years of the age, ethmoidal polyps. They are just overextension of the mucosa, no mass. This is overextension of the mucosa. So you can see pale glistening, pale glistening like multiple uh, grape like uh, polyp like structure. They are mainly arising in the middle natus. This is middle turbinate. This is the litter of the nose. These are multiple ethmoidal polyp. This is nothing but because of the blockage of the sinus, Bernoulli's theorem applies. Whenever there is a small opening is blocked, negative pressure will create overextension of nasal mucosa, which is laden with the water that is known as ethmoidal polyp. So ethmoidal polyp, ideal treatment is medical management, but uh, ideal treatment is steroids, but you can't give steroids every time because there are a lot of uh, side effects of the steroids. So our purpose is firstly do FES, endoscopic sinus surgery, clear all the polyp, then widen the opening of the sinuses and then FES followed by medical treatment. What is the medical treatment? Medical treatment is like steroidal sprays, steroidal spray or irrigation by means of irrigation preparation of the steroids so that the steroid will uh, keep a control over the allergy. Now entrogonal polyp, Killian's polyp. Killian's polyp is infective in nature. It is not because of allergy, it is infective. The reason is infective. It is happening in the child AC polyp. We also say it is infective because of infection, bacterial infection. And that's the reason AC polyp has no role of steroids. No steroids in AC polyps. Entroconal. Entro means maxillary. Entrum cona means nasal cona. So basically, this polyp, because of the infection, start in maxillary sinus from the entrum, come out and move towards the cona, towards the nasopharynx. That's why the name is entroconal polyp. Treatment again will be first. 
no role of steroids. <laughs> leaf out fracture, there are three types of leaf out fracture. Uh, you can't imagine everything, just try to remember the line. One line is passing through palate. So that's one during fracture through the palate. Other line is pyramidal, starting like this and coming like this. Look at this line. So it is involving the orbit floor, medial wall, maxilla, zygoma, medial suture line, and this and that. So second is maxillary separation. And third leaf out fracture type 3 is craniofacial dysfunction. You can see the suture line is uh, separating the skull from the face. Now, two diseases, this pyramidal leaf, leaf out type 2, leaf out type 2, and craniofacial dysfunction. These two may have CSF leaks. These type of fractures may have CSF leaks in both the sides. Leaf out fracture 1 can't have the CSF leak. Another fracture. Blow out fracture, sudden punch over the eye. So, blow out fracture. What happens? The floor of the orbit is weakest. So, whenever there is a blow out injury over the floor, there, there are chances of the medial wall and the uh, floor of the orbit. So, suppose floor of the orbit got fractured. So, orbital fat will protrude like this from this fracture line, giving an appearance which is known as teardrop sign. Teardrop sign. So, there is a test which we do here to check for the blow out fracture that is transduction test. Use a forcep. Uh, push this fat again back into the orbit. So, the diplopia which was created because of this will get corrected. Okay. So, two important things to remember. Transduction test. Transduction test. So, by means of a forceps, just push back this uh, protruding thing back into the orbit and suddenly the diplopia will disappear. So, that is uh, orbital fracture. Uh, this... Uh, Mandibular fracture, also there is subcondylar fracture, uh, there is a midline fracture and all that. Uh, in mandibular fracture, one thing to remember is uh, the plaster, maximum duration of the plaster or immobility of mandible is not more than one month. If you do that more than one month, then patient have serious issues like uh, unable to open his mouth or something like that. So in any of the maxillary fracture, the bandage or plaster should not be more than one month. Now let's talk about larynx. <laughs> larynx, uh, I'll go a little bit faster. You all know larynx is the tubular structure, this and that. There are two types of cartilage, elastic cartilage and the hyaline cartilage. Elastic cartilage is epiglottis. Epiglottis is elastic cartilage. Along with that, other elastic cartilage is cuneiform and corniculate. So these are elastic cartilage. Rest of the cartilage, like thyroid, cricoid, these are hyaline cartilage. Highland cartilage. Larynx start from the thyroid cartilage, sorry, thyroid cartilage. Larynx uh, start from the thyroid cartilage, extend up to the cricoid cartilage. So, this thyroid cartilage is superior to the, the level of cricoid cartilage. So, thyroid is not a part of larynx. Thyroid is not a part of larynx. Highland cartilage, again, three number thyroid, cricoid, and uh, arytenoid. Arytenoid is pyramidal shape, pyramidal to, with uh, triangle. Uh, epiglottis is leaflet, leaflet like structure which is attached to the anterior part of the thyroid cartilage. Angle of the thyroid cartilage, different in male and female, 90 degrees and 120 degrees. Adam's apple, this nose, this angulation in male is sharpened as compared to female. Male is having 90 degree, female is having 120 degree. So, 90 degree angulation will result in Adam's apple. This is the Adam's apple. Thyroid cartilage is incomplete cartilage. Only complete cartilage is cricoid cartilage. Cricoid cartilage is a complete ring. Thyroid cartilage is absent in posterior part. Now, important in larynxes. Firstly, thing is, between the hyoid and the thyroid, there is a mammal thyrohyoid membrane. This thyroid membrane, midline from the median thyroid ligament, laterally from the lateral thyroid ligament. But the thing is, here is the aperture opening from where the superior laryngeal nerve branch. Which branch? Superior laryngeal nerve had two branches, internal, external. So internal branch of superior laryngeal nerve is entering through this opening and then supplying the supra larynx, supra aortic area. Okay? <laughs> This 
is the view uh, from the uh, above showing the larynx inlet, laryngeal inlet. As you can see, larynx, which is consists of aritonoid, cartilage, and cricoid, and all that. So, this is my aritonoids on both the sides. This is my aritonoids on both the sides. This whitish structure is my true vocal cord. You can see in the larynx, the whitish structure is uh, true vocal cord, rest of the structure are pinkish. Why so? Because laryngeal epithelium, everywhere is respiratory epithelium. That is pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium or cubital epithelium. Everywhere around is that epithelium, it is pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium. Except true vocal cord. True vocal cord is having squamous epithelium. And you know, squamous epithelium cholesterol are whitish in color, whitish shining. So, color of the squamous epithelium is white. That's why the true vocal cords is white in color. Rest of the larynx looks pinkish in color. So, laryngeal inlet, this is the supraglottis. And now, what are the structures here? As you can see, this is true vocal cord. Uh, these are false vocal cord. This is arytenoid. Procedure, this is epiglottis. Here, behind the arytenoid is the uh, cricoid space or we can say uh, hypophalanx, epiglottis is in the anterior part, okay? The, these are both the sides, uh, pyriform sinus. Pyriform sinus is a part of hypophalanx. So, this is pyriform sinus on both the sides. Above part is supplied by the superior laryngeal nerve. Sensory supply is the internal branch of superior laryngeal nerve. Now, different, different pathology of the larynx, keratosis larynx. Mostly in the smokers. To a person who smoke a lot, there is a whitish plaque like structure which is known as keratosis larynx, as you can see here on both the sides. Keratosis. There is uh, keratinized tissue accumulation over the larynx. Why this is happening on true vocal cord? Because true vocal cord is squamous epithelium. Okay. Mainly in the smokers. Uh, smokers. Okay. Uh, it is having pre malignant tendency. Keratosis is having pre malignant tendency. So, treatment will be decortication, remove that complete layer, stripping of the vocal cord, remove that layer which is having the keratosis and send it for the biopsy. If there are certain changes of carcinoma and uh, in situ, then treat accordingly. Rinkies edema. What is Rinkies edema? We know vocal cord has four layers. Vocal cord ideally has a four layer. Above layer is epi epithelium. Epithelium. Then middle layer is. <coughs> connective tissue, second layer, then comes vocal ligament, then comes vocalis muscle. So this is vocalis muscle, this is vocalis ligament, this is connective tissue, okay. So Rinkies edema happens whenever there is a gap between epithelium and the connective tissue, the collection of mixomatous debris, collection of mixomatous type of material in between the epithelium and the connective tissue layer or subconnective tissue layer of the vocal cord. So because of that, as you can see, you can see the whitest structure till here. You can see that demarcation. And after that, there is a mixomatous highline like material in between the above only the epithelium layer, rest of the vocal cord is here, vocal ligament, vocal is muscle, whatever it is. So collection of the mixomatous material in between the epithelium and the connective tissue layer of the vocal cord is known as uh, Rinkies edema. So generally Rinkies edema also happens in bilate, uh, smokers and it is bilateral. Both the vocal cords are involved. Vocal nodules Vocal nodules is also known as singer's nodule, teacher's nodules. Person who are in uh, profession of constant speaking, like teachers, singers, whatever it is. So because of that chronic vocal abuse, it is happening because of chronic vocal abuse. There is no sudden vocal abuse, no sudden history. Chronic, gradually develops, chronic vocal abuse. Like in singers or whatever it is, profession. So because of chronic vocal abuse, tiny tiny structure develop. Here you can see the so it is marked by the red color, tiny bulge is there, which is less than 3 mm. Okay, so this is known as vocal nodule, which typical of singers or teachers nodule. It is generally bilateral at the junction of anterior one third and posterior two third. This is anterior, this is posterior. 
treatment of vocal nodule. Treatment of choice for the vocal nodule is rest. Voice rest. You can add PPI. You can add speech therapy. But don't go for MLS. No. Wait for six months. If heal better, if after six months uh, they are not healing, then we can think of uh, microlabial surgery. Otherwise, surgery is not the preferred treatment for the nodules. Whereas if we talk about vocal polyp, vocal polyp is sudden vocal abuse. <laughs> that was a chronic vocal abuse. Here it is sudden abuse of vocal cords. Sudden trauma, sudden trauma will lead to rupture of the epithelium leading to hematoma like polyp like growth formation. So vocal polyp is generally unilateral and here the treatment will be microlabial surgery, remove the polyp. Under GM. Now another pathology, intubation granuloma. What is intubation granuloma? Uh, in ICU or whatever, when we intubate the patient, sometimes because of that trauma, because of that trauma, what happened? Uh, some sort of swelling or mass formed at the posterior end of the laryngeal inlet. Suppose the patient we are intubating the patient, and then we are uh, use, uh, we are inflating the cuff. So vocal cord there is a pressure tube. Look at this picture. So basically, whenever these mass-like structures are produced bilaterally on both the sides, and patient has a history of intubation, suppose history of admission, ICU or OT, with a history of general anesthesia, whatever. So after intubation, if some growth happens, which is bilateral, and in the posterior part, so that is intubation granuloma. If this granuloma happens, treatment is microlaryngeal surgery. Do microlaryngeal surgery and remove it. Uh, sister, why uh, the typical feature? Okay, tell me the lesion which are present on the posterior part of larynx. Majority of the lesions are present on the uh, anterior part of the larynx, between anterior one third and posterior two third, like vocal nodules, vocal polyp. There are three lesions which are present in the posterior part of the larynx, which are involved in the posterior part of the larynx. Posterior part of the posterior larynx. <laughs> First is TB larynx. TB, it is involving the posterior part. Another one is intubation granuloma. Because we are intubating the patient, so it is mostly happening in the posterior part. Third reason, I'll show you next uh, slide. Juvenile papilloma of larynx, another important, it is in the juvenile age group. Juvenile age group, children's juvenile, okay, 10, 12, 13, 14, 9, so like this age group. Mm -hmm. Juvenile papilloma of larynx, the causative agent found is human papilloma virus 6 and 11, most common, 16 and 18, less common. So, most common causative agent is human papilloma virus 6 and 11. You can see there are multiple papillomas in the supraglottic and the glottic part. So, juvenile papilloma is involving the larynx with a multiple papilloma growth, which can be involved in the two vocal cord, full vocal cord, arytenoids, AE folds, or whatever it is. So, the uh, cause is when the delivery of the baby happens, and suppose mother is having vaginal human papilloma virus. So, sometimes this virus can transmit to the baby airway, leading to condition juvenile papilloma in the larynx. This is multiple polyp recurrence is common. Nowadays, the treatment of choice for juvenile papilloma of larynx is CO2 laser. CO2 laser is the treatment of choice. Why treatment of choice? Because this is very precise, uh, less damage to the normal structure. Why this is an emergency, laryngeal papilloma? Because it is obscuring the airway. And there are chances of these granuloma may have fragile. They may dislodge, they may broke down and enter into the bronchus. And wherever they enter, because there is a viral origin, the bronchus will also start having papilloma growth. So what we do, we do the CO2 laser, remove the lesions, and then to uh, prevent the recurrence, we use ABC. We use ABC. to prevent the recurrence of the juvenile papilloma. What is A? Interferon alpha. What is B? Bivasi juma. What is C? Cedophobia. Intralesion. Where the lesion is, you can inject directly. So you can inject Cedophobia. So basically the trick is A, B, C. Interferon alpha 2A, Bivasi juma and Cedophobia. That can be injected to prevent the recurrence. Mitomycin C also can be used, can be applied. 
But typically, these are used. Dysphonia plica ventricularis. See, true vocal cords are known as vocal cords. False vocal cords are also known as ventricular folds. Ventricular folds. False vocal cords. So, this dysphonia plica ventricularis is a term, is a condition where patient for production of voice, instead of using true vocal cord, he is using false vocal cord more. So, voice by excessive use of false vocal cord, that is known as dysphonia plica ventricularis. Excessive use of false vocal cord. So, the voice produces dysphonia plica ventricularis. Supraglottis, what are the part in the supraglottis? As you can see, uh, this is a picture showing endoscopic view. So, supraglottis, above there is erythroid. You can see this is erythroid, like this. Okay. Uh, this is a A fold between the epiglottis and the erythroid A folds. This is epiglottis. This is false vocal cord. This is true vocal cord, whitish in color. Okay. And this is interarytenoid. So, supraglottis is basically uh, containing the false vocal cord. Uh, epiglottis, arytenoid, A folds. This is supraglottic. Vocal cords are present in the glottis. Vocal cord and one centimeter below the vocal cord is a part of glottis. And subglottis is uh, vocal cord below the level of one centimeter. Also, subglottis is basically cricoid area. Cricoid cartilage area against the cricoid cartilage. Now, what is laryngocele? Laryngocele. What is laryngocele? Whenever the larynx development occurs, so we all know, suppose I take the uh, one, uh, this section, or uh, societal sec uh, coronal section of the larynx. So on both the sides, larynx or cartilage is there, uh, thyroid cartilage is there, and below there is cricoid cartilage. If I cut down like this, okay, so both the sides, thyroid cartilage and cricoid cartilage. In the larynx, In larynx, what is happening is from above there is conus elasticus. Larynx structures are formed by the two membranes. Two membranes, one is quadrangular membrane, other one is conus elasticus. So conus elasticus is coming. Uh, sorry, quadrangular membrane is coming from above on both the sides, and from the down there is conus elasticus. And these two membranes are responsible for formation of the vocal cords, like false vocal cord, true vocal cord. True vocal cord. So above, the supraglottic structure are formed by the quadrangular membrane, like quadrangular membrane extension. Quadrangular membrane is forming the false vocal cord. And conus elasticus, conus elasticus is forming the true vocal cord. True vocal cord epithelium is conus epithelium, rest of the vocal cord epithelium is pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium. Now what happened? In between the true and the false vocal cord, there is an area which is known as ventricle. So this is ventricle. This is ventricle of the larynx. And there is mucosal outpouching. There is mucosal outpouching between the laryngeal cartilage and the false vocal cord. You can see between the laryngeal membrane and the cartilage, the mucosal extension is known as secure. And this gap, this is ventricle, okay, between the true vocal cord and the false vocal cord. Now, what happened in laryngocele? You understood false vocal cord is developed from the quadrangular membrane, true vocal cord is developed from the conus elasticus. All the ligaments are formed by these membranes. Now, in laryngocele, sometimes the patient who are glass blower, who have a habit of pushing the air, generating more air, more pressure, so, glass blower, like in this industry, okay. hmm. so in laryngocele, this secure, whenever the patient uh, working like this, where he has to generate a air pressure with a greater force from the lungs. So this air, whenever it expires with a force, so some of the air will enter into the ventricle and this mucosal pack, this secure, will fill with air. So suddenly, this mucosal bag will start enlarging. 
it will start enlarging either it will come out or either it, it will go inside if this secure overgrowth go inside then it will cause a respiratory stridor blockage of the airway if it comes outside there will be a soft mass over the lateral aspect of the neck if you press that mass press that mass the lip sound like come like the air leak from the balloon okay so this is laryngocele laryngocele is nothing but extension of secure so internal laryngocele airway will be blocked compromise external <laughs> uh, there is a mass in the neck treatment is surgery just remove this mucosal outgrowth or uh, surgery from the external incision or internal whatever it is generally it is common in trumpet blower glass blower there is a where there is a deep uh, pressure thrust we have to apply so picture like this examiner may they frame the question like a glass blower trumpet blower suddenly presented to the opd with the neck swelling and this when uh, pressing the neck swelling the uh, leakage sound was there but but like say and that sign is known as bryce sign so look at this picture there is a swelling on the lateral aspect of the neck and when you press over this swelling so it will reduce it is reducible compressible because it is filled with air only so this sign is known as bryce sign which is a part of laryngocele this is another thing showing x ray showing this so patient come to my opd with a swelling so i i can see this compressible like right? some air so i did the x ray done so when i did the x ray done you can see the mass which is filled with air all around the larynx so typical of laryngocele if you see here this is laryngocele and it is classically present in the trumpet or glass blower so in laryngocele present we we'll do the valsalva maneuver as the patient will valsalva this mass will increase in size okay so generally before surgery we ask the patient to do valsalva we do the valsalva so that swelling increases in size and then we remove it next thing is laryngomalacia laryngomalacia is a congenital disease most common congenital disease is laryngomalacia which is the most common congenital pathology laryngomalacia what is the pathology here here basically the supraglottis supraglottic structure supraglottic like epiglottis a folds these are not rigid these are very flexible these are very smooth so whenever child breathe in the air whenever he breathe in these are so soft so fragile they also suck them so what is happening in laryngocele basically it is having omega shape epiglottis now look at this omega shape epiglottis see a fold epiglottis these are very floppy these are floppy soft so whenever patient try to breathe in or uh, these will suck them blocking the airway resulting in a condition uh, that present with a stridor patient will produce a uh, stridor so mother father will complain that my baby, baby is having a respiratory difficulty but if you do the endoscopic examination you will see that uh, omega shape epiglottis during the airway they are also sucked in so they are basically soft extremely soft most common congenital anomaly it is the most common cause of congenital stridor congenital stridor most common cause but the best part is self limiting nothing to do if you got with the diagnosis of uh, laryngocele the only treatment is conservative reassurance to the patient because laryngocele it present after birth most common congenital anomaly but slowly slowly this floppy part gain rigidity they gain strength they uh, start uh, the uh, cartilization happens in epiglottis and a folds so till the age of 2 years it will be disappeared automatically so since birth to 2 months of age basically no symptom after then after that symptom will decrease continuously and till the age of 2 year it will disappear so learning of malaysia clinical presentation child after birth will be in stridor only pathology where the child after birth is in stridor and the stridor will decrease in prone position if it turn the uh, baby to from supine to prone position this stridor will decrease why decrease because of change of posture of the epiglottis the epiglottis which was folding over the inlet when you change the position in prone position this epiglottis will fall backward so now airway inlet is open so that's why stridor will decrease in prone position if there is a only condition where stridor decrease in prone position is laryngomalacia no other condition has this so whenever stridor decrease in uh 
12 position, then is Laringo Malaysia. Strider here increase on crime. There are certain pathology where strider decrease on crime. Here, strider is present since birth. Just, yeah. Strider is present since birth, first week of birth. Increases on crime. When, when cry, these are more sudden, the floppy structures. Decreases in prone position. Only condition where it is decreases in prone position. And it is an inspiratory strider because it is involving the supraglottis. Because it is involving the supraglottis. Now here, cry is normal. Baby can cry normally sound. Why? Because it is not involving the vocal cords. Vocal cords are normal. Okay? So cry is normal. Cry sound is normal. Self-limiting, nothing to do. Just reassure the patient, the parents. Conservative management. In the larynx, there are three to four conditions where we can use the conservative management. First is laryngeal lesion. Then other is unilateral vocal cord palsy. If one vocal cord is uh, getting paralysis, other is working, nothing to do. See, suppose uh, these are vocal cords on both the sides. So the normal resting position of vocal cord is cadaveric position. Normal resting position, position of the vocal cord is cadaveric position. Cadaveric position is nothing but 3.5 mm away from midline. Cadaveric position is the normal position and silent respiration position also cadaveric position. So it is 3.5 away from the midline. When we speak, vocal cords come in median or paramedian position. When we speak, vocal cords come in median or paramedian. Median is both vocal cords approximated with each other. So that means there is no gap from the midline. Paramedian, paramedian position, it is around 1 mm away from the midline. That is paramedian. And when we, uh, uh, when we uh, run, we need deep inspiration. So in deep inspiration, vocal cord position is lateral position which is around uh, position in the uh, uh, respiration which is around 7 mm from midline. So normal resting position is cadaveric position. When we want to speak, then position is medium or paramedium. And uh, a respiration position, respiratory position to respire more is the lateral position which is around 7 mm away from the midline. So suppose if one of the vocal cord got paralysis. One of the vocal cord uh, get the paralysis, but this is working. So if this vocal cord get paralyzed, so this will rest in the cadaveric position itself. So still there is a gap of 3.5 mm. So patient can breathe normally. Other is working. Only difference will be uh, in the speaking because this is not working. So with time, this vocal cord will overtake the function. Instead of this vocal cord uh, coming in the midline, it will also shift towards this side. So it will overtake the function of the, the uh, this uh, 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 vocal cord, pa pa paralyzed vocal cord and patient hearing, uh, patient voice will be better with the tongue. Other self-emitting uh, decision, uh, self-emitting disease, CSF rhinorrhea. Always, always, whether it is traumatic, whether it is idiopathic, first try conservative management. And the fourth thing is traumatic perforation of tympanic membrane. Understood? Traumatic membrane, traumatic perforation of tympanic membrane, I told you, weight, conservative management. CSF rhinorrhea, I told you, weight, conservative management. Laryngo Malaysia, self-emitting disease, because of the floppy nature, that will subside as the age progress. <laughs> and unilateral vocal cord palsy because other vocal cord palsy will take the function of uh, this vocal cord. Now, congenital subglottic stenosis. Congenital subglottic stenosis, normally the subglottic diameter should be more than 3.5 mm or 4 mm. Ideally, uh, in a baby, it is 4 mm. Sorry. In a children, the uh, subglottic uh, uh, opening diameter is around 4 mm. If it is less than 3.5 mm, then it is known as subglottic stenosis. Why this stenosis is happening? In embryonic development, embryonic development of age, supraglottic, glottic, these areas are combining, so the membrane between them sometimes persists. And the persistence, this will, this, uh, persist, persistence of this will lead to subglottic stenosis. So this is, look at the picture, subglottic area, there is a membrane and subglottic stenosis is there. Normally, in this, uh, treatment can be done by the laser. With laser, you can remove this, you can uh, do the coagulator or different different instrument you can use and you can remove it. Uh, whether it's an emergency or not, depend on the 
ओपनिंग प्रेजेंट डिपेंड ऑन द ओपनिंग प्रेजेंट नाउ मेयर कोटिंग सेविंग सिस्टम फॉर सब जोटिक स्मॉसिस वॉट डज मेयर कोटिन से सो अकॉर्डिंग टू ग्रेड वन इज लेस देन फिफ्टी परसेंट ब्लॉकेज आउटर ल्यूमन Suppose this is the lumen or subglottic. So if it is less than fifty percent block, then grade one. Grade two is fifty to seventy percent. Grade three is seventy-one to ninety-nine percent. That means grade three only small pinpoint-like structure is present, and grade four is more detectable lumen. There is complete stenosis. Complete stenosis. Grade four hundred percent. Grade three and grade four. These are emergencies, extreme emergencies. So immediately you will do the tracheostomy. ट्रैकेस्टोमीस Treatment will be done. Will be resection of stenotic segment, resection of stenotic uh, stenotic segment, and anastomosis between the and re-anastomosis, re-anastomosis between the remaining part of the larynx and the vocal cords. Whereas in stage one or stage two, stage one and stage two, you can use a laser. The stenotic part we can burn it out with the laser. We can burn it out with the microlaser blender, and then apply the mitomycin C to uh, reduce the chances of recurrence. So uh, do the laser removal, do the microlaser blender removal, and apply the mitomycin C. Now this is one tube. Just focus on the uh, pictures. Montgomery silicon T tube. This is also known as T tubes made up of silicon Montgomery. So it is used in a patient of laryngeal stenosis. Why? Because stenotic segment has a tendency to go in stenosis again and again. We remove the stenotic part, then again, again, because it will overgrow. So what we do? We remove the stenotic segment, then we just anastomose everything. Then to prevent that stenotic segment to happen again, this tube is placed like this. So what it will do? It it will not. It will restrict the mucosal overgrowth. Plus our airway is also. Obtained. So this is not a very silicon tracheal T tube, and then apply whenever you remove the stenotic segment, segment apply the mitomycin C for the anti-fibroblastic activity. Acute epiglottitis, very very important. Typical presentation of the exam: a child, mostly of three years of age group, three years of age group or child presented with the inspiratory strider, inspiratory strider. the drilling of saliva from the angle of mouth baby was in toxic loop with a tripod position baby was found relaxed in tripod position and the baby was febrile having severe fever and everything so these all words are typically showing that baby is having acute epiglottitis acute epiglottitis definitely it's a bacterial disease it's a bacterial disease most common causes streptococcus pneumonia streptococcus pneumonia or group b streptococci what is happening epiglottitis we know epiglottis is the inlet it is the cap of larynx it open and closes the larynx so if this is edematous if the supraglottis is bulges like hell so it will block the air entry leading to inspiratory stridor and respiratory emergency so typical presentation will be like this if you do the x ray x ray of acute epiglottitis will show thumb sign and large epiglottis thumb sign which is blocking the larynx airway okay treatment what will do immediately start uh, start the iv antibiotics iv antibiotics because it's a bacterial disease does intubation is allowed yes you can intubate yes in initial stage intubate the patient to secure the airway intubate the patient immediately give anti antibiotic start steroids also to reduce the edema and provide humidified oxygen also to give the oxygen supply so what were the things you do you will whenever the patient come will intubate the patient secure the airway start iv antibiotics start uh, start uh, steroids humidify oxygen etc in acute epiglottitis repeated laryngeal uh, uh, laryngeal examination is contraindicated so never do laryngoscopy again again so laryngoscopy is contraindicated 
Why this is so? Because repeated examination will cause further edema to the epiglottis or the supraglottis. So further there is respiratory compromise. So that's why epiglottitis. So intubate the patient and do not do repeated laryngeal examination to avoid the laryngeal edema. Now acute laryngotracheal bronchitis, which is also known as Crohn's disease. We all know Crohn's disease. Epiglottitis is a bacterial. It is a viral disease. So viral diseases are generally gradually progressive. This is not an emergency. It is an oral tract, yeah, bronchus, everything, but on a milder level. So symptoms are relatively lesser here. Uh, here the sign present is stepple sign. Stepple. As you can see in X-ray, see it is a, getting a narrow. Stepple. Like the uh, you have seen that stepple in Bengali wedding, they wear they wear a cap. White is cap during the wedding, so that is like pointed stepple. So stepple sign is typical of laryngotracheal bronchitis. It is caused by virus. Which virus? Para influenza type A and B. Para influenza type A and type B is the causative agent here. Again, the treatment here, sicardia. Uh, no need of intubation because uh, there is no such fiber. So we we'll give the antiviral, antibiotic treatment, humidify oxygen and steroids, etc. <coughs> Cancer larynx, important topic, multiple questions in mass. We'll just simplify the cancer larynx. Simplify the cancer larynx, how to remember uh, and solve the, uh, uh, this cancer larynx questions. Okay, so stage one, only one structure on one side is involved. Only one structure on one side, one main structure, suppose true vocal cord on left side. One area epiglottic fold on the left side, that is T1. T2, more than one main structure more than one main structure like only vocal cord involved it can be over the left side or can be over the uh, right side so both the side vocal cord are there but main is vocal cord only so if suppose both vocal cords are involved still it is called stage one but involvement of more than one structure whose name is different get it point? like vocal cord plus a fold vocal cord plus epiglottis Vocal cord plus false vocal cord. True vocal cord plus false vocal cord. So different name. So more than one name structure is involved. And vocal cord mobility is impaired. It is not fixed to one position, but there is impairment of the vocal cord mobility. Okay. Third structure is vocal cord fix. Whenever the word used, uh, in examiner I use the word vocal cord immobile or fixed, that means the patient is already in stage three or four. Okay. So stage three is vocal cord is fixed or there is involvement of pre-epiglottic area or paraglottic space pre-epiglottic area paraglottic if examiner use this word like uh, vocal cord is fixed or involvement of pre-epiglottic or paraepiglottic that means stage 3 then comes stage 4 stage 4 is uh, uh, involvement of cartilage thyroid cartilage involvement of precoid cartilage or nearby structures like thyroid gland like thyroid uh, ligament, hyoid bone, ne nearby structure. So stage 4 is outside larynx, it is spread or cartilage involvement. Stage 3 is vocal cord fix or immobile plus preglottic paraglottic space invasion. Stage 2 is two structures involved with different names. Okay. Stage 1 is one same name structure involved. Now, look at the CT scan or vocal cord just to show you the class cinema. Which stage is this? Now, which stage is this? You know, this is uh, my vertebra. Okay. This is my vertebra. This is my esophagus. And this area is showing the trachea. Now, look at this. This is thyroid cartilage. Incomplete. This is thyroid cartilage. I am looking at this and I can see a mass is coming out of thyroid cartilage. This much we can see in the CT scan. So, this mass which is out of thyroid cartilage or involving the thyroid cartilage. Which stage is this? Stage 4. Okay, look at this. Where is the mass? <laughs> now, treatment. Stage 1, 2, 3, 4. Different, different treatment. In stage 1, radiotherapy is the best treatment. Only one condition difference. If the stage 1 cancer is over the vocal cord, middle one third of the vocal cord. 
In that case, instead of going for the radiotherapy, what we can do, we can use a CO2 laser at that part and just burn out the uh, cancer part. Okay? CO2 laser. So, stage one, radiotherapy. Only difference is if the vocal cord meta one third is applied, to use the CO2 laser or remove that part. Stage two. Again, treatment is radiotherapy, preferred treatment. Second option after radiotherapy is partial laryngectomy. If lungs function normally, then you can opt for partial laryngectomy. Otherwise, preferred treatment is radiotherapy. Stage T3 and T4, that means preglottic, paraglottic, vocal cord, fix or thyroid cartilage, whatever structures are involved. In that case, first line of treatment will be total laryngectomy. Remove the part of the larynx which has already um, involved with the cancer. Plus, radical neck dissection, remove the neck lymph nodes, followed by radiotherapy. That means stage 3 and 4, whenever the vocal cord are fixed or the cartilage is involved, remove larynx, do the modified radical neck dissection, and followed by radiotherapy. Second option, if they want to ask, then concurrent chemo radiation. Now, Suppose patient is in stage 3 or 4, so we remove the larynx. Now what to do? How to speak? Larynx is important to speak. Now what are the options left? Different different options left after laryngectomy. Firstly, what will happen after laryngectomy? Patient is having permanent tracheostomy. The stoma is made outside of the neck in permanent tracheostomy. Now, how to produce voice? Esophageal voice processes can be used. So, how to produce a voice? Vocal, we speak how generate the air thrust from the lungs this pressured expired air is then hitting the vocal cords and from the vocal cords the sound is produced that is being managed articulated with the help of tongue buckle with the palate and all that so that we can speak the words or pauses. so basically if larynx is removed the esophageal voice processes can be used different different voice processes first is the artificial larynx look at this diagram this is the permanent stroma of the trachea so, just putting it, closing it, and this is my artificial larynx. I'm just uh, putting this over the uh, pharyngo esophageal muscles. So, what we are doing is we are using this electrolarynx, which produces a vibration. The air thrust, we block the trachea outer airway. The air thrust is being generated from the uh, esophagus. Here, we are using the esophageal uh, voice processes. So, that air pressure is generated from the esophagus. We put the vibrator. This vibrator will vibrate the pharyngeal muscles that will lead to production of certain voice. Okay? So, if this picture is shown, this is electrolarynx, external mechanical material. Okay. Now, another picture just to show you tracheoesophageal puncture device. See, in larynx, or suppose larynx is removed, then only trachea is left. Okay? We make a permanent stone outside for the trachea. Behind that, there is esophagus. Now, what we will do, we will use this tracheoesophageal puncture device. What we will do, we will connect the tracheal wall and esophagus. We will make an opening and connect this. Uh, Tracheal esophagus. We will insert this. Suppose this is the wall. Wait. This is esophagus and this is a common wall between that trachea and esophagus. So, what I will do, what we will do, tracheal esophageal puncture device, this device is inserted in between the trachea and esophageal wall. This is a one way wall. The typicality or peculiarity of this wall is this is one way. It will allow air to enter into the esophagus from trachea because air thrust is generated into the lungs. So, it will one way, it will allow this way flow, but if suppose food, water is going in the esophagus, so this way flow is not allowed. Okay? So, what we are doing, what is the function of this uh, trachea is a visual puncture device, this picture, uh, function is this, in electrolytic we are using the uh, voice, uh, sorry, air thrust from the esophagus only, which is weak. If we use the air channel, air column from the trachea and because uh, ahead of trachea there is no larynx, so anyhow we have to direct this. Basically, we, to produce the sound, we are using the esophageal pharyngeal muscle. Pharyngoesophageal sphincter is the final way to produce the sound, which is above the esophagus, above the esophagus in the pharyngeal muscle. 
So only difference is air entry, air thrust. So we are doing this tracheoesophageal puncture device, air entry through this, entering the esophagus, and that column will vibrate the pharyngoesophageal muscle or sphincter, resulting in formation of sound. Tracheoesophageal puncture device. Bloom Singer processes, also known as Bloom Singer processes. Just look at the picture. Bloom Singer processes. A channel, one-way channel between the trachea and the esophagus. So how does we see? This is trachea. This is trachea, and this is esophagus. Now what we are doing? Air is being generated from the trachea. This trachea is a major puncture device. From this, air is directed into the esophagus. Here we are closing this. The outflow finger will uh, put a finger over the tracheal opening. So for that moment, air we shifted to esophagus. Now we have removed the uh, larynx, but esophagus, pharyngeal muscles, everything else is there. Tongue is there. So this air column will vibrate these muscles. And a uh, patient can produce a sound. In electro larynx, the vibrator directly hitting the uh, muscles. Here we are using the air to hit the muscles. Now supply of larynx. We know the larynx uh, uh, glottis and subglottis. If suppose larynx is by vagus nerve branches, that is understood. Okay. Uh, Above the level of vocal cord, if you talk about it like this, above the level of vocal cords, let's see. Above the level of vocal cord, let's say, so above this, the main supply of larynx is superior larynx. Superior larynx. Superior larynx again is a branch of vagus nerve. This is ganglion, plexiform ganglion. From there, superior larynx nerve is arising from the vagus. It is piercing the thyroid membrane. I told you already. Then, uh, uh, after piercing, it is in two branches: internal larynx nerve and external larynx nerve. This internal larynx nerve is the sensory supply for supraglottis. Superior larynx nerve, internal branch, is sensory supply for the. Aliopiglottic fluids, false vocal cords, piriform sinus, whatever it is. And external branch of superior laryngeal nerve, it is supplying the cricothyroid muscle. Cricothyroid muscle. So look at this. Cricothyroid muscle is where? Here. So external branch is supplying the cricothyroid muscle. This cricothyroid muscle is basically main tensor of vocal cords. So voice pitch is dependent on this muscle. And this is partial adductor of vocal cord. Okay, so it will try to bring vocal cord uh, together. Uh, ahead of that, it is also main tensor of the vocal cord. Below the level of vocal cord, the nerve supplies by the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Now there is a difference in left and right recurrent laryngeal nerve. What happens in left side? The vagus nerve goes down. Then it goes down, reaches the arch of aorta. Then through the arch of aorta, below the arch of aorta. The uh, uh, left side now arises. Now this run in opposite direction, uh, run along the tracheoesophageal groove and supply the uh, sensory supply to the glottis and subglottis. Motor supply to all the muscles in the larynx except cricothyroid, which is supplied by the external branch of the uh, laryngeal nerve. Now left or right, there is a difference. Left recurrent laryngeal nerve is longer as compared to right because here the turning is from the arch of aorta. Right recurrent nerve. It is arising after it taking a turn from the right subclavian artery. So right RN is shorter as compared to left RN, and that's the reason uh, left RN pulse is more common. Left recurrent laryngeal nerve is more common because the course is going in the mediastinum. Any mediastinal pathology like cancer or anything can result in pulse of this. Okay. So larynx, all the muscles are supplied by the recurrent laryngeal nerve except one muscle, which is cricothyroid, which is supplied by the Uh, external branch of superior laryngeal nerve. Both these are branches of uh, vagus nerve. Now, cricothyroid muscle. Important topics which can be asked. Cricothyroid muscle between the thyroid and cricoid cartilage. It is the only muscle. Uh, uh, it is the only tensor of vocal cord that provide the strength to the vocal cord. Tensor. Kiss ke rakte hai usko. Tensor of the vocal cord which gives the pitch of to the vocal cord. Quality of voice. So. Cricothyroid muscle will provide the quality of voice. 
basic tender of voice is maintained like this it is the only laryngeal muscle which has two valleys it is the only intrinsic muscle which is lying outside all the muscles are lying inside only muscle intrinsic muscle which is lying outside only muscle with the two valleys only tensor of the vocal cords and it is only muscle which is supplied by the superior laryngeal now superior laryngeal now now thyroid muscle medial fibers from the vocalis muscle thyroepiglotticus muscle it is the opener of larynx thyroepiglotticus interarytenoid in between the arytenoid it is the having the dual innervation two arytenoids in between the interarytenoid so uh, innervation from both sides the dual inter, uh, innervation only unpaired muscle of the larynx it is only unpaired muscle of the larynx now uh, some lesions like bilateral uh, rln palsy you know recurrent laryngeal nerve is supplying the two vocal cords so if recurrent laryngeal nerve get paralysis so all muscles will be paralyzed except cricothyroid muscle because cricothyroid muscle is supplied by the external laryngeal nerve that is a branch of superior laryngeal nerve so in bilateral rln palsy all muscles are gone except one muscle which is cricothyroid and what will this will do cricothyroid is a adductor if this is a adductor so vocal cord will come in the midline if midline they are approximated there is no airway so it's a respiratory emergency patient will be immediately in the stridor so bilateral rln palsy vocal cord position will be midline vocal cord in midline so it's a respiratory emergency that's why uh, do immediately tachycardia or whatever you want to do intubate the patient whatever and to correct the condition do that type 2 thyroplasty what is type 2 thyroplasty how to remember type 2 type 3 i remember by this type 1 is uh, mls this is a trick type 1 is m which is medialization type 2 is l which is lateralization type 3 is shortening and type 4 is lengthening these are the simple tricks so since vocal cord are in midline they are approximated so what we want to do we want to take them apart lateralization so if these are midline so we need to take them apart so type 2 thyroplasty is done in the bilateral rln palsy <laughs> this is a picture showing how to do the type 2 thyroplasty just keep the vocal cords apart by putting incision of the thyrocartilage just moving it away then bilateral adductor palsy adductor palsy if suppose <laughs> all adductors are gone all the adductor palsy bilateral adductor palsy what will happen adductor function is lost only one adductor the only muscle which can abduct the vocal cord is posterior cricoarytenoid posterior cricoarytenoid is supplied by the recurrent laryngeal nerve and that is the only muscle which can keep the vocal cord away so if all the adductor function is lost only posterior cricoarytenoid muscle is working that means vocal cords are in away position from the midline so large gap Large gap. If there is a large gap, there is chance of aspiration. Anything you will eat because that is open. Aspiration chance. Can you speak? To speak, vocal cord should be approximated. Then only we can speak. So patient can't speak. So since vocal cord away, what is the thyroplasty we do? Medialization. We need to uh, turn this towards this side. So this is medial medialization surgery. So type one thyroplasty. It is like bilateral SLN palsy basically. RLM palsy, the cords were uh, midline. SLN palsy, yeah, adductor palsy, away. What are the type of thyroplasty? I already told you. MLS, medialization, lateralization, shortening, and then lengthening. Shortening when we do MLS, S is for shortening. We all know that the uh, females have high pitch voice. Why high pitch voice is there in females? Because the length of vocal cord is more. in female vocal cords are lengthy as compared to males and the length provide the females high pitch voice so if any male who is having female like voice any male who is having female like voice that means he is male but vocal cords are lengthy high pitch so what need to do so any puberphonia puberphonia is a condition 
where male child adolescent male child is having female like voice that means vocal cord are length extra length they are over stretch giving a high pitch voice so in that case we need to remove that extra stretch extra stretch so we do shortening surgery so lengthening surgery when we do just opposite of it in endophonia where female is having male like voice understood now tracheostomy most common complication what are the side tracheostomy tracheostomy is low mid and high normally mid tracheostomy is preferred between ring 3 to 5 or uh, 2 3 4 sorry 2 3 4 tracheal ring 2 3 4 high tracheostomy with the above above is done at level of level 1 high tracheostomy is done cl rings why cl rings because we need to preserve as much trachea we can preserve okay so cl rings high tracheostomy is routinely mid tracheostomy low tracheostomy whenever there is stenosis subglottic stenosis tracheal stenosis okay in that uh, low tracheostomy is done. what is the cause of surgical emphysema after tracheostomy tight suture surgical emphysema after tracheostomy if we do tracheostomy if it tightly suture so emphysema is presence of air between uh, in the connective uh, tissue space between the skin and connective the tissue so tight suture will lead to leakage of air into that tissue leading to surgical emphysema so reason is no tight suture okay no tight suture apnea after tracheostomy why this is happening i am doing the tracheostomy and removing the dead space so why apnea is happening after tracheostomy the reason for sudden apnea after tracheostomy is co2 washout see when you do the tracheostomy directly you bypass the uh, dead space so co2 washout is, is there co2 get out oxygen directly in. but co2 is the main center for respiration center respiratory center works upon depending on the concentration of the co2 if sudden co2 wash out happens so respiratory center work hamper that is the reason patient goes in the apnea and sometimes death may happen hamic maneuver what is the maneuver foreign body in the airway foreign body in the neck with a choking sensation so what do you do examiner may give this picture so what he is doing hold from the back who is having this choking sensation see hamic maneuver is used hamlet maneuver is used when foreign body is in supraglottis okay it is in supraglottis if foreign body enter into the uh, trachea suppose below the level of vocal cords or in bronchi never do hamlet maneuver it is only been done when foreign body is in the supraglottis how to do stand from behind grab tightly pressure over the fist sternum so sudden thrust will put the air pressure and what are the foreign body may come out Okay, this is Hamlet maneuver. Now, pharynx. Shortly, nasal pharynx. Nasal pharynx. You know, we all know nasal pharynx is the uh, part of the nose. So suppose Okay, so this is suppose my poor now, and this part is my nasopharynx. So nasopharynx boundaries are opposite C1 vertebra. Firstly, C1 vertebra. What are the bound boundaries? Posteriorly, there is posterior pharyngeal wall and vertebra. Lateral aspect. Laterally, there is firstly eustachian tube. Eustachian tube opening. Then eustachian tube opening is guarded by a hood-like structure, which is known as torus tuberis. So lateral wall, torus tuberis is there. Then behind torus tuberis, there is a space which is known as fossa of Rosenmuller. Fossa of Rosenmuller is on the lateral wall, hidden behind the eustachian tube of torus tuberis. So lateral wall, these are the structure. Medially, it is connecting with both the sides. Anteriorly, there is cornea. Okay, so this is nasal pharynx. Simple idea. In nasal pharynx, sometimes what happen? Adenoids. Above, 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 there is thornwort's bursa, bursa. and nasopharynx a common pathology pathologies adenoids which are arising at the junction of the uh, roof in the wall 
Now, nasopharynx adenoid tissues are rising. It is a type of uh, lymphoid tissue which is having the longitudinal ridges and it is present in the nasopharynx. So, nasopharynx lie against the C1 vertebra that is skull base and a line drawn from the heart palate. Okay. Now, next is oropharynx. Not very important. Now this is a picture. Uh, this is a picture which is showing little idea. This is extra zoom. Don't get confused. But just to show you how the eustachian and everything is working. So suppose this is the adenoid which is present in the posterior wall. Okay. Nasopharynx anatomy uh, is uh, uh, showing. So this particular area is nasopharynx. Okay. Now what are the boundaries? Posteriorly there is posteropharyngeal wall and adenoid tissue. Okay. Laterally, there is eustachian tube and torus tubaris with the force of Rosenmuller. Anteriorly, floor of the nose. Getting it? Maxillary crest, whatever it is. Okay? And nasopharynx above there is spinoid sinus wall. Now look at this. Internal carotid artery is present over both the sides in the nasopharynx. Can you see that? So, any surgery any cancer in the nasopharynx. If you want to do a surgery, can you do that? Because IC is running in close proximity to the nasopharynx. <laughs> this is nasopharynx, which has been marked like this. So, you station the porous tuberis, posteropharyngeal, etc. What is adenoid hypertrophy? Adenoid is a tonsillate tissue, which are longitudinal. Tonsil has a crypts in them, adenoid has longitudinal. They generally disappear at the age of 18 years. Okay, they are present in the base of the skull in the nasopharynx. Adenoid hypertrophy again 4 grade, grade 1, 2, 3, 4. Grade 1, 0 to 25 percent block of the airway. Suppose this is my airway total depth, so 0 to 25. Then grade 2, 25 to 50 percent, 50 to 75 percent, 75 to 100 percent. So thus, these grades are being given. If the patient is having grade 3 or grade 4 hypertrophy, then it is an indication for surgery. Adenoid is just a lymphoid mass. In this diagram, we are given the x-ray, lateral view of x-ray. So you can see, this is my base of skull. Then, as you can see, this mass, this is the adenoid hypertrophy. So this complete mass, which is present in this baby, seems to be grade 4, uh, between the 75 to 100 percent of blockage of the airway. So this is grade 4 airway. So any patient of the adenoids, what will it do? It will block the nasopharynx, leading to respiratory difficulty. The patient will be mouth breathing. Patient will do mouth breathing. Patient will have snoring the night. And we all know the eustachian tube opening is there in the later one. So this will block the eustachian tube opening. Because of ET tube opening blockage, patient will have serous otitis media. Serous otitis media. So generally, adenoid hypertrophy patients, sometimes they come with a complaint of the ear infection. Now look at the picture. This is the endoscopic view from the nose. So this is nose septum. This is the lateral valve. Okay. Now you can see. Now you can see the mass fulfilling the nasopharynx, completely blocking the nasopharynx. So this is adenoids. This is adenoids. What are the adenoid faces? How a baby of adenoid, enlarged adenoid will look like? Like this. Open mouth. There will be high ash palate. Open mouth, uh, teeth may be clouding with the teeth. The history of snoring will be present. There can be prognathism, different different features. So patient will have typical appearance like this. Treatment of choice for adenoid hypertrophy. If the baby is having uh, conductive hearing loss also, so we do endoscopic removal of the adenoids. Along with that, a patient is having the serious otitis media. Do the meringotomy with adenoidectomy. Now for the adenoid and tonsil surgery, we put the patient in the rose position. So in rose position, we are giving extension at uh, uh, C1, C2. 
C1, C2 is extended like this by putting a shoulder pad. Sometime because of the over extension or prolonged surgery, there is a syndrome developed which is known as Griesel syndrome. Multiple times it has been asked Griesel syndrome. So it is because of atlantoaxial subluxation. <laughs> Over stretching, subluxation of the C1, C2 vertebral joint, and happens because of the rose position. Now, nasopharyngeal carcinoma. I told you nasopharynx anatomy, both sides, IC is there. Firstly, the nasopharyngeal carcinoma, most common carcinoma is squamous cell carcinoma. Squamous stratified squamous cell epithelium, or, or type of variety of carcinoma. Cause of nasopharyngeal carcinoma found out to be EBV, Epstein Barr virus. It is more common nasopharyngeal carcinoma in Chinese population, Mongolite population, who has a history of eating of nitrosamine, smoked fish. So, whenever a question frame like this, uh, uh, the population will be mentioned in the Chinese population, Epstein Barr virus, smoked fish they are eating, canned fish they are eating. These all are suggestive of nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Now, the thing in nasopharyngeal carcinoma is patient first clinical presentation is uh, cervical lymphadenopathy. Why? Because the location of major frame carcinoma is like this, it is slowly progressive. So, airway blockage is normally not in the first stage. But the first clinical presentation will be cervical lymphadenopathy in posterior triangle of the neck, or we can say below the uh, angle of mandible, host triangle. The major frame carcinoma lymphadenopathy is in the host triangle. Okay, the cause is Epstein Barr virus. Now, this is a picture showing the major frame. Major frame carcinoma. Most common site of origin is fossa of Rosenmuller. Where is fossa of Rosenmuller? Suppose this is my new station tube. This is torus tuberis, this area. Now, posterior wall and torus tuberis, in between the gap, this area, which is marked by the arrow, which is hidden behind, this is fossa of Rosenmuller. And this is the most common site of origin of the major pharyngeal carcinoma, which is more common in the Chinese population. Now, treatment of choice of the major pharyngeal carcinoma is radiotherapy. That stage is T1, T2, T3, T4. If uh, other option, I'll tell you, other option not given, then radiotherapy is the best treatment to treat the major pharyngeal carcinoma. Now, one more thing. Major pharyngeal carcinoma, there is a triad form, which is known as Trotter's triad. Very, very important. What is Trotter's triad? We all know major pharyngeal carcinoma, the site of major pharynx, Around it, both the sides is the parapharyngeal space around the major pharynx. Suppose this is major pharynx, around it, parapharyngeal space. In parapharyngeal space, we know 9, 10th, 11th, 12th, cranial lava passing. In parapharyngeal space, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, cranial lava there. Plus, major pharynx is also in proximity to the uh, above. There is uh, foramen rotatinum, foramen lacinum from where the trisaminal now branches are coming, maxillary now, mandibular now are coming. So it is also in proximity to 56. So any carcinoma of nasopharynx may result in palsy of these cranial lobes. So generally, Trotter's triad is triad form in the nasopharyngeal carcinoma. This triad is this triad is uh, being remembered by a mnemonic NPC, nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Shortly, NPC, nasopharyngeal carcinoma. The Trotter ties I remember like this NPC. N means neuralgia in the region of temporoparietal region. Wherever the trisaminal supply, neuralgia in that region. And P, P for parietal palsy, 10th nerve palsy. So, nasopharynx for vagus nerve supply to pharynx. So, 10th nerve palsy will do the. 10th uh, nerve palsy is parietal palsy. 5th nerve involvement will cause neuralgia. And third thing is conductor hearing loss because of blockage of the eustachian tube. So, N, P, C. Neuralgia, P for parietal palsy. Uh, C for conductive hearing loss because of blockage of the eustachian tube. So this triad is typical of major pharyngeal carcinoma. Again, the mnemonic is NPC. Now, if a child comes with serious otitis media, so we should always always think of animals. But if an adult comes with serious otitis media unilaterally, only one ear is having serious otitis media, other is normal. Then also you have to look for nasopharynx because in adult unilateral glue ear, uh, the possible cause may be nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So it has been asked in the exam. So if an adult with only one side glue ear, then keep in mind to check the nasopharynx because NPC chances can be there. The first presentation of NPC carcinoma is cervical lymphadenopathy. Which triangle? Which triangle or we can say posterior triangle or what precisely you want to say uh, between the angle of mandible and the mastoid process. 
ट्रीटमेंट चॉइस कीमो रेडिएशन हाउ कम कीमो रेडिएशन स्टेज वन और स्टेज टू यू कैन गो फॉर रेडियोथेरापी बट स्टिल बेटर आंसर इज कीमो रेडिएशन इफ कीमो रेडिएशन इज नॉट गिवन देन रेडियोथेरापी इज द नेक्स्ट आंसर नाउ जे एन एन जो बनाई मेजो फाइनजल एनजो फाइबोमा क्लासिकल प्रेजेंटेशन एवरी टाइम क्लासिकल प्रेजेंटेशन वट इज एन एन इट इज मेनली मेनली अफेक्टिव मेल्स ओनली एवरी टाइम इट हैज टू बी मेल मेल एज ग्रुप विल बी अडोलसेंट अडोलसेंट मीन्स ट्वेल्व टू एटीन ईयर्स ऑफ एज ग्रुप मोस्टली यंग मेल सिक्सटीन ईयर मेल एंड एंड वॉट आर थिंग्स नेजर फेरेंज एलिफाइन मोमा रिकरेंट एपिसोड ऑफ ब्लीडिंग फ्रॉम द नोस मल्टीपल एपिसोड विदाउट एनी प्रोवोकेशन What is uh, so peculiar about major fibroma? Angiofibroma, like glomerulus tumor, angiofibroma it also lacks tubica media, which is the muscular layer. This mass keep on growing without muscle. So whenever bleeding happen, there is nothing to contract. So that's why provoked. Uh, uh, that's why profuse bleeding occurs in major fibroma. Angiofibroma mainly affecting male adolescent. Adolescent testosterone also uh, contributes in, in the growth of angiofibroma. It has been seen that uh, testosterone favors this growth. Now, it is most common site of origin. Uh, uh, its origin is sphenoparietine foramen. Sphenoparietine foramen. What is the location? Multiple time examiner now asks, what is the location of sphenoparietine foramen? It is eight mm behind the posterior end. Eight mm behind the posterior end of middle turbinate, not the inferior turbinate. See, middle turbinate ke. मिडल कैबिनेट पोस्टीरियर एंड से 8 एमएम mm बिहाइंड इज अ स्पिनो पैलेटाइन फोरामेन एंड फ्रॉम दिस फोरामेन द स्पिनो पैलेटाइन आर्टरी कम्स आउट एंड दिस स्पिनो पैलेटाइन आर्टरी इज द मेन फीडर ऑफ मेजर फेरिंगल एंजियोफाइब्रोमा दिस मेजर फेरिंगल एंजियोफाइब्रोमा इज अ बेनाइन ट्यूमर लोकली इनवेसिव हाईली वास्कुलर ट्यूमर ओके अराइजिंग फ्रॉम स्पिनो पैलेटाइन व्हिच इज अराउंड 8 एमएम अवे फ्रॉम द पोस्टीरियर मार्जिन ऑफ द मिडल टर्मिनेट नाउ लुक एट दिस पिक्चर This is pterygoid plate, medial pterygoid plate of spinet. This spinet sinus, this bone here is the palatine bone. Okay, so spinal palatine foramen is it between the spinoid and palatine bone. So as you can see, suppose this bone is palatine bone, and behind part, this is medial pterygoid plate. So spinoid, spinal palatine foramen is it between the palatine and the टेरिगोड प्लेट और स्पिनोइड पार्ट सो इट्स समवेयर हियर सो दैट्स व्हेन द नेम इज स्पिनो पैलेटाइन और टेरिगो पैलेटाइन फोरामेन एंड इफ यू सी लेटरली देयर इज फोसा फॉर दिस स्पिनो पैलेटाइन फोसा दिस इज अ पिक्चर टू शो द स्पिनो पैलेटाइन फोसा सो सपोज दिस इज माय मैक्सिला पोस्टीरियर बाउंड्री दिस इज मैक्सिली बोन पोस्टीरियर बाउंड्री दिस इज स्पिनोइड बोन टेरिगोड प्लेट सो इन बिटवीन द मैक्सिला पोस्टीरियर बोन Pterygoid plate and one side, and one side uh, palatine bone. So this area, fossa. This is pterygo palatine fossa or spinal palatine fossa. And is this fossa through an opening? Uh, the from this fossa, uh, there is an opening which is entering into the nasal cavity, spinal palatine foramen. And from this foramen, uh, we get now spinal palatine artery is uh, coming inside. So typical of angiofibroma is twelve to eighteen years. Uh, from face like deformity may occur this mass will uh, push swelling of the cheeks will occur maxilla will be blocked mass will keep on growing giving you appearance to the from face deformity now treatment since it's a high vascular tumor so it's always better to do angiography find out the uh, main uh, feeding vessel of the angiofibroma and do the preembolization to decrease the vascularity so one to two days back of the surgery do the angiography find out the feeding vessel and preembolize it so that so blood loss will be limited and you can do better surgery now nowadays pre operative estrogen or flutamide is also preferred because estrogen flutamide these are anti androgenic drugs and it has been found that androgen favors the jna uh, growth now there is one sign in angiofibroma do the contrast and then ct scan c ct is preferred and in that what will see the posterior wall of maxilla maxilla posterior wall there is a anterior bowing anterior bowing of the anterior bowing of the posterior wall of maxilla because this is arising from the pterygoid palatine fossa this fossa is behind the maxilla so this fossa when the tumor is growing it will push the 
to share one of the maxilla anteriorly. And this sign is known as Holman Miller sign. Now, angiofibroma. Nowadays, preferred treatment, angiofibroma, preferred treatment is endoscopic approach. Endoscopically, we go endoscopic approach with took and we remove the medial wall of maxilla, that is medial maxillectomy, enter into the maxillary sinus, then from the maxillary sinus, remove the posterior wall of maxilla and enter into the pterygoparatine fossa. So, treatment of choice of angiofibroma is endoscopic surgery. Other approaches can be done. Other approaches like suppose this is eyes and this is nose and this is lips. There is one approach is Weber Ferguson approach. Weber uh, one approach is Weber Ferguson approach. In this approach, we'll do incision site is like not like this. And then we remove it. Incision, open it, remove the maxilla wall, and then you can go ahead with the surgery. We can use the lateral rhinotomy technique. We can use the medial maxillectomy technique or one approach is the mid-facial degrubbing technique. Tonsillar bed. Why this is important? Tonsillar bed, there are certain pathology. See, tonsils are having clips. Tonsil is having clips. Tonsils is surrounded by the mucosa. There are four layers in the pharynx. The, suppose, okay, four layers are in the pharynx. The innermost, which is facing the lumen, is the pharyngobacillar fascia. Pharyngobacillar fascia. So, look at this. This is pharyngobacillar fascia, which is the first layer. Uh, this green color first. This is the pharyngobacillar fascia. Then comes pharyngeal muscles. Uh, this is the first layer, the second. Uh, outer is the mucosa. Okay? <laughs> mucosa. So, in pharynx, uh, if you uh, see from the inside, in pharynx, if you see from the insect, firstly the uh, mucosa, then comes pharyngobacillar fascia, then comes pharyngeal muscles, including circular and longitudinal, and then comes buccopharyngeal fascia. And behind buccopharyngeal fascia, there is vertebra. Cool. So, tonsils are having clips. One of the clips is largest, which is known as crypta magna. In tonsils, in between, sometimes this muscle, uh, superior constrictor muscle or pharyngobacillar fascia, and in between the capsule of the tonsil. Capsule of tonsil is nothing but it is condensation of the fascia. So, the pus, sometime in tonsillar bad, the pus may collect in the tonsillar bad area. So, between the, this is space, between the superior constrictor muscle and the capsule of the tonsil. So, this collection of pus will result in quincy, paratonsillar uh, abscess, paratonsillar abscess, okay. Now, we talk about tonsillar bad, outer layer, the mucosa is thickened. Then pharyngobacillar fascia will form the capsule, then comes the superior constrictor muscle, behind that comes the pharyngobacillar fascia. Behind that there is two nerves. One nerve is glossopharyngeal nerve, ninth nerve, and another muscle is styloglossus muscle, submandibular gland. So in the bad or the structure, facial arteries there, glossopharyngeal nerve, styloglossus muscle, submandibular gland, and the walls of the pharynx. So this is tonsillar band. What is very tonsillar abscess? I already told you abscess between the superior constrictor muscle and the capsule of tonsil. Tonsil capsule is also only on the posterior part. Front or medial part or this side, there is no capsule. Capsule is only on the back part. So, uh, collection of abscess between tonsil capsule and superior constrictor muscle is peritonsillar abscess. Peritonsillar abscess. It is a consequence of tonsillitis. In peritonsillar abscess, tonsil is pushed to medial side. Uvula is deviated to opposite side. And there is congestion, redness around the tonsils. Now, what is the treatment of choice? If pus point is seen, suppose here, we can aspirate it. Or the treatment of choice in this is firstly manage conservatively. Firstly, do the conservative management, that is IV antibiotics and all, for at least four weeks. And after four weeks, we'll go for tonsillectomy. So, if there is correction of pus in the peritonsillar space, you do the IND, if pus can be come out, or give the antibiotic support and all that. And once that pus is done and everything is done, then after four weeks, we'll remove the tonsil. Symptoms will be hot potato voice. There will be spasm of the medial pterygoid muscle leading to Christmas. Hot potato voice is typical of this. What is the difference between peritonsillar abscess and the uh, parapharyngeal abscess? The only difference is uh, inside mouth presentation is same. In parapharyngeal abscess, there is a mass in the neck. Neck edema will be there, which is not in peritonsillar space. 
So no, no, no next spelling here. Now another term is Ludwig's enzyme. What is Ludwig's enzyme? Absolute. It is a cellulitis basically. It is a cellulitis in the submandibular space. Submandibular space is having two space by the myelohyoid muscle. Suppose this is my thumb. This is my myelohyoid muscle, and below that is a submandibular gland. Gland. So submandibular space is divided into two space. This complete space. This is sublingual below the thumb. This is submaxillary. Combinedly, this space is known as submandibular space. So whenever there is a cellulitis in this space, that condition is known as Ludwig's enzyme. It's an emergency condition. Emergency. Why emergency? Because this area edema can put pressure over the airway, so patient may have respiratory insufficiency or stridor. So immediately we have to treat it. And this edema is occurring in a high tension <laughs> because close space there high pressure is built up. So we we'll put an incision. Uh, you know, we'll put an incision to relieve that tension. We'll uh, secure the airway. We'll put the high IV antibiotics and all that. Now, how to differentiate between uh, para tonsillar, uh, para pharyngeal abscess, Ludwig's angina, submandibular abscess? Ludwig's angina is below the chin and extending to both the sides. If you can see, it is center of the chin extending to both the sides. Para pharyngeal abscess will be on the one side of the neck. Okay, para pharyngeal abscess will be on the one side of the neck. In para pharyngeal abscess. The clinical picture is same inside the tonsil, tonsillar and large redness around the uvula, saw palate, etc. Here in this picture, you can see on the posterior pharyngeal wall there is a bulge. So this is parapharyngeal abscess. If you do the CT scan, so see this is trachea. Uh, this is this is trachea airway and uh, esophageal border. So you can see on the lateral aspect of the parapharyngeal abscess there is a collection of the pus in the parapharyngeal abscess. So this is parapharyngeal abscess. In parapharyngeal abscess, there will be neck mass. Neck swelling will be there. Acute retropharyngeal abscess. Okay, parapharyngeal abscess. It is. Uh, it extends from which area to which area? Parapharyngeal abscess. Parapharyngeal abscess is extending from the base of skull. Suppose this is this is my base of skull, and this is the neck. So parapharyngeal abscess is an inverted pyramid space. Which is extending up to the hyoid bone. Hyoid bone up uh, uh, above is base of skull on both the lateral side. Two parapharyngeal abscesses are not connected with each other. Okay, so this is parapharyngeal abscess. Retropharyngeal abscess. Retropharyngeal abscess. Retropharyngeal space. True retropharyngeal space will extend from base of skull. Go down. Retropharyngeal abscess further divided into LR space and uh, pre-vertebral space, LR space and retropharyngeal space. So uh, the landmark will be uh, parapharyngeal abscess is at the level of the hyoid bone. Retropharyngeal abscess will extend till the level of T4, tracheal bifurcation. Then there is another space, LR space, that will extend uh, more below up to the level of diaphragm. Diaphragm, okay, T10, diaphragm level, and pre-vertebral space. What is the longest space? Pre-vertebral space, starting from base of skull, pre-vertebral space extend till the coccyx, complete back. So parapharyngeal hyoid bone, uh, retropharyngeal uh, this uh, T4 vertebra, uh, tracheal bifurcation, LR space is T10 diaphragm level, and uh, this uh, pre-vertebral spaces till the level of coccyx. <laughs> Retropharyngeal abscess. How you can see now lateral view of X-ray. You can see this is posterior pharyngeal wall. If I see this is my airway column, this is my hyoid bone as you can see, and this air bubbles are showing up here. Nothing else. This is the somewhat cartilage impression. Now you can see pre-vertebral space along the vertebra. So this much edema is there. It is not normal case. This much edema. So this is the area which is uh, getting a swelling here. So this is my retropharyngeal abscess in this case. The X is showing this retropharyngeal abscess. Retropharyngeal space. If we talk about retropharyngeal space, if we talk about retropharyngeal space, both the side retropharyngeal space are two in number. They are two in number. Midline they are not communicated with each other. Retropharyngeal space behind the posterior pharyngeal wall. So <laughs> Retropharyngeal space, both the sides, uh, two retropharyngeal space. Uh, one retropharyngeal space is connected to parapharyngeal of same side, but they are not connected with each other. Okay, and there can be 
lymph node of rovier some time present with the retropharyngeal space there is a midline trap which separate these two spaces retropharyngeal space this muscle enlargement it's a respiratory emergency mainly in the pediatric age group pre vertebral abscess generally in the patient of tb patient having tb supine pot spine in adults that is pre vertebral abscess now let's talk about hypopharynx hypopharynx extension is from c3 to c6 or we can say uh post cricoid area the area behind the cricoid that is hypopharynx so suppose if my larynx is this this much is the larynx right so rest of the part is hypopharynx in hypopharynx there are three areas are there sorry post cricoid no? hypopharynx three areas are there both the sides yellow color this is piriform sinus both the sides there are piriform sinus this wall is posterior pharyngeal wall and the space this this space is post cricoid third area post cricoid piriform sinus and posterior pharyngeal wall that's how piriform uh, pharynx develops hypopharynx uh, is the boundary c3 to c6 okay now snoring if a patient of snoring what is the treatment nowadays snoring multiple causes are there most of the cases soft palate is over bulky or over fragile so we can do laser palatopalsy we will provide strengthen to the soft palate by means of laser so laser palatopalsy is for uh, is for snoring another treatment for obstructive sleep apnea obstructive sleep apnea is certain symptoms patient will be more sleepy in the day time uh, night he can't sleep because there is apneic episode in between which causes the disturbance of the sleep so in that case surgery done is uvula palato pharyngo plasty another one we have heard tonsillar what is tonsillar this white color collection is seen sometime in the tonsil this is nothing but collection of food debris into the tonsillar crypt treatment ideal conservative but still patient is bothering you can go for tonsillectomy tonsillar blood supply mainly from the external carotid artery branch point to remember is main blood supply is from the facial artery and that branch is ascending uh, uh, tonsillar branch of facial artery <sighs> hemorrhage after tonsillectomy there are three type of hemorrhage primary hemorrhage will be immediate primary hemorrhage during surgery so this is primary during surgery some bleeding vessels is there you can cut treat it or ligate it reaction the hemorrhage within 24 hours it is because of slipper of ligase we ligated some vessel and that got slip so slippage of ligature okay secondary hemorrhage it happens on the 5th to 7th day after 4 5 days of surgery it happens because of infection so if the infection and tonsil bad happens then will be secondary uh hemorrhage now causes of whitish membrane of tonsil most common causes acute membranous tonsillitis mainly caused by streptococcus pyogenes second most common causes infectious mononucleosis then come diphtheria in diphtheria generally the whitish membrane it is dirty white not only involving the tonsil it is involving the palate going inside the trachea going inside the larynx so it is extending to multiple spaces other feature in diphtheria will be bull's neck cervical lymphadenopathy and diphtheria membrane when you will try to remove the membrane it will bleed so that is diphtheria membrane and uh diphtheria then maybe vocal cord palsy etc so diphtheria diphtheria if diagnosis is made the pre exotoxin exotoxin uh, should be used airway should be managed a patient could be should be uh, treated vigorously and aggressively you can do the tracheostomy initially other causes of whitish membrane of tonsillitis candidiasis vincent menzina malignancy of tonsil and leukemia what is killian's raisins killian's raisins we know pharynx has three layer so uh, constrictor muscle are three type above is superior constrictor then comes middle constrictor and then comes inferior constrictor these are the three group of muscles of the pharynx circular muscles these are circular muscles now inferior constrictor muscle has two part thyropharyngeus and cricopharyngeus thyropharyngeus both side like this okay these are thyropharyngeus muscle of both the sides and cricopharyngeus muscle is having horizontal fiber so there is a gap in between the arrangement of these muscles thyropharyngeus and cricopharyngeus this gap 
is known as Killian's license. Killian's license. And sometimes from this gap, what happens? Mucosal out pouching occurs. From this gap, mucosa may overgrow and it comes out with a bag filled. And in this bag, food may